Hello everyone, welcome to Scalers YouTube channel. In today's session, we're gonna look into data structures and algorithms, complete course with interview questions and answers. Before we move on and understand what are the topics that are going to be covered in the session, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you don't miss our upcoming videos. And also, if you want to learn technologies and frameworks from industry leading experts, we conduct free masterclasses on the Scalers event page. The link is in the description. Now let's look at the topics that are going to be covered in this session. We'll be starting off by understanding what are data structures, then look into the types of data structures that are available. Moving further, we'll be looking into real-world examples of various data structures. There is a queue, a stack, and more. Moving on, we'll be looking into Java Collections Framework because we'll be coding in Java. After that, we'll start off with the data structures part. To start off with, we'll be looking into arrays, and then there's a complete list of data structures we'll be looking into. So arrays, stacks, queues, priority queues, sets, and hash maps. Then we'll look into linked lists in an even more detailed way. First, we'll look at what is linked list, and then we'll look into the basic code of a linked list. Moving further, we'll be learning how to add a node, how to add a node using recursion, how to reverse a linked list, and more. Once that is done, we'll be moving on to the final topic that is data structures, interview questions and answers. In this, we'll be starting off with interview tips that you should follow in an interview. And after that, we'll be looking into various data structures, interview questions with their solved answers. So these are the things that are going to be covered in this particular full course. Now, without any delay, let's get started. Let us start by revisiting the concept of a data set. A data structure is a meaningful way of arranging and storing data inside the memory of the computer. That is your RAM. Okay, we are not talking about your physical memory. We are talking about your volatile memory in which your algorithm will execute and it will do some certain operations like insertion, deletion, searching and removal of data. We have different data structures and they are optimized for different kind of operations that we can do and different kind of orderings we can do on that data, right? So some of the data structures you might have heard about arrays, stacks, queues, hash tables, trees and graphs. Every data structure has its own uh, properties, own way of ordering data, own way of implementing these operations. We'll try to understand how these data structures are different and how we can use them in Java as well. Broadly speaking, they are divided into two categories. We have linear data structures, we have non-linear data structures. There is one more category, I would say we have associative data structures in which we store data in the form of key value pairs. For example, your hash maps. We will talk about hash maps later in this course. Those linear data structures, they can be of fixed size, like a fixed size array, or they can be dynamic. That means they can grow and shrink in size. For example, your array list, your link list, your stack, your queue. In non-linear data structures, we might have data structures which have a hierarchical structure. For example, your trees also have data structures which have network-like data structure. For example, this is a very high-level overview of how data structures are classified. But let us start by revisiting the importance of data structures in our real life. So suppose you go to a grocery store and you find everything is disorganized. Then it would become very difficult for you to search for a given item. But if your items are organized across racks and categories, you will easily find a particular item that you're looking for, right? So keeping data organized makes certain operations like your searching faster, right? Similarly, if you go to tickets and if there is no queue, then it would be very unfair for the people to wait randomly, right? But if people are organized on the basis of their priority, the person who is coming first and he's getting the tic uh, queue ticket first, then it is called as FIFO ordering, right? Similarly, in data, we might require FIFO ordering. So Q is a data structure that provides us with this kind of a ordering, right? And let us look at one more example. Sometimes I go to a restaurant, I, I say, okay, I want to order a burger. Right? Then I quickly get an answer that the burger cost is rupees 100. What is happening? For every item, there is a value attached to it, right? So for every key, there is a value, right? So the data can might be stored in the form of key value pairs. And this is where some other data structures like hash maps come into the picture, right? Another example could be that if I'm on my system and I'm locating certain files, right? I know that, okay, in this folder, I have kept this kind of a data. In this folder, I've kept my PDFs. In this folder, in this drive, I've kept my pictures, right? What is your file system? The file system is a tree-like structure. You start with your my computer, you go to your drive, then you go to certain folders, 
and you find the files that you're looking for right if you do not organize this data in the form of hierarchy and you so i'll search the whole computer it would be very inefficient for you and you will spend a lot of time searching for a given file right so the file system is also an example of a tree like data structure so that means we use data structures a lot in our daily life in building software applications so in real world also the meaningful structuring of items helps businesses operate efficiently we saw the example of grocery store so similarly data structures allow us to execute certain operations like insertion deletion searching updates on the data very efficiently and that this data is stored inside the memory of the computer now depending on the problem that we are trying to solve we select a suitable data structure that fulfills our requirements this is the goal of this video in this lecture we are going to understand how according to different requirements what data structure we will use and we will look at its implementation using java collections framework right now you might ask okay that's data structure what is an algorithm then algorithm is the main logic it is the step by step unambiguous set of instructions for solving a problem right we can define algorithms for real life scenarios like making a pack of noodles you might say okay take a pan put two cups of water inside it boil something something that list of instructions is an algorithm to make a pack of noodles or maybe something complex like if we want to play a ludo game or if i want to make an algorithm that suggests the best photo out of a set of photos we can devise an algorithm for that as well. so in real world from every uh, every deterministic action for example your washing machine a self driving car all the actions your machines are taking that can also be expressed using an algorithm right in the software world all the apps that you are using photo editing app scrolling instagram browsing netflix uh, in a cargo hub sorting of shipments detecting collisions in games transferring money through upi ordering food there is an algorithm behind every action that we perform so that is why it is very important for us to learn data structures and algorithms right and when we combine data structures along with the algorithms we build products that can solve real life problems that is an importance of data structures and algorithms i will start with arrays let us start with the array which is the simplest and the most widely used data structure so i am hoping most of you have must have worked with an array what is an array array is a linear collection of elements of the same type so this is true for java other languages like python they also support heterogeneous arrays that means you can put different number different types of data for example integer string float inside one array arrays are used to store multiple values in a single variable so let's say this is a container which is linear that means it will occupy linear block of memory for example if this address is 104 and this bucket takes four uh, four bytes then the next address will be 108 next address will be 112 right so it is a linear block of memory right? and this whole block of memory has a single name right and each element if i want to access it can be accessed using an index the indexing starts with 0 so i can say okay i want to put something at array of 0 then i will say array of 0 it, it is 4 if i want to overwrite it i will say okay array of uh, 3 it's going to be 20 so i can just overwrite this data and it will keep 20 here right each array location is accessed using an index the indexing starts from 0 that is what we have just seen it so you have the array name followed by the index this is how you access the ith location inside an array right now uh, let us look at some examples of an arrays for example if i want to create an array of strings in which i'm calling the variable as bill payments so i have Uh, defined three strings electricity mobile and credit card right and i have an array of numbers i have defined four numbers here i have int followed by square brackets followed by name of the array this is a very simple way of creating an array but you can also create an array of fixed size where you have not given your data right in the previous scenario we have not defined the size size will depend upon how many um, items we have initialized in this list right so you can directly initialize or you can first create a fixed size block you can say okay i want an array that is able to hold five integers we'll use the new keyword followed by the data type and followed by the size so what happens it creates an array so if i talk about java the variable arr it most likely it goes into your dark memory and the actual array that we have this this is created in the 
keep memory right arr we call as a object reference arr is holding the address of this array arr is going to hold 104 arr is in the stack whereas this actual object it is in the keep memory now we are updating the data at the ith index we are actually storing 10 20 30 40 and 50 here this is how you create an array and all the array objects they have a length property added to it so if you say okay this is a cars area and i want to say cars dot length this will give me okay how many objects are stored in this array or what is the size of this array this will give me four right the size of this array and using the length property i can also iterate over the arrays right so i can say okay let me go over every index from zero till cars dot length that means I'm iterating from 0, 1, 2, 3. The length is 4. So I'm iterating over these indices. And I'll say, okay, let me print every car. I will print the ith object, right? That is one way of iterating. Using the length property, you can get the size. Other ways, you can use a for each loop or also called as enhanced for loop. You can say, okay, for every string value that is there inside my um, cars array, I want to go over that value and I want to print it. That is another way of iterating over the complete array object. Then let's talk about the advantages of arrays. They are very simple and they are very easy to use. The insertion is really fast at the end of the array because if you keep a variable that, okay, these positions are filled, I want to put something here. You can simply say array of i equal to value. So that value will get stored here. So you can insert at the end of the array very fast. And array element can be accessed in a constant time. So if you want to get this element, you can simply say, okay, give me the jth element. So you can access any random element, any random index in just order one time. That is an advantage of an array. But they also have certain disadvantages. The thing is arrays have fixed size. So once you create an array, okay, new int of some size 10, you cannot say I will make it 15 or I will make it 20. They have a fixed size. They cannot grow in memory once they are allocated. Insertion in the middle requires shifting of the elements. If you have inserted something, let's say one, two, four, six, eight, and you say, okay, I want to insert three. What you will have to do? You will have to shift these elements to the right. Then you can insert three in the middle. So it's going to take order of n time for doing the insertion. Right? And second thing is, since array requires a linear memory block, such blocks might not be available if the array size is big. Suppose this is your heap memory and suppose certain portions of the heap memory, they are already used up. right? And suppose you want to create a very big array, which might go like this. Now it is possible that such a linear block of memory is not available, but this amount of memory is available in the heap in chunks, right? So you might say, okay, some memory is available here. Some memory is available here. Some memory is available here. That is where linked list might perform better because linked list does not need big linear chunk of the memory, whereas array requires a le big linear chunk of the memory, right? So for big arrays, it could be a disadvantage that such a linear block could not be present in the memory. Now arrays are used a lot in the real world. For example, this is a UI from a shopping website where I have to display these components, right? the type of bill payments. Now I can say, okay, each bill payment is a string. So I have a fixed size array of bill payments in which I have defined all the categories, right? Now you might say, okay, uh, this looks very simple in actual world. It might be a bit more complicated. Yes, it can be. What may happen is that each item is not just a string, but it is a, um, something more complex. Let me call this as a payment category. What I can do, I can define a class called as payment category, which hold three things. Maybe the category ID, which is not displayed the category name and the image of the category, right? The URL of the image of the category. So I can hold all these things inside a class and then I can create an array of uh, the following class. I can say, okay, I'm creating an array where each item is of the type payment category, right? So I'm creating an array of objects of the type payment category. Right? I have initialized this array that is going to contain 14 items. And I, I need to create these objects as well. I need to say, okay, the bill payments of zero, it is going to hold new payment category and using the constructor, I've initialized these values. Okay. The payment category is one, the name is electricity and some URL. 
So instead of creating an array of primitive data types such as integer or float, we can also create an array of complex data types such as payment categories in this example, right? Secondly, there are two dimensional arrays as well, which are also used a lot, especially in games and puzzles, right? So here is an example of tic-tac-toe where we might need a board right? or here is an example of Sudoku game where might we might need a two dimensional array to represent the state of the game, right? So it's a nine cross nine array. So I've created this array, right? And I can also create a list of players. It's going to be a 1D array, but the data type is now a player, right? Each player might have a name, it might have a score, might have certain uh, methods associated with it, right? It's an array of players, right? That is also how arrays can be used. Another use case could be that array can also be part of a data member of a class. For example, you have an enemy object, the enemy has certain bullets inside it, like certain number of bullets the enemy can fire. I can create an array of bullets where each bullet is of the type bullet and I have created it when the enemy is created. For example, I want this enemy to have exactly six, six bullets when this enemy is created. I can do something like this. Okay? And when you're firing the bullet, maybe a particular bullet might get deactivated. Something like this can also be possible where your array is a data member of a particular class. This can also happen. Right? Another example could be uh, the, your uh, images. Right? So when you deal with images, you know, each image is made up of a matrix of pixels. Okay. Of the size rows into columns. So you might have heard about an HD image. So that is 1920 by 1080. That simply means that we have these many pixels in this image. And each pixel is actually made up of three numbers, a component of red, component of green and a component of blue. So that means each pixel itself is an array of three numbers, right? If I look at an image, the image is actually a three dimensional array of rows, comma, columns into three, right? Where each pixel is actually going to store three numbers. Right? When we do with work with images in Python, you often see the arrays are three dimensional. Okay. Another example that when you're building a uh, software components, for example, a tool like Photoshop, right? You will say, okay, there is this grid where every item is a tool. So I can say, okay, tool toolbox. This is new tool. And in every index, I'm creating a new tool, right? Marquee tool is a type of a tool. Move tool is a type of a tool, right? I can also do something like this. They are used a lot in building real life software and that is the importance of arrays, right? Now we'll look at some code demo to work with arrays. Now we are going to look at some code of an arrays, especially how do we perform an operation like sorting on arrays, which comes very ha handy in solving a lot of problems. Okay. So I have uh, an array of numbers and I want to use a method called as sort, right? So in java.util package, there is a class called arrays, right? this class contains methods that will work on a array that we have created right arrays dot sort is one such method we want to use this method to sort our numbers array let's see if i uh, go and run this code so i just need to call this function f1 so my array is created the array will get sorted and we are going to output this array right another such method is arrays dot to string i can convert this array into a string like representation that I can print directly. So let us just go and run this main method. So now you see the data that you're getting is in a sorted order. Let us look at one more example. Let's say I have an array of strings and I want to sort these strings. Again, what I can do, I can use arrays.sort method, which is again an inbuilt method inside java.util. And I just need to pass the array object to this method. It's going to sort these objects and let us call our function F2 and let us run this code. Now, what do I see? I see an output apple, banana, grape, lemon, and orange, right? Now, how two strings are compared? Let us talk a little bit about comparisons as well. Now, comparing numbers is easy. I can compare as five less than 13. The answer is yes. Right? But if I have a string called as let's say uh, S1 that is ABC, 
and I have string S2. Let's say I call it as A, B, E. Now, are they equal or are they not equal? How do we compare? By default, inside the string class, there is a method called as compare to. If I say S1 dot compare to, you see there is a suggestion coming out. And I say, okay, let me compare it with the string S2. And let me uh, show you the output of what this comparison function is going to return. Now, why I'm teaching you is this is very important because we also want to write custom comparisons for our objects. I'm getting an output that is minus. Basically, how sorting function works is internally calls the compare to method. When you use arrays uh, dot sort and you give um, some array of objects to sort, right? So what it does, it calls the compare to method of that object. So string, basically it is calling the compare to method of this object. So I'm saying S1, which is ABC. I want to compare it with another string ABE. Now this compare to method, it's going to produce three types of outputs. One is a negative output, one is zero and another is positive. So negative output simply means that my first number is smaller first object is smaller that means it will come first in the list positive number means my second object is smaller that means it will come first in the list and zero means the two objects they are actually equal if if i get a negative output which i'm getting in this case that means abc is smaller than abe let us also see how this minus 2 is actually coming right so when you compare uh, a b c with a b e right so you compare a with a they are equal so you move to the next position you go with b b and b they are equal you move to the next position now you compare c and d right now suppose c has some ASCII value right so maybe this is uh, this was 97 98 99 right and this is 97 98 99 100 101 right the ASCII value of e could be 101 so when you take this difference right? i think a is, a is actually 90 not 97 whatever the ASCII value is right? you will take the difference if you subtract C from E you will get a difference of mine that basically tells the sorting function that I will place ABC first and then I will place ABE the sorted dot so compare to function is responsible for defining the sorting order when I'm sorting these fruits you see apple banana grape lemon and orange they are coming in their dictionary order, right? Because a string knows a compare to function is present inside it, right? Then I say, okay, I want to, I want to reverse this order, right? What you can do is one simple way of doing it is that you supply a custom comparator called as collections or reverse order that is exactly going to reverse the default output. Okay. By default, you're getting this output. If you specify this, it's going to reverse the default output if i run this code now you will see i will get orange first followed by lemon grape banana and apple that is one thing that you can use to uh, convert your ascending array into a descending that is one way of doing it so now you might ask then why we are studying this compare to method or where do we need it let us try to understand that as well so this was very simple this was an array of integers or an array of strings right you might say that I have a custom object. I, I have, let's say, a class called as employee, where my employee has a name, age, and salary, right? And I want to create an array of uh, employees. So I have an array of employees, an array of custom objects, and I want to sort them. Now, if you uh, sort them, right? And if you do not tell Java that, okay, I do not know how do we, how do I compare to employees? Most likely you're going to get an error, right? Now errors dot sort can also accept employees, but given that you define a method called as compare to inside the employee class okay. in the string class, it is an inbuilt method, but in the employee class, which we have written, we have to define how do I compare to employees? For example, I have an employee E1. I want to call the compare to method and supply it some another employee E2, right? So when you say, okay, I'm sorting a list of employees, right? This is an array of employees. So it will say, okay, 
I'm going to compare this employee with some other employee. So I will say employee I dot compare to some other employee that is employee J. Right? So the sort function is internally going to call this method called compare to right. But this method is not there. What we have to do? We have to define this method inside our employee. I have my employee class and here I'm going to define my compare to method. How it will get called? It will get called internally. So employee I getting compared to with some other employee J, right? Now it is up to you. How do you compare to employees, right? Some other employee J, right? EMP. Now look at this. How do I write this method? So basically what I'm doing, I'm saying if the two employees have the same age, I will compare them according to their salary. I'm saying salary one minus salary two. So if, if the first employee salary is 100 and second employee salary is let's say 60, 100 minus 60, it's going to produce a positive number. That means the second employee will come first. The person with the lesser salary will come first. Or if the age is not equal, I'm saying age minus employee dot age. So this is the age of the first employee and this is the age of the second employee. For example, if the first employee is 50 years old, the second employee is 40 years old. 50 minus 40, it's also going to produce a positive number. That means the second employee, it is smaller in age, right? So what this sort function is going to do, what this compare function is going to do, it's simply going to compare the two employees based upon their age. If their ages are equal, it's going to compare according to their salary. People with the less age and less salary, they are given priority. They will come first in the output. So let us run this code and see what do we uh, really get, right? Okay, one more thing is that uh, we have to, so whenever you're creating this class, we have to tell that it implements the comparable interface, right? Why? Because the sort function ex expects that you will implement a compare to method. This compare to method is coming from the comparable interface, right? So we'll discuss the concept of interface very shortly, but you should know that uh, you have to say this class implements the comparable interface for the employee in which we have an abstract method compared to, and we have defined this method in the current employee class, right? The body must be given here. So what, what is happening now? Uh, let me show you the output. Let's run this one. We are sorting an array of object, right? So I'm saying, let me print employees. So now I'm getting 6,025. This is salary and age. Uh, I'm getting 12,025. That means higher salary, same age. Right? Then I'm getting uh, 8,045. According to my logic, the first preference is on age. Employees are sorted first on their age, 25, 25, 45, and 56. Then they are sorted on their salary if the age is same. So Jam, uh, Jamin and Aryan, they have the same age. So the person with less salary, it's going to come first. So you can do, you can make any logic like depending upon the situation and this compare to method will tell the sort function. How do I actually sort? So I'm hoping that this is clear. So one way is use the default sort function, but it does not work for the custom objects, right? Then what you can do, you can write the compare to method. And now there is one more scenario in which you might not want to go this way. You might want to go, go with the comparator way, right? Let me discuss that as well. So let us discuss one, one more way of sorting using comparator. Now I'm going to tell you why it could be important. Now suppose you have maybe a list of strings. If let's say ABC or let's say some fruits, apple, mango, guava and orange. And you want to say, okay, I want to sort my fruits. I want to say, okay, um, arrays dot sort. I want to sort fruits, but I want to sort fruits maybe according to the dictionary order. I want to use the default comparison or maybe I want to sort fruits uh, according to their length. 
I'm not writing the, writing the proper code. But what I'm trying to tell you is that if I want to sort fruits according to their length, I will have to go inside the string class. And inside the string class, I will have to change the compare to method. Do you think changing the compare to method inside the string class, which is implemented in the Java library, will be a good thing? Answer is no. We cannot go and uh, make changes in the library. Right. That is one reason we will not use the default compare to method. Or we need some other way to do the sorting so that we have the flexibility. Right. Another option could be another reason could be that uh, I might have a if else like this. If the condition is this, I want to sort according to some criteria. If there is some other condition, then I have to use some other criteria for sorting. Right? I might have something like this. Then also I will have to say that okay, go with the first way. If your if condition is true, go with the second way. If your second condition is true something of this sort what i'm going to tell you is that in such scenarios where either you have conditional sorting or you will have to uh, use your you cannot go and change the library compared to method for a for that particular class there is third way of doing the sorting so that way is called as comparator i'll show you an example of using a comparator right in this case i am creating an array list of integers so array list we will study very shortly it's just like a array but it's dynamic in size it can grow and shrink it so it is part of collections framework we will study so the teach the the demo that we, i'm going to do here is also applicable for arrays dot sort method what we have done is we have created a dynamic array in which i have added few numbers what i want to do is instead of sorting these numbers directly right i know 10 is less than 22 that's okay but what i want to do i want to sort these numbers based upon their sum of their digits you might say okay how do i override such a comparison in such scenario there is this third way that i'm going to teach you it is called as sorting using comparator right what we can do we can we still need to call the sort method so if it is an array object you will use arrays dot sort but if it is an array list, which is part of your collections framework, you will use collections.sort. In this sort method, you need to give your array list object, that is A that, that we have given. And now you have to say that, okay, I'm creating a new comparator object. It's an anonymous object. We are not giving it any. And in this object, we have to override the compare method. Right? So I'll just uh, write this part again once. You will see uh, if you're using IntelliJ, it will come using the autocomplete feature. I create a new comparator object. And in this, it automatically creates a method called as public int compare. Note that it is not compared to this method. It's going to accept two objects that you want to compare. And you want to tell how do I compare these two objects? Okay. So if there are simple strings, so integer o1 integer o2 let's say first object a is 10 b is 20 right? if you simply return a minus b that will simply compare these strings based upon their values that means okay 10 minus 20 sorry o1 minus o2 first object minus second object i can do that right? that will say okay 10 minus 20 it's a negative number that means 10 will come first but if i do it other way if i say uh, I will negate this entire comparison. That means I'm doing O2 minus O1. That means this list will be sorted in the descending order. But suppose if I want to do based upon the sum of their digits. Okay, for example, this is 10. So sum is 1 plus 0, that is 1. 2 plus 2, that is 4. 4 plus 1, 5. 4 plus 0, that is 4. 35. 3 plus 5, 8. 5 plus 1, that is 6. I want to sort according to this. What I can do, I can convert an integer into its sum, right? What I have done, I have written a function called as get sum. Given an integer x, I want to get the sum, right? So this is very easy. You know how to find the sum of an integer. When I'm making a comparison, what I will do else, okay? I'll get the sum of first integer object. I'll say get sum of a. And I will subtract get sum of a is my object o1. 
and b is my object o2 if i do this what's going to happen so numbers whose sum is lesser right so i'll just comment this code out i'll show you the output i'll show you the output let us run this code once right this comparator is telling the sort function that now you have to compare the objects using the following criteria okay so I, i've printed it, it twice now if you look carefully 1 plus 0 is 1 this is 4 this is 4 this is 5 this is 6 and this is 8 now you look carefully at these numbers they are sorted according to their sum that is something that you can do right you can do the same thing with strings as well you can do the same thing with employee as well you do not want to uh, implement the compare to method inside the employee class you can use a comparator or you want that on the top of it i need another comparison based upon certain condition right if employees are uh, near their performance period i want to compare according to their salaries not according to their age right? so you can have that comparator gives you another option to do the sorting right you might say okay this looks uh, little tricky is there a shorter easy easier way to do it the answer is yes so what we can do we can use something called as a lambda function as well i'll just tell you in a very short way what is a lambda function it's a one line function it's an anonymous function so in java what do you have to do you have to write the inputs that you need to compare in these round brackets for example if i'm comparing two objects a and b right? and with an arrow you have to write the output of the comparison right? now if you want to compare a and b in this case what is the output i'm saying okay get sum of a minus get sum of b that is what we are doing in the compare function as well that thing you put it here and this becomes a lambda function and it will do the trick for you right so you can just say that okay I don't want to write the compare method. I just want to use this value that is the output and use these numbers that are my inputs. Given these two inputs, I want to return this output from the comparison. This will also work. And if I show you, if I comment this code out, this lambda function will also do the same sorting thing that we want to do. Let us sort them and let's see what do we get we are still getting the same output that is another way of doing the sort so hopefully now you have understood the three different ways of doing sort and that's all for sorting and we'll start with the collections framework next let's talk about java collections framework now so java collections framework is a framework in java that provides us with set of classes interfaces to manipulate organize and perform operations on data without writing your own data structures from scratch so it provides you with library implementation of data structures and their associated methods that can do anything that you will ever need to do right that means you will be using inbuilt data structures because they come very handy when you are solving problems or you are building real life software so these data structures are also highly optimized and they will of course save a lot of development time so you don't need to write your own hash table you don't need to write your own linked list right so this is what is a standard practice we will most of the times we would be using the library implement just to summarize once again what do we have we have set of interfaces we'll see we have implementation classes the classes that actually implement those interfaces and we have also algorithms okay so i showed you the examples of uh, Arrays dot sort method, collection dot sort method. Similarly, we have methods for searching like binary search available in the Java collections. So you can just go and look at what all those methods are. So, but for now, what I will be doing, I will be doing a quick demo of interface versus a class so that you can really understand how these interfaces and classes are being organized inside the Java collections, right? let us jump into a small code demo to understand the concept of interface versus a class in this uh, example what i have done i have defined an interface called as a payment method okay. so what is an interface an interface specifies what a class must do and not how that means we do not have the implementation of the pay method 
we do not know how to make the payment but we are saying there must be something called as a pay if it is a payment method any payment method that we have must implement a pay method inside it so it is a blueprint for for the class interface methods are abstract by default so they they don't have any code inside now suppose i have i'm going to create payment method called as debit card so debit card is a class which implements payment method that means now debit card must define a pay method it's so for now i'm just saying that debit card pay method prints paying via debit card similarly i have one more class called credit card which also implements the payment method in i have one more uh, class called upi which also implements the payment method. all these classes they have the pay method and they are implementing the payment method they are different ways of creating the payment method execution of each payment method would be different okay a credit card might have a different mechanism a upi might have a different mechanism of making the payment debit card will have a different mechanism of making the payment why we are doing this let us try to understand now suppose uh, we have method called as make payment and this method can accept any payment method right i am not hard coding here i am not saying that i will only accept debit card dc i will not accept debit card i can accept any payment method one thing is we need a a uh, general structure we need a general data type that can hold all payment method okay and here i am going to call pm dot pay so now why this method will work so let me show you how do you create objects of it so i can say okay debit card dc this is equal to new debit card and i say okay uh, i am creating a debit card then i can call dc dot pay so this will work i am creating a debit card object dc dot pay will actually work right So I'm uh, not calling this method as of now, but what I can do is, I can call the ma uh, make payment method and I can pass it the debit card object. Why? Because debit card object implements the payment method interface. A better way to do it is, suppose you have like some code here. You say DC dot pay. Suppose uh, your debit card is not working or the debit card service is down or there is some issue, and you want to make it change it to the credit card okay you want to say okay no i want to try credit card now if you do this this is going to give you a problem because a debit card data type cannot hold a credit card right but what we can do is we can use a more general data type that is payment method payment method is pm i can say okay on the left side i'll have a payment method which is implemented by a credit card right so payment method is a more general data type so this is a good design practice as well so this data type we will keep it more generic and this is a specific class that provides implementation of methods defined in this class this is a specific class now this could be credit card this could be debit card this could be upi right and i can pass the this object pm to any method make payment right now it does not care whether it i am going to call the pay method of debit card credit card upi whatever is the object passed it will call uh, the pay method of that object so that means with minimum change in code we can achieve this general uh, general behavior right so any payment method object will work inside the make payment method if i go and run this code i will show you what's going to happen it will say okay i'm going to make a payment using a credit card paying via credit card but if i say okay no i will make it upi so without changing your make payment method you have just changed this object it will pay via upi right I'm going to run this code now paying via upi that means this uh, object reference can hold any object like any object which implements the payment method interface that is a quick revision about interfaces and classes in java and collections framework heavily uses this concept of interfaces and classes a lot so let us look at how this is implemented in the 
collection framework as well there are so many components inside collection framework there are interfaces there are classes there are child interfaces there are child classes and the hierarchy is a bit complex so what i've done is i've drawn a simplified diagram so that you can understand how these components are related so on the top we have something called as a collection interface okay so collection is a interface inside collection framework there are three more interfaces which are child interfaces of the collection interface so they, they are list set and queue they all extend the collection interface okay queue extends collection set extends collection and list also extends collection that means some methods are there in collection and list adds some additional methods which are specific to the list set adds more methods which are specific to the set queue adds more methods which are specific for the you like behavior right? and then there are implementation classes which actually implement a list so array list implements a list the other way the array list is going to implement the list a link list is also going to implement a list stack is also going to implement a list vector is also going to implement a list so a vector is a concurrent data structure that means um, if there if you need to work if need you need to share this data structure across multiple threads then vector is the synchronized data structure okay, so we are not going to do concurrent data structures in this tutorial so i will leave vector at the moment similarly hash set implements the methods of the set linked list implements linked hash set implements methods of the set and tree set also implements methods of the set right now what is the difference the way these methods internally work that is different okay a tree set might use something like a self-balancing binary search tree whereas hash set might use the concept of a hash table to store the data right so the implementation of methods is different and their time complexities they are also different right? so for queue we have three implementations we have array deck which is a doubly ended queue we have a linked list which is like your uh, which serves as your fifo linked list and there is a priority queue which again internally uses a heap like data structure to give priority to the elements which should come first right so we have interfaces and we have classes that implement those interfaces the ones that are in the orange they are the classes the ones which are in yellow they are the interfaces right so i hope you understood this simple hierarchy now you might be wondering where is hash map hash map is not a part of collection interface it is not a subtype of a collection interface it has been kept separately and it behaves differently from the rest of the collection types so that means uh, the map will be treated differently so map is a interface that we will look and hash map tree map and linked hash map they are the implementations for the map interface right we will use one of these implementations if you want to build a something like a map which can store key value pairs so we'll understand the differences between these implementations as we go through this tutorial right so let me uh, tell you a little more about collection interface the collection interface it it's a general interface it represents a group of objects which are known as elements right so it's it's simply grouping different objects and it is used to pass around collections of objects where maximum generality is required okay you just want a group of objects you don't want to use specific priority queue method or specific queue method or you don't want to use specific hash map method right so you just want some general methods that i should be able to add into the collection i should be able to remove from the collection i should be able to delete from the collection right for example you have a collection of string now this collection again it might be implemented using a linked list it might be implemented using a set it might be implemented using a array list we don't know right so we have to provide one way implement or represent this group of strings right so let me show you a code demo here so i have collection of string s1 now this interface uh, collection is an interface so i need a class to implement it right so okay this collection will be stored using a array list so i am adding something into the array list right i'm saying s1 dot add hello s1 dot add world right now you might ask where is this add method defined so i will tell you the collection interface contains method that performs basic operation okay 
so such as size every data structure you need to get its size every data structure should know whether it is empty or not every data structure should know whether a particular object is present inside it or not every data structure should support that i want to add some element i want to remove some element i need a iterator right it also contains methods that operate on entire collections such as add all given another collection can i add all the elements of the, this collection into the current collection yes i can right remove all retain all clear right these are general methods that are defined in the collection interface that means all the implementation classes will have to define these methods let me show you uh, something here so let us say i create one more collection and this collection is implemented using a hash set now in this hash set i am adding few uh, strings a b c and d right now this add function is going to behave differently from this add function because this add function is implemented by the array list but this add function is implemented by the hash set so if i print s1 and s2 i would be able to see okay there are two group of elements okay if i just run this code i'll see okay i have a collection s1 and i have a collection s2 now suppose i want to add all elements of s1 into s2 can we do that of course i can do that because the collection interface gives me methods like add all so s1 dot add i can give any collection here i can give list i can give array list i can give queue right so i can say okay uh, in my hash set i want to add all elements of array list that is s1 so i can pass another collection into my add all method the method is add all right so it's a general method any collection can be passed to right this is what it means right method is add all that's correct so let's go and run this code now if i see a b c d it's here i will also see hello world is also there so you can see all elements of s1 they got added into s2 right all these general methods they are defined in the collection interface Okay, i hope you're understanding it so that is at the top right now why we are learning this because we want to use this data structures to solve problems efficiently it is so powerful that we can do lot of things for example we can create a list in which we can keep adding to we just saw an example of array list we can search items very quickly inside a hash map we can sort a list of students by using a comparator right we have just seen comparators you can also find topmost ordered items using a priority queue we can filter out duplicate elements using a hash set we can build a rate limiting algorithm using a queue right we can do lot of stuff using the collection framework and that is why we are learning it now next we will dive into specific classes and the first class that we will start is array list so let us talk about array list so array list is like a dynamic array for storing elements it's an array but with no size limit that means if an array gets full it will grow in size and it can accommodate more elements till you have memory available inside your heap right so array list class uh, it's a dynamic array it maintains the relative insertion order so if you add element it will always get added at the end so that means we will get the same order as insertion we can add or remove elements even we can search for elements and it implements linear search that means it will take linear time to search it so in java it implements the list interface so we saw that list is a interface and array list is a implementation of the list interface all the methods that are available in the list interface are implemented by array list right so now how it is going to work internally so i'll give you a quick idea so internally it uses a fixed size array only right so it starts with some fixed size array so in java the default size is 10 so by default it will create a new array of size 10 and as soon as the array gets full it will double the size of the original now that doubling cannot happen in the same place suppose th this array was full right what it will do it will create a new linear array suppose this size was 10 it will create a new array of size 20 and it will copy all these elements into the new array right? and then you will have some extra buckets for new elements once this gets full it will again delete the previous array it will create a new array of double the size copy elements here and delete this array as well this is how it happens copy the elements from the old array in the new array and delete the old this is how this array actually works that means 
the doubling of the array list is a expensive operation and we should reduce the frequency of this doubling how do we do that so if you know you are going to store 1000 elements create an array list of initial size 1000 if if you by chance exceed 1000 the doubling will happen the array size will become 2000 right so it's good idea to start with the some initial size that is equal to your requirement in java this doubling procedure is lit, little different it says okay i'll maintain something called as a load factor this load factor is i think around 0.7 that means if 70 percent of your array is full the doubling will get triggered so we will not wait till uh filling of 100 percent of the array if 70 percent of the array gets full the doubling gets uh, the doubling function it's it's triggered okay so after adding the seventh element if the initial size was 10 a new array is created with a capacity of 20 so there are two things when you talk about size of the array list it tells you how many elements are currently stored in the array list so if you use the size method it's not the capacity capacity is generally more than the size right so capacity is how how much space has been allocated internally whereas size is the number of elements that we have stored in the array list right so what are the features it is dynamic in size it can grow and shrink in size secondly it is ordered it preserves the order of elements third it is index space just like an array you have indices array list also have indices if you want to access a particular element okay i want to get this ith element you do not write array of i instead you write array list dot get i give me the ith element so get is a method that we, you will use to access any ith element so this also works in order one time right indexing is zero based so another property you need to know is it is object based array list can only store object data types that means it cannot be used with primitive data types so you cannot create an array list of int float etc then you might be wondering how do we uh, create an array list of integers for that you have to use wrapper classes in java the wrapper class for int is called as integer so you will always create an array list of the data type integer not as int and secondly it is not synchronized that means it's not a concurrent data structure if you need if concurrence is important for your application you have to use vector which is the synchronized version of array list right so array list operations are not thread safe and multiple threads should not operate on the same array list so this is a basic data success tutorial you want to learn about advanced concepts we will cover it in some other video right so what are the operations we can get any element using the get function we can add any element using the add function we can also add more elements using the add all function so i give you a list i want to add it i can use add all right so i can give some element x that can be added insertion and deletion in the middle it's going to take order of n time so if you insert something in the middle right you want to say okay i want to add something in between it will require shifting of remaining elements that means that will take order of n time searching takes order n time so by default if you use the contains method it's going to do linear search right but if you know the array list is sorted then you can use your own binary search method or the binary search provided by the library function you can use that as well that searching will take log n time if your array list is already sorted right now let us look at basic syntax how we can create an array list array list uh, this is you have to define what kind of objects you want to store here right and then you say okay i want to create a new array list object right so this is how we do it for example you can create an array list of strings and you say it's a new array list you can create an array list of integer right i told you it does not work with primitive data type so you have to use other upper classes okay so in general i would uh, make this left data type to be of the list type because array list is a type of a list right and as a good design principle it is preferred that we make this data type more general as possible so we can say okay the list uh, we are creating an object of the type list implementation is given by new array list this is a more recommended thing to do right then doing array list right this you will learn in the design principles right so we'll create an object of the type list which which is implemented using the array list class right so this is what we will do right uh 
so we can also use the constructor to give an initial capacity right so you can pass a number here that will tell me okay i want an array list whose initial size is 50 it is not going to be 10 so by default the initial capacity of the array list would be 50. that means until this array list is not full or it's not 70 percent full the doubling will not execute if you know that you're going to work with 10,000 elements create an array list of size 10,000 or 11,000 so that your doubling does not happen again and again because it's a expensive operation we can also initialize array list using an another list okay so you can give another list for example here we have a list of strings which is storing foo and bar and i'm going to initialize an array list with another list that is also possible so we have seen three ways the default constructor a constructor with the initial capacity and a constructor that ex accepts another list collection to initialize this array list right now one more cool thing about array list is we can also store objects of various types in this array list why so if you want to create an array list which can store objects of multiple different data types then don't parameterize the instance so you if you see here i have not specified any specific data type here that means this array list can store different object data types so i can add an integer right so i'm saying array list dot add integer dot value of one now you might ask why i cannot do this array list dot add one because it is of the type int right so i need to type cast this into integer data type integer dot value of is a method that creates an integer object out of this one right string dot value of scalar so this is optional we can simply say array list dot add scalar so it's it's going to add a string object inside my array list right if i show you in the demo i have created an array list here i say okay array list dot add integer dot value of one this is going to add an integer and then array list dot add scalar so i'm storing an integer object and a string object inside the same array list right so this is also possible right so you see the output here right so let us talk about some more methods of array list so predefined methods include lot of methods so there are methods for adding objects so if i simply call the add method it will add at the end of the list there is a add method which also accepts an index and an ob object it will insert into a specific index of the list right there is a add all method it will uh, add another list in another collection into this list right so we can also add another collection at a particular index in this list so let us look at uh, the add methods first so i can say i want to create an array list so list of its integers i call it as list and this is equal to new array list so you can see we have imported the list interface and we have imported the array list class inside this list i need to add some numbers i can say add one add two add four so let me show you and if i print this list i see i get one two four i have added these numbers okay now what i can do i can add at a particular index as well i can say okay i want to add at a certain index so either i give a integer or i give a int followed by an integer i can say okay add at index 2 the element is 15 if i do it it will do insertion in the middle of the list that is also possible so you can see i get 15 which is now present at index 2 so by default it is uh, like the first parameter is is the index the second parameter is the value that i am going to insert right that is the add function i can create another list as well i can say okay um, i need another list list 2 and i can say list 2 dot add 15 and i can or let's say this is 25 i can also add all elements of list 1 in list 2 so i can say list 2 dot add uh, list so i can pass another collection here so add all so i need to call the add all method and this will also work and i can print list 2 as well you can see i'm uh, having 25 here followed by all ele elements of list one that is how do we use the add method next we will look at look at the remove method 
so now remove method is it's actually a overloaded method if you look at uh, we have we can pass an object we can also pass an index now this becomes tricky especially if you are working with integers right if i say okay i want to remove something i want to say uh, list2 dot remove1 what does it mean am i removing the index or am i removing the value 1 right so uh, or let me just say list dot remove one so if i talk about first list and i want to remove one from it so let me show you it will actually remove the index because when you're passing one simply like this it's going to assume it is of the data type int right so if you look here right? so when i pass int data type it removes the index at the at, at the following index it will remove so that means it will remove the element two from list one but if i want to remove the value that is one what will i have to do i have to convert that into an integer object right so i have to say list dot remove integer dot value of one that means remove one as a uh, object so if i remove both let's say so that means one and two both will get removed let me show you the output i'll print system s out uh, list show me what you're going to remove right so now you can see the output that both one and two they got removed and we got 15 and 4. So similarly you have a remove all method which will accept another collection it will remove all elements from that collection from the given collection clear will remove all elements from the list contains will tell me whether a particular element is present or not so i can check that okay if list contains 15 do something right so contains is, is is your linear search so s out uh yes 15 is present something like this so you can use the contains method with almost every collection let me run this and you can see that we are getting 15 is present okay so there are more methods uh so there is a get method so if you want to read a particular index you want to say okay show me what is present at uh the zeroth index you can say s out or you can maybe you want to iterate over the entire array list you can say for int i equal to zero i less than list dot size or list two dot size i plus plus i want to get the elements at each index you can say s out list two dot get i this will give you the elements at given ith index so get function is used to access the ith element so let me run this and you can see we are able to iterate over all the elements in this list so just like get there is another method that is called set so if you want to update a particular index you want to say okay i want to make this zeroth element as 50 so you can say okay list two dot set zeroth element make it 50 this will work and now your zeroth element will be 50 you need to give the index and the object that is that you need to store here this is the set function there are more methods i won't be able to cover all the methods but we have covered like most of the important methods there is a method called to array if you want to get an array from an array list you can use this and there is a method called as size which we have just seen there is also a method called trim to size that means if we have if we want to reduce the current size right like if you want to reduce the capacity to the current size we can use this method trim to size right these are some of the important methods uh, associated with uh, array list there is also index of returns the index of the first occurrence of the specified element in the array list or minus one if it does not contain the element so contains is going to give you boolean present or not index of is going to give you at what index it is present or not right now we'll look at some more ways to iterate on the array list let's do a quick demo so we have seen a for loop we can also use a for each loop so i can say for every uh, integer x in my list 2 i want to access it and i want to print it so i can say okay s out list 2 dot get i that is my another way of iterating and printing so sorry i will not do this as okay let me print this number x let me run this code there is one more way that i can also iterate on the list using an iterator right so you can see we are getting uh, all the elements 
that is one two fifteen four and 50 is also there right so we are starting from 50 here and we are getting all these elements okay so iterator is one more way to traverse on 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 a java collection all java collections they they support iterators so what you can do you can create a iterator object by calling list dot iterator this iterator has a method called as has next which tells me whether i can access the next element in the collection or not or not right? if your collection has finished your has next will give you okay there is no other element right so i can say while it dot has next if there is an element present i can access it so i can say okay s out it dot next this will give me the next element in the collection this is another way using which i can iterate on given collection right so iterator is coming from the java dot util uh, package only right so this will also print all the elements present in this at list let us quickly run the code and see so we are getting the same output uh, using iterator as well so we i iterated on list one so which is 15 and 4 again i iterated using iterator which is 15 comma 4 that is what i am getting by iterating on my list that's all for array list i hope you understood the methods of array list and how it works now let us jump into linked list so linked list is also a linear data structure in which elements are represented as objects and stored in non continuous memory for example if this is your heap memory and you have some data maybe one is stored here two is stored here three is stored here four is stored here they might form a chain like structure and where each object is referring to the is holding the address of the next object in the chain this is called as a single linked list where each object knows the address of the next node but it does not know anything about the previous nodes if you arrive at three you can only go to four if you arrive at four you can only go in the forward direction let us talk about linked list little more so we don't have to specify the size of the linked list it's a dynamic data structure as you add more data more objects get created in the memory and they become part of the chain and size is changing automatically as the data is added or removed so you don't need any fixed size array to initialize it right now let's talk about the implementation as i just talked about each node in a linked list it's it's going to hold data it is also going to hold the address of the next node and if it is a doubly linked list it is also going to hold the address of the previous node the nodes are not stored in a continuous memory location they are linked to each other with the help of next and previous pointers okay so this is something we'll go into the detail when we talk about uh when we do a tutorial on linked list but for now we just want to see how to use the inbuilt linked list class and understand its advantages and when to use it right so in java the default implementation provides us with a doubly linked list so a doubly linked list each node stores three things the object or the data the next node's address and the previous node's address so at two you know where is the next node located and where is the previous node located at three you know where is the next node located and where is the previous node located so you know all the three things at each node inside a linked list that is what a doubly linked list is right and creating a doubly linked list is fairly simple so you just need to use the linked list class provided by the java.util package and the data type what kind of data you want to store in this linked list and it will create a linked list for you right now let's talk about the features of the linked list the biggest feature is we can use the non continuous memory so if you don't have a linear block available we can still create a big chain by utilizing the non continuous blocks of the memory it is a dynamic data structure there is no need to pre allocate the memory and hence it re results in efficient utilization of the uh, memory as well right and insertion and deletion at the ends of the linked list are performed in constant time now this is a very big advantage so if you have an array and you want to insert something at the beginning you would see that i will have to shift the entire array then i can insert a zero here right but in case of a linked list this time which is order n in an array inserting at the beginning it's going to be very fast suppose you have one two three four five you already know this node okay and you say i want to insert a zero here so you create a new node and you say okay head should point here and zero should point here this can be done in order one time similarly the last node is uh, referred by a tail pointer if you want to create something at tail you can simply add six here and your tail will move here right so 
if it is a doubly linked list insertion and deletion both at the both ends can be just done in order one time this is a very very big advantage of linked list and concatenation of two linked list is much more efficient in terms of space and time so if you want to merge two array lists you will have to copy all the data right but if you want to merge two lists let's say i have another list 7 8 and 9 so in that case merging is also very easy you just need to connect this node with this one which is again going to take order one time concatenation is also very fast in case of a linked list right so let's talk about uh, the differences between the operations right so random access now that means if i want to get any ith element this is very fast in array right so i know i can get uh, i can do array dot get i this works in order one but if you want to get some uh, ith element inside a linked list there is no direct way you have to iterate it right? So in the worst case it will be order of n insertion and deletion at the beginning in case of linked list as i told you it's order one in an array it's going to be order n because you have to do the shifting insertion and deletion at the end so if it is a doubly linked list uh and we are maintaining the tail pointer we can do it in order one time as well and uh, in array it is also order one so this this can be made order one right it depends upon the implement insertion and deletion from the random location so of course this inserting deleting something from the middle both in array and a linked list will take order of n time right? so i hope you understood the basics of a linked list now let's look at the implementation so i have this code in which we said okay we are creating a list which is using a new array list object so instead of now using array list i can simply replace it with with linked list and since both array list and linked list implement the list interface so all the methods that we saw uh, with this list they will also work with linked list as well right so i need to import this class let me just type linked list and this will get imported so port java.util.link so this is also there right? if i run this code as it is the same array list code it will work all the methods that we used on array list will also work on linked list as well right? now apart from it there are some additional methods as well which are provided by linked list for example adding something at the beginning of the list so that method is not there in array list we can use that method for example i can say uh, this dot add first i can say okay in the beginning you add an element that is zero you might be saying okay we are getting an error here at first there is nothing like this now why we why we are uh, getting this error because add first is not a method inside the list inter okay so what happens is your list says that okay you must implement an add method whereas your linked list class which implements your list interface right it says okay i will implement the add method i will also implement the add first method that means you cannot call add first method on on a list kind of a variable right it, it is of the type list what i need to do i need to say okay the object that i am now creating is exactly a linked list okay if i make it linked list you can see add first will work because you can easily add in the beginning of a linked list i can say okay maybe add uh, minus 20 here and show me this list so i am running the code and you can see minus 20 is there it's added in the beginning of the list so we have more methods let's look at some more methods all right so just to save time i'll quickly uh, go through all of these methods so there is a add method which we saw on the list this is also there add all is also there add all we have seen right now add first i just show you showed you the demo it adds uh, the desired element in the beginning of the list similarly there is a add last method it will add at the end of the list so it will work same as your uh, add method there is a clear method which is fine there is a clone method creates a shallow copy there is a contains method element present or not it right? uh, then popular methods are get i want to get particular element works in a linear time get first get the first element get last get the last element index of you can use right now there is also a method called as offer right this method is used to add at a specified element at the tail of the list now you might be asking what is the difference between add 
versus offer so let us discuss this as well for that you need to go to the java link list class right so i'm look uh, java link list the oracle docs right so if i look look here what is happening uh the link list class it, it actually implements uh not just your uh list interface it also implements your deck interface it also implements your queue interface that means all the methods of the queue all the methods of deck they should be available as a part of link list so what is deck a deck is a doubly ended link uh, it's a doubly ended uh queue so that means you can do push and pop that means you can add from the rear end add or remove from the rear end and you can also do push and pop that means you can add from the front side and also remove from the front side of the queue that means insertion and deletion can happen at the both ends of the queue now in order to uh, implement this deck interface or the queue interface let us look at what all methods are there in the deck interface inside the deck interface you see there are methods you want to insert something at the beginning there is a add first method that should be implemented by that class if you want to remove something the remove first should be there if you want to get something get first should be there right similarly uh, for the last element add last remove last and get last should be there now there are two versions of the same method one is add first one is offer first right what is the difference between add first and offer first so the difference is written here so what they are saying is that both methods are provided to insert remove and examine the element each of these methods exist in two forms one throws an exception if the operation fails the other returns a special value so basically your offer method it returns like true or false or null if your operation fails right whereas add first will throw an exception so it again depends upon your use case how you want to use this method if you are working in an environment where your capacity of the data structure is restricted and you are trying to insert something and your data structure is already full so what do you want should i should it return false that i cannot execute this operation or should it throw an exception if you want to throw an exception go with the add first method if you want to handle it using a value like true false or null you will have to go with the offer first method because linkless implements the queue and the deck interface which needs these methods hence you will see there are many methods which are doing the sa almost same work right between add and offer there is a difference of the return type should you not the return type but how do you handle the failure case right so you are going to return a, something like true false or should i throw an exception right so that is offer and we have offer first we have offer last right then there is a method peak so peak means to look i want to look at the element so if you simply call peak it will show you the first element of the link list the head of the link list peak first fetches the head of the link list so peak and peak first they are same peak last show me the last element right then there is a method poll poll means i want to uh, fetch the first element of the link list it it will return the first element and remove it right poll first is also same removes the first element or it is going to return null if the list is empty then there is poll last it will remove and give you the last element of the linked list or it will give you null if the linked list is empty right there is a method called pop as well linked list can also be used as a stack so in stack we generally call removing the last element as pop right and push is also there if you want to some push something in the stack i can say okay i am pushing something so it will push something into the linked list if i say pop it will remove the last inserted element from the linked list similarly the the remove method is there right remove first is there remove last is there set is there you want to update a particular element and to string is there that means if i want to print a linked list it will call the to string method and each element is separated by a comma and it is enclosed in square bracket when whenever we are printing this and whenever we we are using system dot out dot print list what is happening internally it is using the to string method of the list object to give us list which looks like this okay this is coming from the uh, to string method so i hope you really got an idea on what all methods you can use on a linked list so many methods are there so mainly you need to remember that you can work on both ends you can work on the front side you can work on the rear end 
and you can also insert in the middle search in the middle but insertion and deletion at the ends it is fast in the middle it's difficult random access it's difficult it's going to take order of n time compared to an array so that's all i'll see you in the next data structure let's talk about stack stack is a very simple and easy to use data structure so just like arrays and linked list it is also a linear data structure that is used for storing data and it looks very much like a real life stack such as a stack of books a stack of plates and uh, let's see so it's kind of an ordered list in which insertion and deletion are done only at one end for example if you have items coming in one two three and you push them items into a stack so one will go then on the top of it two two will go and three will go and if you start popping items three will come first then two will come and then one will come so it's also called as last in first out data structure the element which is inserted at the last is the first one to get removed for example if you keep a stack of books you put a c++ book then you put a java book and then you put a python book python book is the one that you can pick first followed by java book followed by c++ book last in first out property stack has so internally if you want to uh, see how it is implemented you can use a fixed size array you can also use a dynamic array you can also use a linked list to implement a stack and how it is different from arrays arrays allows random access you can get any ith element but in case of stack of books you can only access the topmost element so uh, in a way there is a limited access possible and only topmost element is directly available in case of a stack stacks are generally dynamic in nature that means we don't have a fixed size and size can be increased or decreased depending upon the push and the pop operations that we are doing right so the container that you are using can be a fixed size array as well but in general it would be dynamic such as a dynamic array or a linked list so the operations on stack they are very simple you can push an element into the stack you can pop something from the stack and you can peek peek means you can look at the topmost element. let us look at a code demo to understand these operations well so in java we have a stack class which is uh, which also implements your uh, list interface but on the top of it stack has its own methods as well so let's look at a demo right so like i have created a stack object stack of string called books and in this i can push something so i can say books dot push right now you see there is a add method as well the add method is coming from the list interface or I can simply call push method, which is specifically implemented by the stack class. So I can say, okay, let me push C++, let me push Java, and let me push Python. Let me just create three books and push it. It's okay, Python. Now, if I print the stack, I can say, okay, show me what elements do we have. I call it as books. Let's run the code. And suppose if I want to see the topmost element, the topmost element will be what? It should be a uh, Python, right? If I want to look at the topmost element, so I can simply call peak, right? So I can say, okay, uh, sout books dot peak, that will give me Python. And if I want to remove it, I can call the pop method. I can say books dot pop. That is going to remove the topmost element. And now if I do peak, I will see Java next. S out books dot. And apart from these methods, we also we, we can run a loop like we can say okay. Uh, while the stack is not empty, I want to uh, stack dot sorry books dot is empty. While this is not empty, I want to keep on popping elements i want to remove them so i can say s out um, books dot peak and i want to pop everything books dot this is one way to iterate on the stack you have to remove all the elements and uh, yeah so i hope you are able to understand this example so we are able to remove all elements we first removed python then we removed java and then we removed plus plus as well that's all about stack a uh, very simple data structure right and hopefully you will be able to use it let us talk about queue a queue again is a very simple data structure uh, it's just like a real life queue the sequence of object waiting to be served in the sequential order starting from the beginning of the queue 
so in general queue maintains a fifo kind of ordering but we also have something called as a priority queue which is little different for example a fifo queue would mean a queue of cars at a toll booth cars are coming in to get their ticket or people are standing in a line to buy their tickets what happens in general people enter from the rear end of the queue and they leave from the front side of the queue once they get the ticket so adding something in, into the queue it's called as nq removing something from the queue is called as dq someone has been removed from the queue so insertion as i discussed it happens at the rear end of the queue whereas deletion happens at the front end of the queue last in uh, last out the person who is entering in the last is the last one to come out or you can say it's a fifo first in first out the person who is coming first is the first one to come out right the front of the queue is returned using a peak operation so if you want to say okay i want to see who is at the front the most libraries they have a peak method like in java we have a peak method to see what element is at the front of the queue right and similarly there are methods like offer to add something at the end of the queue and if you want to remove something from the front side it's called as poll right we'll look at three methods offer adding something at the rear end polling removing something from the front side and peaking means looking what is at the front okay so peak only gives you the element whereas poll removes an element from the queue right so these are three methods that we will discuss if you want to implement a queue at your own end you can use a fixed size array uh, also known as a circular uh, array to implement the queue you can also use a dynamic array or also you can use a linked list right? so there are limitations of queue data structures a queue is not readily be searchable you cannot go inside the queue and search so you might have to maintain another queue to store the dequeued elements okay so you have to empty the entire queue if you want to search for something and uh, traversal of course we cannot traverse that is the same thing so you have to again remove all the elements to do the traversal and in this process queue becomes empty so these are limitations of the queue so operations you want to add something so the equivalent java method it is called as offer i want to add something into the queue if you want to remove something the java method it, it is called as poll and if you want to look who is standing at the front the method is called as p let us look at the queue methods in our code demo and if i talk about uh, what are the methods there in java right so if, if i told you that queue is an interface in java right so this interface is implemented by three different classes one is called array deck which stands for doubly ended queue we can use linked list which we will be using to implement our fifo queue and there is also something called as priority queue which we will also study very soon right we'll go with the linked list wala implementation right the methods that i told you they are insert remove and examine Ex examine is like peak right now again i told you there are two two versions that java provides one set of methods that throws exception so if you use okay i want to add something into the queue there is a add method or if you want to do the same functionality you can also use the offer method the offer method returns a special value whether your operation was successful or not add method might throw an uh, exception if your add operation fails because of some reason okay similarly remove throws an exception if your operation fails poll will not throw an exception element you you are looking for an element maybe at the empty queue right it can throw an exception peak will not throw an this is how these methods are designed so i will be uh, going with these methods okay in the implementation let me jump into the code and let's quickly create a queue right well it's okay i want to create a queue of integers i call it as queue and i say okay the queue implementation so queue is an interface the implementation is provided by the linked list so we'll be using linked list for this queue right so we also need to imp uh, import it now how do i do it i can say queue dot add some numbers let's say one two three and four let me just copy this now if i say okay i want to see who is at the front of the queue or let's just print the entire queue let's uh, run this code and simultaneously let's see who is at the front of the queue so i can say s out 
view dot p show me who is standing at the front i will see one is standing at the front so one came first right now if i remove this it's okay i want to remove one i can say q dot um pole and then i can say show me the entire queue and also show me the front element i can say q dot just like stack you can also use a while loop to empty all the elements of the queue so after removing one the queue is two three four and if i look at the front element the front element is now so you can put a loop like this while your queue is not empty you can keep on removing the elements from the queue that is all about queue i hope you really understood uh, how to use queue in java so next in line is the deck data structure so it stands for doubly ended queue and it's pronounced as deck so it is again a linear data structure that allows insertion and deletion at the both ends okay so you you can do insert here you can say okay i can expand in this side or i can also expand in this side maybe i insert 5 maybe i insert 12 or i can remove from both ends of the queue it's a queue that supports insertion and deletion at both ends so basically internally we can use a linked list to implement it and java also provides a special class called as array deck which implements the deck right so if i look at the hierarchy so we start with the collection interface we have seen the queue interface extends the collection interface it adds some more methods into the collection then there is also a deck interface which i have not shown earlier in the diagram and the array deck is a implementation of the deck interface right? array deck is implementing the class that implements the deck interface which is extending the queue interface okay so this is what you it's a good to know thing not mandatory right array deck and linked list are commonly used deck implementation if it is a double linked list you can see it is very easy to expand something on both the ends right so you can simply add something here as well and your tail will move right you can add something here as well your head will move right so it's pretty easy to use linked list but array deck internal implementation is little more complicated so i'll discuss few more points about array deck it is an implementation of the deck interface that uses a resizable array to store its element and deck is a subtype of queue interface that we have just discussed best thing about array deck class is it provides constant time performance for inserting and removing elements from both the ends of the queue now this is very tricky right in an array we cannot do constant time insertion and deletion at both the ends we can do only at one end right but in deck in array deck it uses a internally some complicated mechanism so that we can remove and insert from both the ends of the queue and these operations can be done in order one time from both the ends right this is a very powerful feature of array deck that we must know right? now, talking about the operations right if you want to add something at the beginning you can say add first okay or you can use a method called as offer first these are two methods which are doing the same work there is a minute difference if due to let's say capacity limitation you don't have men memory or you're restricting the size of the queue and you're trying to add some element then add first will throw an exception will throw an exception just like other add methods we have discussed the offer method will return false that okay i could not return this element i could not add this element similarly we have remove first and poll first methods so remove will throw an exception poll will return true or false get first will throw an exception peak will tell me whether the element like if i could not get that element it will throw an exception peak will tell me null i could not remove that element that might happen right there is add first there is add last offer last remove last poll last get last peak last. Now, if you ask me what methods i would be using i would be using offer first poll first peak first so if you want to do operations at this end you want to add something use offer first if you want to remove something from the front use poll first and if you want to look at what is this element you can use peak first right same operations if you want to do at this end what you will do you will say offer last 
I want to add something here. I want to remove something from here. I will say poll last. And I want to see something. What is this last element? So I can say peak. Show me the last element. This tech. So that is about the operations of tech. Now let us look at a code demo of for tech. So let us create a array deck object. You can say array deck of let's say integer deck equals to array deck. And in this deck, I can add elements. I can say uh, offer. So there is an offer method as well. Offer first is there. Offer last is there. So I can say okay. Let me show you offer first. Let's say well, tech dot offer first, let's say 15 tech dot offer offer last, let's say 20 tech dot offer, let's say 30. Let me show you what in what order the elements have been inserted. S out, I will say deck and let's run this code. I'm getting 15, 12, 20 and 30. So first I had 12 offer first. I said in the beginning, I want to add something 15 gets added here Then I say offer last 20. So 20 gets added here. Then I said offer 30 offer is actually behaving like offer last offer and offer last. They are doing the same work. This is how your deck is getting created. Similarly, if you want to remove something and call the poll method, so you can say s out deck dot poll last. Give me the last element s out tech dot poll first give me the first element and uh, if you want to see now what is the new first element you can just call peak so you can say s out tech dot peak first show me the new first element and s out show me the new last element peak last let us run the code and see so this is our deck. Now I say, uh, give me the last element. So it removes 30. It's gone. Give me the first element. It removes 15. It is gone. Show me the first element. The first element is 12. Show me the last element, the last element. That is how easy it is to work with deck. And I hope you understood the concept. Let us talk about priority queues. Priority queue is a special type of queue in which each element is associated with a priority value. For example, if uh, people are standing in a queue and you might want to give priority to the senior citizens, maybe age is a criteria in which people will get their tickets. Okay, senior people will get their ticket first. Young people will get their tickets later. So basically elements that we are going to serve in the queue, they will be served according to a certain priority. Higher priority elements are going to be removed and it is up to you how do you define the priority okay maybe a big number has a more priority or maybe a lower number has a more priority we can have a max priority queue we have a min priority queue we can insert like people can join the queue right but maybe this is 16 years this is 20 years and this is maybe uh four years right now if i say okay i want to remove someone i'll remove the person with the maximum i'll remove person 20 right so this will get removed so people can join the queue but when i'm going to remove people the people with the higher priority will get out first right so the underlying data structure for a priority queue it's a heap we can have a main heap or a max heap i will not be able to dive into the details of heap at this point we'll be looking at how do we use the java priority so the operations that are supported we can insert something inserting in a queue it's called as a offer right? i can offer some data inside the queue i can look at if i want to see who is standing at the front of the queue that is called as peak and if i want to perform deletion i want to remove someone right from the queue that that is called as poll right? we'll be looking at these methods right? and insertion and deletion they are login methods looking who is at the front the order one method right so let us do a quick code, code demo as well so we have uh, seen how to work with the queue. This is the code for a queue. A priority queue also is a class that implements the queue interface. Okay, so right now it was a FIFO queue. Now I'm going to change it to a priority queue. Right. 
the rest everything will change so if you want to add add method will also work but if you want to use the offer method i can use the offer method as well. i can say dot offer some numbers uh, 10 will change the data later i have 10 0 8 maybe 7 and let's say uh, 9 right now if i say okay i want to print the entire queue let's see what output do we really get okay so i am getting this output 0 7 8 10 and 9 now i want to look at what is the first element i'm in this case the lowest element it's getting priority right so you see zero is coming at the front of the queue rest of the queue is not actually sorted only the uh, priority element it comes to the front of the queue right so zero is there if i say okay i want to look at this element so this element is zero and i want to remove this element so it removes zero and now what is the next lowest element in the queue that is seven so seven comes to the front of queue if i make it 17 then the next lowest would be eight right so let's let me run it once again now i have 0 9 8 17 and 10 the lowest element it is at the front right then I, if i remove 0 the next lowest is actually 8 so that comes to the front so if i remove that element or if i look at what is that element i get that element 8 using the peak operation you can see the element using the pole operation you can remove the priority element now you might ask if i want to reverse the order okay uh, so in that case you can pass one more comparator so i can say okay comparator dot reverse order this is exactly going to reverse the comparison a min priority queue becomes a max priority queue in this case the highest element it's going to get a priority right so now you look at 17 is standing at the front if we remove 17 10 is standing at the front and there is no specific order for rest of the elements that is unpredictable we are only worried about the element at the front should be either the min element or the max element this is about priority queue in java let us talk about a set interface now so what is a set mathematically it is a collection of elements that cannot contain duplicate elements okay uh, so set in java it models the mathematical set abstraction now the set interface that we have seen it contains only the methods inherited from the collection so that means there are no additional methods inside the set interface all the methods are inherited from the collection but it adds the restriction that the duplicate elements are prohibited everything all the methods which are there in collection right the same methods are there in set except the condition that duplicate elements cannot be present there are three classes in java that provide the implementation of set there is hash set there is link set linked hash set and there is tree set so let us try to understand the differences between the three implement so as i discussed there is hash set tree set and linked hash set so hash set stores the elements in, inside a hash table it is the best performing implementation however it makes no guarantees regarding the order of iteration you say okay i inserted 10 20 15 18 inside the set and if you start uh, iterating over the elements you are not guaranteed to get any order you might get 20 18 10 and 15 so the elements will come out in any random order right so it does not ensure any kind of ordering on the hash set the internal data structure is a hash table then there is a linked hash set so it is implemented again as a hash table and along with the hash table we maintain a linked list so that means these elements are going inside the hash table but also we uh, like chain them together so that we are able to maintain the order of insertion so it has implemented a hash table with a linked list running through it so it combines the features of hash table and a linked list and orders its elements based upon the order in which they were inserted so basically it maintains the insertion order okay so it's going to give you the features of the hash set along with the ordering that is maintained there is one more thing that is called tree set it stores the elements in a red black tree so red black tree is a self balancing binary search tree which is a height balanced tree and it orders its elements based upon their values and it is subsequently slower than the hash set basically whenever we talk about bst right 
and it is a height balance BST. So if you have to do an insertion searching inside in such a tree where the tree height is log n, so it's going to take uh, all the methods like inserting data, finding data, they are going to take order of log n time inside a preset. Whereas on hash set and linked hash set, the time complexity is going to be order one on average, right? So basically, the advantage of tree set is that it keeps your data sorted. Linked hash set keeps the same order as input. Has said it is the fastest and it is the but it does not give us any guarantees on the order. So these are three different implementations of set in Java. Let us look at the code demo for uh, hash set. Okay, if I want to create a set. Let's a set of integers. S this is equal to new hash set. Right now I want to do something on this. Let us import as well. Right? Java dot util dot set import has been done. Let us add few numbers into it. It's a set dot add. Uh, sorry, s dot add some numbers. It's a ten. S dot add twenty. S dot add eighteen. And s dot add let's say eighteen, right? And s dot add what? So I've added few numbers. So let me display s s out the set. Let us run this code. And see what do we get? I'm getting 18, 20, 40, 10, and 15. You see, the order is random. There is no fixed order. 18, 20, 40, 10, 15. So it's it's kind of a random order, right? If I want to add, like if I add a duplicate element once again, so if I say okay, add 10 once again, and if I run this code, you will see this it will not store the duplicate elements. Only one 10 is stored. Even if I add it one, once again. The duplicates get filtered out. So no duplicates are, al are allowed in the set. Right? Suppose I want to remove an element, so I can say s dot remove forty. Right? This will remove forty from the set, and uh, forty is not there. Right? And suppose if I want to check if a particular element is present or not. So if I can say s dot contains uh, some number twenty, so you can say yes, it is present. Or I can simply say, uh, just do s out whether 20 is present or not. So s out s dot contains. So it will give me true or false whether this element is present or not. So I will get a true here, right? So 20 is present. These are the three fundamental methods: add, remove, and contains. And if you remember, these are the methods. They were part of collection interface as well. We can use these methods on any. Uh, any data structure that we have seen so far, right? And all of them they inherit from the uh, collection interface. Uh, there are few more methods we, which we have with the collection interface. Is empty, we can check size, how many elements are there in the set, clear, remove all elements from the set. And uh, we'll also see how do we use set with custom objects. So let me first, first show you the size method, how many elements are there in this set. So currently we have four elements. So this method will uh, tell me okay there are four methods but okay. uh, there are four elements inside it now we have worked with a set of integers now, sometimes we might have to work with a set of a complex class maybe a set of books set of students a set of uh, uh, payment ids or set of debit cards right anything anything can come here so data type can be anything so let us see how do we implement set with a custom data type and what will change Okay, before we uh, discuss the custom set, there is one more thing. So we just discussed that, okay, we can use a hash set class in Java, but we can also use linked hash set and we can also use tree set. So I'll comment this out and I'll show you two more examples. Instead of creating a hash set, I can create linked hash set in Java. And if I use this, you will see, I will be able to maintain the same order as insertion in this set. If I remove 40, I will get 10, 20, 18, and 15. So this fo this follows the order of insertion. Right? And if I use something like a tree set, that is slower because it uses uh, self-balancing binary search trees. Doing add and remove, it's going to take log in time on a tree set, but it's going to maintain elements in a sorted order. So let's see that as well. Now the elements are sorted in the set because we are using a tree set. I hope you are able to understand the differences between hash set, link set, and tree set. Now we will move into a set with a custom class, set of custom objects. 
let's see that now let us discuss how do we use set with a custom class now suppose you want to create a set of books what i have done i have defined a book class in which book has three properties isbn name and price as the attributes of a book what i'm doing i want to create a set in which every item is of the type book now let us uh, insert few books in, into this hash set i can say books dot add let's say i want to create a new book each book should have a name a isbn which is a unique code and let's say the price of the book and let me say okay i'm going to add few more books and here i make the name as let's say java isbn is 2 and let's say i change the price right now if i let's say go and run this code let us see how many um, books we will have so s out um, books dot size and let's say s out books i also want to see what are the books that the set is stored so i am storing three books and you can see c++ book is getting stored twice right? and java book is coming once now why, why is this happening why it is not able to filter out that these two books are really same the reason is we are creating this object using new right so for the set to know whether these two objects are same or no there is no way right so we are creating a new object that will treat that these these are two different objects created at two different memory locations maybe this is 1056 this is 2080 so for, for set these two books are different because they are two different objects in the memory right we need a way to tell this set that okay you should consider these two objects as same in order to do that one thing we need to do is we need to define so internally it is using uh, the concept of hashing right so it's going to compute the hash code for an object you have to tell me how do i compute the hash code so for that i need to uh, override a method which is called as hash code so what i'm going to do i'm going to override a method called as ha hash code in this case if i want to compute the hash code of a book maybe i want to say okay compute it only on the basis of isbn isbn is a unique number so let me do it once again now let's see if something changes or not so again it is not changing so when i'm hashing the books although the books are getting hashed on the basis of isbn still the set does not know whether the two books are equal or not so what happened we uh, computed the hash code for this book we inserted it into the set this book went into the set we again computed a hash code for this book it also went into the set two objects they can have the same hash code that is okay and uh, the thing is i need a way to tell the set consider these two objects are equal so maybe i want to say that uh, so i need to uh, provide a method that is called as equals method okay so let's see how do we write this method so there is a pretty standard template to do it so whether two objects are equal or not so whenever you are inserting a new object let's say you are inserting this object into your hash set it's going to compare that whether such an object is present or not so why at what location it's going to compare it's going to uh, compute the hash code and it's going to check whether we have uh, something at that location or not so suppose c++ was there some other book python was there suppose they two, two had the same hash code so it's going to compare whether these two are equal or not whether these two are equal or not so this concept will be little more clear if you understand the technique of separate chaining right different objects they can have a same hash code if they have the same isbin or the hash function is producing the same value for two different numbers as well it can happen right but what we need to do is we need to tell that okay the two objects are equal if their isbn is same right? so what i will do is uh, what i have done here is i'm saying that okay um, you i'm giving you an object so i say okay book b1 compare this object equal to b2 there they do uh, these two objects are equal in like two three scenarios i'll discuss what are those scenarios suppose i create a book b1 which is equal to new book and i say okay b2 is a book which is equal to b1 so in this case what is happening i have just one book object both b1 and b2 they are pointing to same right if b i if i make any change in b1 it will also affect in b2 so what i'm doing that if this is equal to o that means if the current object and the other objects they are referring to the same memory that means they are equal right 
if o is null if one of the object is null they cannot be equal or if the two objects they belong to the different class so suppose if i compare a book with a student they can never be an equal i am returning false otherwise any given object i typecast this into book class and then i compare that is the isbn of my book is equal to the isbn of other book if this is the case consider the two book objects to be equal so if i add this equals method my hash set will come to know that okay these two books they have the same isbn i will not insert them again even if i now now look i have only two books okay and c++ is stored only once now even if i change the name of this book i say okay this is c++ version 2 and the price has been increased to 120 will hash set store this book the answer is no because it is only going to compare on the basis of isbn if isbn is same i will not again store this book right but if you want okay the two books are equal if their name is same if their price is same if their isbn is same then in the equals method you can have two more conditions along with the isbn that i should match all the three parameters for the comparison the equals method is important so you need to override this method to tell the set in what scenario you should consider two objects as equal so i hope you are getting it and uh, that's all for this implement let us talk about the final data structure that is a map a map contains values on the basis of a key that means it contains information in the form of key value pairs just like a restaurant menu whenever you go to a restaurant you say okay i want to have a burger and you immediately get to know the burger is 50 i want to have a pizza the pizza is 200 i want to have a coke the coke is let's say 70 there is a key there is a value associated a map contains unique keys that means i cannot have a burger twice in my menu okay a map is useful if you have to search update or delete elements on the basis of key so we do not ask okay what item is after burger or what item is coming before pizza the ordering is not that important to us what is important that given a key what is the value associated with that item and i want to okay coke is out of stock so i want to delete this key value pair or something new has come up i want to insert that key value pair right? for operations like these map is a very good useful powerful data structure and most of these operations they run in order one on average so search is order one on average update is order one on average delete is order one on average so very powerful data structure now uh, let us uh, talk a bit more about map java platform contains three general purpose implementations one is your hash map another is your tree map another is your linked hash map so the behavior and the performance is same as the way hash set, tree set and link set work, right? So hash map internally uses a hash table. It's the technique called separate chaining that is used to implement a hash map. So to understand hash map, we'll do a separate video where we'll dive into the internals of a hash map. Tree map is like a self-balancing binary search tree and linked hash map is your hash table. And it also maintains a linked list of the elements in which uh, like it changes the elements through the linked list as well uh, in the order in which they were inserted. So it's more complex than a hash map. Map does not allow duplicate keys. Just like a hash set, we do, cannot have duplicate elements, but we can have duplicate values. For example, burger can cost 50. Noodles can also cost 50. The value can be duplicated, but the key must be different, right? Hash map and linked hash map, they allow null keys and values, but tree map does not allow null key or a value, right? Tree map, you cannot store a null key. A map cannot be traversed, so you cannot directly iterate on the map. So you need to convert it into set using key set or entry. This we will look into the code demo. Talking a bit more about uh, the hierarchy in Java, there is a map interface, okay, and hash map is an implementation for the map interface. Right? There is a linked hash map which builds on the top of your hash map class, right? Hash map is a class. Linked hash map is also a class. Tree map is a class that implements your sorted map interface. Sorted map interface is again a uh, child interface of map, right? It, it kind of extends that map. Here, ordering is important. Right? You get the uh, keys in a sorted order. Here, you get keys in the order in which they were inserted. And hash map, it is the fastest. Here, you don't get any ordering on the key. This is the difference between the implementation. Also, uh, the operations are order one here on average the operations on tree map they are order of log n on average why because it is using a self-balancing 
binary search tree okay? okay so here i have implemented a map object by using the hash map class right so i've created a map called as menu and i'm going to add certain items in so i can say menu dot add it's a uh, the item is dosa and the price is 200 menu dot add let's say the item is burger the price is 50 we are getting a error here so the method is called as put hash map we don't have the add method because it does not inherit the collection interface okay i told you map is separate from uh, map interface is not uh, it's not a child interface for of collections interface okay, so it has method called put it does not have a method called add so i can put key value pairs like this i can say menu dot put noodles and maybe some price and here i can say s out show me the menu let's see if we get something here so let's see what do we get if i run this code in the meanwhile i will write down some more methods so i can see there are i can see the uh, list of key value pairs that are stored inside this map i can also remove something i can say menu dot remove i give burger i just need to give the key the burger will get removed from the map i can also search that if my menu contains some item like dosa i can say contains key this is the method and i can check whether it is present so you can say yes the out uh, s out dosa found so you can do this as well but after removing burger we have two items noodles and dosa in our map right so dosa is there so dosa found it's get it, it gets printed now let us also talk about how we can iterate on the map there are multiple ways right so what we can do is okay i just uh, written the three ways to iterate so that we can save some time so the way one is i can do i can create an object of the type map dot entry and this object is uh, iterating over uh, all so map menu dot entry set is a method that gives me the list of key value pairs where each key value pair is considered as an entry right I'm saying okay give me all the entries and given any entry i want to get the key and i want to get the value so that is one way so you are printing the first entry the second entry and then the third entry that is one way another way is if you want to just get the keys of the map you can say okay menu dot key set so it will give me all the keys like dosa burger noodles and you are iterating over these keys those keys are things then you can say okay i want to iterate over the values that are 250 70 i just want to iterate over these values so you can call the method called menu.values and it will give you a set of values and you can iterate over this set using a for each loop and for every value you can print it i'll just run this code and show you the output you can see i'm able to iterate over the uh, uh, keys i'm able to iterate over the values and i'm also able to iterate over uh, key value pairs right so this is coming from this loop right and apart from it there are some more functions which can come handy so you can i would suggest you can try those methods is empty whether the map is empty or not size how many elements we have clear clear out everything in the map right this is clear method is helpful if you are working with multiple test cases every time you have to load new items and discard the previous items from the hash maps instead of destroying the object and creating a new object it's better to clear out everything from the previous map so then there is get or default if the key is found you want to return some value uh, you want to return the value or if the key is not present you want to return some default value this is something you can use so for example i can say menu dot get uh, let's say uh, pizza so pizza i have not inserted if the pizza is not there i can say the default value is let's say zero that means um, in this case i will get an answer that is zero s out this value right what i'm getting i'm getting zero that means pizza is not present the default value if the item is not present i think the default value for that item is zero i can also say uh, i want to put pizza if it is not there so menu dot put if absent i can say okay it will first check if the item is not there if pizza is not there put pizza inside the map and put the value of pizza as 200 if i go and run this now it will first insert pizza because it's not there so it's basically using the put method with a condition and now if if i inquire about give me the 
price of pizza now the pizza is present because we have added it and i'm getting the pizza price as that's all for map right and now what you can do is you can also have a custom uh, class here you can also have something more complex here for example list of integers list of books key can be of any type value can be of any type but if you're using a custom key again you will have to overwrite your hash code method and the equals method just we did in the case of hash set as well one more thing we can do is if you um, want to replace this with a linked hash map you can do that everything will remain same and your ordering will also be maintained and you can also uh, replace it with a tree map if you want everything will remain same except the internal structure will be now uh, it will be using a self balancing uh, bst right so you can also do a tree map kind of a stuff here we need to import it uh, tree map map is the code will work fine except now the elements will be sorted according to their um, keys right video we are going to discuss about linked list, introduction of linked list, insertion in a linked list, deletion in a linked list, different operations that we can perform on linked list. We will also try to see some important algorithms, some important concepts behind linked list, how we can solve different questions on link on linked list on different different platforms. This is going to be an extensive four to five hours long course on linked list and will take you from scratch to advanced level in linked list. Right. So we'll start from the very very basic definition of things like uh, storing right how we store data in data in uh, programming right if let's say i want to store a variable so we generally store a variable in this particular format like int a is equal to 5 so this is the format in which we store a variable in our programming like while we are coding right now let's say if i want to store a group of numbers together let's say i want to store the roll numbers of top 10 students of your class so for storing them, either I need to create 10 variables. So that will be a little tedious task. So instead of creating these 10 variables, what I will do is I, we already know a data structure for this. That is an array. So what is an array? Array is a basic data structure. It goes something like this. Let's say this is a array. We, how we initialize an array like this int specifies that the data that we will be putting up in our array is of integer format right so this is the initialization of an array basic initialization of an array int arr and in the brackets we are putting five so five suggests the size of this array let's say so let's say this is the array that we have we have we are uh, putting in numbers like one two three four five six seven eight and nine Right. So let me index this array 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So indexing this indexing of array starts from 0. Right. So this is how we store elements in a contiguous fashion. So in array, array gives us a privilege of storing elements in a contiguous fashion. Right. So uh, what if I say now I want to add two more elements in my array? So is there a possibility and how array is like, let's say this, what, how we store this particular array? We generally store the address of the first element. Let's say this address is hundred, right? And an integer takes four bytes. So this is hundred. This will be one zero four. This will be one zero eight. This will be one zero one one twelve. This will be one one six. This will be one two zero. This will be one twenty four, one twenty eight. This will be 128, this will be 132 and 136. So the next number, if I want to add, should be at 136th place. But I'm not sure whether this 136th place is available for me or not. Right? If I want to add another number after 9 in this particular array, so I am not able to add that number. Right? So what, like, so this is a big problem. How we can solve this particular problem? So here comes the concept of what we are discussing is linked list. So how is linked list different from an array and what actually is there in a linked list is, let's say, so now instead of uh, saving or instead of uh, saving elements in a contiguous fashion as we have seen above, what I'm going to do in this case is, I'm going to 
let's say I have I want to store four numbers one two three and four right so I make a block and I I take a particular memory block and I put one in that I take another memory block and I put two in that I take another memory block and I put three in that I take another memory block I put four in that so I have four different memory blocks in my array each having its own address let's say it is address one this is address two this is address three this is address four Right, so there are multiple addresses that we can see in our linked list. So this is address one, address two, address three, and address four. So now, like, if I want to add a new element, I can simply create a new element. Let's say five at address five. So for this kind of a structure, for this kind of a data structure, what I actually need, I need to store these addresses somewhere, right? So maybe uh, I can maintain uh, something in which I will be storing all their addresses. Right, this is possible, right? But this will again be very tedious, right? Carrying, uh, maintaining, and storing addresses of elements somewhere. So this is again a tedious task. So I want to make it a little more simple. How can we do that? So is there a possibility in which I don't need to store all these addresses? So it said like there is a possibility. How we can do that is basically by Connecting these elements. How we can connect these elements? Let's say I have one here. It is present at 100th location. I have two here. It is present at 200th location. I have three here. It is present at 330 location. I have four here present at 450 location, right? So I want like these should be interconnected. I don't need to, I don't want that I should store their addresses somewhere. It will take me more memory. It will take me more operations. That is something that is not very, very uh, required, right? So is there a way in which I can avoid that? So for avoiding that, basically I'll be creating something in which I'll connect this, uh, this element or this block with another block, this block with another block, this block with another block, right? And I will save the address of this block. This only uh, saving this, the address of this block will serve the purpose. So what can be done in this case is like, I want to connect all of these together. So for connecting all of these together, there is a way out, right? How, how that will work. Let's say this is one, this is two. So we'll create a structure in such a way that this one is this memory block is divided into two partitions. This first partition will contain my data of the node that I have data that I want to store, right? And the second part will store the address of the next number that I want to store. So the address of next number is 200. So I'll store 200 here. Here it's 100. So the next node here is 330. I'll store the address of 330 here. Next node is 3. I'll store the address of next node that is 450 here. This is 4. And now there's no node. So I'll store null here, right? So in this way, what we are actually doing is we are connecting this 200, now this 200 address is uh, written here. That means I have the location of the next node. So both of these are connected now. This is also connected now. This is also connected now. Now I just need to store this address. Now if I have this address, this is the address 100. With this address, I can access any of the elements of this linked list, right? I don't need to separately store these addresses anymore right i don't need to separately store these addresses anymore i can just store the address of the first uh, first element and that's it right so how will be like if uh, like now you have seen this is a new kind of a structure right so when i say a new kind of a structure it's something of this particular sort in which i am storing data in this part and I am storing the address of next node here, right? Data here and address of next node here. So is there any data type? Like we already know data types like integer or character or float or 
class so this whole structure the structure that contains data as well as address of the next node next we we call this as node this is known as a node so we'll create this class node and inside this class node we will have two data members this is like first thing that we want to store is data second thing that we want to store is address so the data here is integer data and secondly is second uh, what we are going to do is we are going to store the next address so if we are storing address of something so what we generally use in storing address we use the pointer right but what will come here of pointer is of what type let's say uh, if you have something known as integer a is equal to 5 how we store the address of this integer we generally store it by and percent a let's say i'm doing int star ptr right this is the way in which we store the address of a right so this is the variable like of what type like i am storing the address of integer type so i have this integer in the front so here i am storing the address of what i am storing the address of the next node so this complete node right so what will be the data, data type here it will be node star next so this is the basic structure of class that we will be uh, using ahead. This is how my first uh, link list will be. Mother, one node of the link list will be made. Basic structure, basic understanding, right? Now, if someone says you to uh, create a node, like this is the class that we have made, right? And once we are making a class, we need to initialize these as well. So to initialize these as well, what we do is there is something known as a constructor. As you people already might be aware, you all have started object-oriented programming, right? So constructor is required. So what will constructor do? Class node. Inside this we have int data and node star next. What ne what else we need to do is we need to create a constructor. So constructor is, will be something like this. It will have an argument int data and inside this what we'll do is we'll initialize this data and this next. So how will you initialize this? We can use this card uh, this data is equal to data. What is this keyword? This keyword is the keyword that stores the address of my current object. Stores the address of current object. Right? This ke data I am putting this data that is I am receiving in the argument. So this data is initialized. What I will put in the next, I will put null initially. So this is basically how a node is created. Initially, if a node is created, let's say I am creating a node n1. So I need to pass on the data, let's say 1. So once I write this statement in my main function, what will actually happen? A node will be created. It will have two parts. The data part, one I am passing, one will be passed here. And the next variable will be initialized to null. So writing node n1 will create a new node with data 1 and next pointer as null. Right? I hope this is true. Right? So now let's just try to code in what we have written till now so that you can have a better understanding. Right? So we are here on the interview bit IDE. So the first thing that we were doing is we, will, we were creating a class class node inside this class node uh, what happens is like we generally have access specifiers be it private public and protected so we let's create a public uh, public data members int data second thing is node star next now you very well know why we are using this node star next next thing that we want is we want to create a constructor node int data and I will be initializing this now. So how we are initializing this data I was putting as data. Right. And next is initialized to null. 
So this is what we have created this node class. How we'll create our nodes? Let's say I want to create my first node. So how we'll create my first node? Node n1 and in the bracket I'll put 1. So what does this statement mean? This statement here, node n1 bracket 1 means that I have created a new node with data 1 and next pointer is initialized to null. Right? Let me create a node n2 with the data 2. Right, I have created two nodes, node n1 with data1 and node n2 with data2. Right? Now I want to connect these two nodes. How I will be able to connect two nodes? Let's just try and see. Right? So what, what happened uh, like this is we have written node n1 1 and node n2 2. So this these are the two statements that we have written. Right? So this statement refers that I have created a new node with the data one and next pointer as null. This statement means I have created a new node with the data two and next pointer as null. Right now I want to connect these two nodes, right? I want to have a structure of this particular format in which one is connected to two. How I can do that? I can do that by connecting like the end, like this will have a certain address, right? Let's say this address is 100, the address of this is 200. So if I connect, if I put 200 instead of null here. So now my first node is storing the address of the second node and second node is storing null. That means my link list is connected now, right? So what we need to do is we need to put n1 dot next is equal to and percent of n2 and percent of n2 suggests address of node 2 and we are putting the address of node 2 in my node 1's next. Right? I hope this is clear. So I just want to do this and let's just try to print after that how it goes. Right? So I have node 1 and node 2. What I did there was n1.next is equal to and percent n2. Right? And now let's just print c out n1.data n2 dot data right so this is what we have done till now class ends with a semicolon and now try to run this so yeah we have successfully executed the code we have two uh, nodes coming ahead that is one and two right i hope this is clear to you great so now we'll try to see something uh, else like we'll try to create more number of nodes and so that you can have a better clarity. So now that we have uh, talked about we have seen how we can output we can uh, print n1 dot data and n2 dot data right. So now I want a thing in such a way that I don't need to know both the nodes of this link list. I just need to, I just have one pointer through which I can access the entire link list. So now currently my link list looks something like this. It's N1, it's N2, here it's data, here it's address of N2, here data of N2, here it is null right so in this way this is the format of how a link list would look like right so now what if i store the address of this particular node in a variable known as head so this variable this starting node of my link list is known as a head variable and i'll use this head to access the entire link list so this head can be like head what will this heads next represents heads next represents the second node what will be heads next next so what will be this this will be the third node and so on in this way we can access the entire link list using the head let me just show you in the uh, ide that how we'll be doing this right so now we have created node n1 let me create something as node star head that is equal to address of n1 now i'll be printing the data using this only right how we'll do that we'll do heads 
data and head key next for data. Let me just try and print if it is working all right. Yeah, so we are getting one and two again just by the first node of the linked list, right? So now we have discussed this. Let me take you to uh, some point where we create multiple nodes and we try to print all these nodes in a linked list. So how will we be doing that? So uh, let me just like, I just want to let you know what I'm actually trying to say, right? Let's say there are multiple nodes that there is N1, there is N2, there is N3, N4, N5. And I want to print all these nodes. How I'll be printing? And I have just this head, head of the link list, right? This, let's say we have this particular link list. And this is null. Address of one is 100 and 100 is stored in my head point. Right. So now using this head, I want to print this entire link list. So what will be the steps that we can follow? There can be multiple steps. There can be multiple ways. So if I want to print this particular link list, so the first thing that I will be printing is one. So how we can print one, we can do C out heads data, right? C out heads data. After we have uh, done C out heads data, the next thing after this is what we'll do, we'll move head equals to heads next. So what we are doing in this particular line is like initially the value of head is 100. Right. Uh, now we have moved the value of head to heads next. Right. So the value of 100 changes to 200. That is the address of 2. Let's say it is 300, it is 400, it is 500. Now we have done this. We have used this particular line. Now we are at second node, right? Now again, if we we'll print heads data, here the output was one. Now again, if we print heads data, the output will be two in this case, right? Again, what I'll do, head is equal to heads next, right? So this 200 will change to, to 300. Again, if I'll print heads data, it will give me three. So in this way, we can print the entire link list, right? So let me create these five nodes, connect them together and we'll try to print it using a print link list function, right? You will understand it a little more better when we'll code it uh, on screen. Right. So what I'm trying to say is that like we have already created node N1. We have uh, created node N2. Let's create node N3 as well. Node N3 with data 3, let's say. Node N4 with data 4. Node N5 with data 5. Right. Now what I, what, uh, uh, I want to do is I want to connect these nodes together. So connecting these nodes together means N1 K next may what I'll put address of N2, right? This is something that we're doing again. Similarly, we'll do it for other nodes as well. <coughs> Sorry. Right. So here it will be N2's next will have address of N3. N3's next will have address of N4. N4's next will have address of N5. And we are done. Now we have head variable, head pointer that is storing the address of my first node. So I'll simply call upon a print linked list function that and I'll pass head in that function. Right? Now I need to create this print linked list function. Let me just remove these two lines of code as well. So yeah, let us create this void print link list and I'll be passing node star root. Let's say this is the head that we're passing on, right? Let me just call it as head only, right? So after this, what, what I'm uh, going to do is the first thing uh, going here, what we'll do is uh, I'll put a while loop. I'll put a while loop. I'll say 
while my head is not equal to null so the first thing i'll do is i'll see out head data right and i will do head is equal to head arrow next so what does this line represent see out head data so firstly we have passed head that is we have passed this first node so it will check if head is equal to null no it is not equal to null it will move inside it will print head data that is one will be printed it will change head is equal to head arrow next this is what we have seen here head is equal to head arrow next every time we are doing and the address of the next is stored in the head now again second time two will be printed then again head is equal to head arrow next three will be printed four will be printed and five will be printed and we'll finally have the printed link list let me just try and see if we can print the link list using this so yeah you can see that we have successfully printed 1 2 3 4 and 5 so this is that the function is working right let me just do one thing let me just copy this function and paste it here so what do you think will happen just pause the video and think yeah i hope you have thought on what will happen so now as we are changing head every time we are changing head we are uh, printing the data of the head and we are changing head is equal to head arrow next so once we are out of this loop our head is pointing to null so now if head is pointing to null this will not go inside this loop and will not see any difference in the uh, output so it uh, our link list will not be printed twice but once why because our head will be null at this point so matlab but this is really wrong right we we can we need to use this head you might we might need to use this head multiple times throughout our function so instead of using our head directly here let me just uh, pull it down so instead of using our head directly here what i'll do is i'll create a temporary node node temp is equal to head and i'll perform all operations on this temp while temp is not equal to null see out temp's data and temp is equal to temp arrow next so this is what we need to do and i hope this will also be printed so in this way we have successfully printed our link list and i hope you are clear with the basics of link list now we move on to some other concepts of link list right so now we have seen how we uh use link list how we print a particular link list now let's move on to some operations that involve link list right so if we are to do some operations let's say insertion to begin with if we are to insert something let me just yeah so for insertion in a link list so what is going to happen let's say uh, you might know the case of an array right if we are given an array of such a form in which there are certain numbers like 1 2 3 4 5 6 and so on right and like these are the indexes 0 1 2 3 4 5 if let's say i want that you should insert a certain number 70 at index 2 so what you will do in case of an array so we very well know that in case of an array i'll have to make this space vacant so that i can add 70 here so for that case we need to move all these elements that are uh after second index we need to move them one place back so that involves transferring this to this this to this this to this this to this and this space becomes empty we'll add 70 here and we have inserted an element this is something that is considered to be a negative point in case of arrays so if we are talking about linked list right so we have seen what are the advantages of linked list so what how will this process of insertion go like in a linked list so linked list is something like 1 2 3 4 five and null so let's say we have this linked list and i want to insert same thing want to insert 70 at index Two. So let's let's just name the indexes. This is zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. So this is the second index. We want seventy to be inserted here. So for that matter, and what like generally for a linked list, what we are given, we are given this head that points to the address of this first location, 
and we want to insert 70 at the second index of the linked list right so this is to be done so what we can do in this case is let's say we will be shifting the pointer uh, the next of this first node like the node that is just before this index to the address of my new node and the next pointer of the new node to the next pointer of my previous node so this is this is the general very general overview we will go in depth of how this everything is happening let me just take you to a new page right so yeah so we want to insert now we want to insert a new node in linked list let's say we are given an example let's write it very neatly one two three four five and null what we are given is head let's say the head initially is like the address of this is let's say it's 100 so let's say the head value is 100 what we are given is we are given a certain data that we want to add let's say we want to add 70 we are given a position that is ith position that is the second position we want to add 70 at the second position that is if we index them let's say if i index it as 0 1 2 3 4 right so i want to insert data 70 at second index that is my linked list after insertion should look something like this it should look like 1 2 70 3 4 5 and null this is what I want. This is my final output. So how can this happen? Okay. So we have already discussed like what happens in a linked list. Basically a linked list node is of this form, right? A node has something known as data and something known as next pointer that stores the address of the next index. Now this node, let's say one will be having the address of two. 2 will be having the address of 3, 3 will be having the address of 4, 4 will be having the address of 5. Let's consider these two nodes, right? Uh, let's consider node 2. Let's consider node 3, right? Uh, let If this address is 100, let's say we consider its address as 200, it says 300, 400 and 500. So one will be having the address of 2 that is 200 2 will be having the address of 3 that is 300 will be lying here 3 will be having the address of 4 that is 400 will be lying here now what i have been told is i have been told to add a node 70 here so to add a node 70 here first thing is from this head i need to move to this place a place one less than my index value right so i need to reach this place first of all the first task is to reach this place this is one thing what will i do after reaching this place i have been given this data i have to create a new node with this data right so if i was to create a new node with this data so how the new node looks like new node is something like this is my new node data is 70 and address we don't know so it is null so i've created my new node and i want to insert this new node in between both of these nodes right so till now what things we know we know one thing that is we need to create a new node with data right second thing is we want to travel till the one index less than my given position travel till one index less than the given position so how how will will start writing the code right let let me just take you to the ide so that you can get some better insights okay so this is our id what we have done till now is we have created a node we have printed that no printed a linked list and we have a certain linked list like this linked list is currently having these nodes one two three four and five so this is the current linked list that we have right now right so what i need to do is i need to create a new function or uh, so that i can insert a new node let me just create a new function by the name of insert node so what this insert node function will be having so the first thing that we 
so as to perform anything on any linked list we need to have the head pointer of that linked list so one head will be passed second thing that is passed is int data what is the new like what is the data that we are going to add as a new node third thing is int i so i stands for at which position i want to add the data let's say i want to add uh 70 at the second position so if i want to add 70 at the second position my data value will be 70 i value will be 2 this is what we have passed as an as our arguments right okay so let's uh, see how we'll we'll start with the things we just know some part of the thing that we are going to do right so first thing that we are going to do is we are going to create a new node so how to create a new node let me just name it as node star new node and in what is what is what are the parameters that new node and inside this node i'll put in my data so this line creates a new node this line creates a new node of this particular format data is here and this is null so this is what we have done by writing this particular line right next thing is we generally we now we know we don't prefer writing heads head instead we use temporary function temporary node that will work as our head so uh, let me just name start with the node temp is equal to head rather than uh, doing anything uh, any operation with our original head we try to maintain a temporary variable temporary node that points to my head and will do all the operations on this head right so now first after creating this i need to reach to a point i need to reach to a point i have this linked list one two three four five and null so i want to reach to this point if i want to insert my number at the second index so yeah for this reaching what we'll do so we'll uh we'll use a while loop while uh let me just maintain a variable count which value is initially zero while the value of count is less than i minus one i minus one suggests that a position that is less than the actual index right because we want to go to the go to one node previous to that index right so what we'll do inside this loop is we'll do temp is equal to temp arrow next that is we are going to the next node every time and we are increasing the value of count that is count plus plus so what this function is doing right so let's let's just take this example as only okay So what we have done till now so we have been passed a linked list like this is the head of the linked list this point the head points to this its address is 100 its address is 200 300 400 500 the value of initial head is 100 what we do we create a new node by the name of data i have created a new node let's say its address is 800 data that we have passed is let's say 70 and this is initially null this line is done now we have created a new node that is temp that points to my head so instead of this i have created a new node temp its value is also equal to 100 i have made a new variable count its value is equal to zero initially i am checking this condition and the value of i that we have passed is 2 here if count is less than 2 minus 1 is count less than 2 minus 1 yes it is 0 it is less than 2 minus 1 we'll go inside and we'll move, make temp is equal to temp arrow next temp is equal to temp arrow next so 100 will be changed to 200 and value of count will increase to 1 now again we'll move into the while loop 1 is 1 less than 2 minus 1 is 1 less than 2 minus 1 so uh what is it is there anything that we are doing wrong let's let's just see right so now we have uh, temp is equal to head while count is equal the initial value of count is zero now we have increased value of count to, to one now if we move on to uh, this while loop again so what will happen the value of count is now one i minus one so what is the value of i i was two 
2 minus 1 that is 1 so we will not go inside this loop we are simply here only so do we need to add this on this location are we planning to add our new node at this position no right we want to add at this particular position so we will be using count is less than or equal to i minus 1 let me just type in here there is there is something that we are missing right so while count is less than or equal to i minus 1 we are doing the same things and we have reached till here like if count is if the value of count is less than or equal to i minus 1 so now count value is 1 again 1 is less than or equal to 2 minus 1 that is 1 so we'll move inside the loop we'll increase the value of temp to 300 but increasing the value of temp to 300 will make it here right and that we don't want we just need its value till here 200 only why because if we have the value of temp 200 then we can simply put in the new node at this position and this node at this position so we don't need to go inside the loop we just need to have 200 in its place so we don't will not do this uh, equal to sign right this is this is actually wrong so it will be count less than I minus one let me just explain it to you once again in that uh, page so that you can get a better clarity what we have done right let's just uh, yeah so yeah this is what we were doing we've had this linked list one two three four five and null we have head that is pointing to hundred this is hundred this is 200 300 400 500 we want to add a new node uh, with the data 70 with the value of i that is at second position we want to add this is currently what we have right so what is the first step that we did we created a new node i created a new node new node is of this form it has the data 70 and the next as null let's consider its address as 800 now uh, this this is what i have now i created a new variable that is temp the value of temp is initially equal to head so it is 100 so what i am doing is i am maintaining this loop while count is less than i minus 1 i am doing temp is equal to temp arrow next and count plus plus right okay so initially the value of count is zero so i'll check for if count is less than i minus one if count is less than i minus one that suggests that zero is less than two minus one that is one that's true we'll go inside the loop we'll make temp is equal to temp arrow next temp key value changes to 200 right now temp value is 200 that is i am here right and the value of count increases to one as soon as the value of count increases to one we'll again check for this while loop now one is not less than one we'll not go inside the loop and our thing is done we just want to be here now we are here we have reached till this point or the one index less than the actual position and this is zero one two three four right we want to insert between two and three so we have reached till here we have a new node 70 and we want to insert it here so what can be the possibility we can simply put uh can we can we do this like temp k next may we can put this new node right can we do this like if it is let me just create it once again so that you can get some more clarity with addresses right if you have something of this sort okay yeah uh, its address is 100 its address is 200 it's 300 it's 400 it's 500 uh, 200 is stored here that is the next address 300 is stored here that is the next address 400 is stored here we want to insert a new node that we have created its address is initially 800 its value is 70 and it, this is pointing to null we have reached till here now temp points to 200 
temp is currently pointing to 200 and now we want to insert so the one thing that we can do is we can remove this 300 and we can add 800 here that makes this connection right but as soon as we do this we lose this 300 we don't have the rest of the linked list available so we'll not do this what we'll do this before before uh, making this connection i'll do one thing more i'll create i'll store this 300 somewhere right i'll create a new pointer that is node star a and i'll store this 300 node star a will contain my temps next so now this value is safe this 300 is safe in this node star a now what i will do is now i can do temp ka next is equal to new node this line makes this 300 to 800 and now this new hundred uh, this new nodes next should point to this so this address is stored in a so what i can do is i can do new nodes k next is equal to a. so these three statements we need to perform in order to insert this node also one thing more like instead of saving the address here what we can do is we can do this in two statements also so doing this in two statements is of this particular form like rather than first making this connection if we make this connection first right so what i will do in this case is new nodes next should contain temp connect right this will be of uh, this will be like uh, let me just take you through it once again this is 300 this is 300 and what we are doing is this is null so i'll not make this connection first i'll make this connection first so i'll put new node ke next may 300 new node ke next may temp connects 300 is stored in temps next temp is here temp ke next right and once this is done what we'll do is we'll do temp ke next may new node that is this 300 will be cut to 800 and this connection will be made so we can also do it in two steps we can also do as it in three steps right let me just take you to the code part and then you will understand it uh better right so we are here what i want to do is i want to uh i want to write three statements node star a is equal to temp arrow next that means it is storing it is saving that thing next is new node sorry temp ke next may is equal to new node is equal to new node and new node new nodes next will be having a so these three statements will solve the purpose or serve the purpose right let's just try and see if this is working and how how uh, it goes right so we have we initially created a linked list that is having five nodes one two three four five they all are connected to each other we are printing linked list using the head right let me just try and run if run if uh, to see if it is working so yeah this is working fine we have got one two three four five as our output now what i want is i want to call this function insert node so insert node and three arguments right we are passing on head we'll pass on this head we'll pass on the data data let's say i'm adding 70 and i that is the second position so these three things i have passed i'm again printing my linked list print linked list and i'm again passing the head so we'll check if this insert function is working correctly or not before that let me just call c out endl So yeah, we have two linked lists, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 70 is inserted at the ith position and we are done. So we have successfully inserted a new node in our linked list, right? Now let me just try out something else. So instead of two, let's say I print, I make seven, make it as seven. So now you can see we are getting a runtime error. Why we are getting a runtime error? Because seventh index does not exist. We have a linked list with only five nodes. So how this operation will be performed, right? Let's, let's just see this. So what we are doing in this case is we have this linked list one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
टू थ्री फोर फाइव एंड नल आई एम पासिंग ऑन द हेड इट्स गोइंग टू टेम्प टेम्प इट्स वैल्यूज लेट से हंड्रेड टू हंड्रेड थ्री हंड्रेड फोर हंड्रेड फाइव हंड्रेड एंड इनिशियल वैल्यू ऑफ टेम्प इज हंड्रेड न्यू नोड आई हैव क्रिएटेड द वैल्यू ऑफ न्यू नोड इज सेवेंटी एंड इट इज नल right this is this is something that we have in our hand currently now i'll check for the value of count is 0 i'll check if while count is less than i minus 1 now i the, the value of i is 7 right 7 minus 1 that is 6 yes uh, count is less than 6 i'll go and make temp is equal to temp arrow next it will become 200 and we'll do the value of count it was initially 0 we'll make it 1 Again, I'll check for the value of count. Is it less than one? Yes, it is less than one. I'll make it as two. Uh, sorry, I'll increase the value of temp to temp arrow next. That that is, it becomes three hundred. The value of count becomes two. Again, this happens. We'll check the if two is less than uh, six. Yes, two is less than six. What I'll do? I'll make the value of temp is equal to temp arrow next. It will become four hundred. Two becomes uh, three. Again, we'll check. It again goes. We'll make it five hundred. Again, it will become four. Yes, four is less than six. Again, we'll make five hundred as six hundred. Will we make five hundred as six hundred? No. We'll make it as null because five k next may it's null. So the next time we have the value of temp as null and we are accessing null is next. So nulls next is not defined. It will give us a segmentation error. so to solve this purpose what we'll do is we'll make a check we'll make a check until and unless temp is not equal to null then only we'll perform this thing so what we are going to do in this case is we are going to make a check and temp is not equal to null so if this condition is there then probably we'll get to our answer here also we'll make the same check if temp is not equal to null right so we have we have checked we have finally checked this edge case also okay if at any point we pass on a number which is out of the size of the linked list so what will happen so now we'll try to run so yeah you can see we have the same linked list seventh position we don't know only so how we'll add anything there right so this is something that we have solved right now one thing more that i would like to stress upon if i pass on my position as zero right let's see so your expected out output should be according to you it should be 1 2 3 4 5 this is the current linked list so if if i have zeroth position so it should be like 70 1 2 3 4 and 5 null right let me just try and run to see what happens in this case so now in this case you can see 70 is being added at the first position so why this is happening right let's just try and see why this is happening now if i am passing head 70 and 0 so head data is 70 i is 0 so first thing what we are doing is we are creating a new node we have created a new node already 70 and this is null right now we are creating time count value is 0 we'll check if count is uh less than i minus 1 so what is i i value is 0 so we are checking if we are checking for the first condition that is count is less than i minus 0 so this is wrong right 0 is less than minus 1 this is wrong so we'll not go inside this loop we'll directly go inside this loop so what happens here is we'll create a new node that is node star a is equal to temp ka next so temp's next is that is One can next that is two, so uh, A will be having A is next that is two hundred. A will be having two hundred. Now temps next is equal to new node. Temps next that is one can next will be equal to, corresponding to this new node. So one's next will correspond to seventy, and we'll do new nodes next is equal to A. So new nodes next will point to this. So my linked list according to our code will look something like one seventy. Two, three, four, and five. But this is wrong. So we need to make a separate check. If at all the value of i is equal equal to zero, 
what i need to do is i need to simply put new nodes next is equal to head if i simply put this new node can next is equal to head matlab 70s next i point it to this and i make this new node as head then it will serve the purpose so let's try and see in the code how it looks like so we'll make this check first of all if i is equal equal to 0 what i will do is i'll simply put new node k next equals to head then head should point to the new node right this is what we need to do but in this case we have changed the head itself that means in our original link list to head was something different but we have changed the head here so rather than using this we'll try to return our head return our new head so if we are returning something to this will also change it will change to node star right and also for this particular function nothing is going to be changed we just need to return head everything else is remain same here we need to change our head and i think we are done right now we are again passing 70 0 and head so now 70 should come at the first position as per our code so yeah 70 is coming here and we have successfully solved this problem so this was basically how we are inserting a number at ith position in our linked list right now we'll see some more operations on linked list so now we have seen one operation that is insertion now let's just talk about deletion right if you are given a linked list like say of this particular format 1 2 3 4 5 and null and somebody asks you to delete a node from this linked list right they give you the position of the node to be deleted similar to what we were doing in insertion so position mein jaise tumko de diya hai unhone uh, let's say 2 right so you want to delete the node at the second position so to delete the node at the second position that is this is the first uh, zeroth node first node second node third node fourth node that means you need to delete this node that is third node so what we simply will do in this particular case is let me just uh, make it like this we have something like 1 right we have something like 2 3 4 5 and null right so let's say the head is 100 it is 200 200 will be stored here 300 300 will be stored here 400 400 will be stored here 500 500 will be stored here and null will be stored here we want to remove this node so what we simply will do is rather than making the second node that is zero first second third fourth first node to point to 3 will make it point to this and will explicitly delete this this is what we are going to do right so what the first step in this case would also be will traverse till the i minus 1th node second thing is what we'll do we'll create will first of all we'll make a new node let's say node star a and inside this node star a what i'll show i'll show temps next that is this address i'll show 300 i'll create another node that is node star b and inside b i'll store a's next so a's next is that is 300's next that is 400 so in b we have 400 now in a we have 300 now and what we want is we want to put 400 here so what we'll do is we'll do temp temps next is equal to b and these three steps will finally delete this node matlab this will point, start pointing to this and this will be explicitly removed if we have made the nodes as static then we don't need to do anything if we made the nodes as dynamic then we need to use a delete keyword and delete them explicitly right also one thing more like how will handle the case uh, of if we give the node position as 
same we'll check for if temp is not equal to null this is the condition that we checked in insertion also one thing more if the node position is zero so what we simply will do in this case is head is equal to head ka next this is what we'll do in this case when the position given is zero right let me just take you to the code and see how it works so yeah so this is this is the code for insert node i'll try i'll see if we can just make some modifications in this code only and we'll get to our answer right i'll copy and paste this entire node once uh, this code once again instead of insert node let's just name this function as delete node now i'll not be having this data part i'll just have the position of the node right i don't need to create any new node because i'm deleting a node i'll make this temp variable i'll make point this temp to head count variable will also be made for this zeroth position for if a node is at the zeroth position what we were doing right if this is the case this is the linked list and we want to delete the node at the zeroth location so this is initially pointing to head so we'll simply do head is equal to head arrow next so right and we'll return so we'll uh, rather than doing this what we'll do is we'll remove these two lines i'll do head is equal to head arrow next and i'll return head right this will remain the same because we are moving on to the i minus one loop once we once temp is equal to i minus one loop these three steps are what i am going to change so node star a will be equal to temp cut next right node star b will be equal to a ka next and in temps next i am putting b that's it right so what i am doing in these steps is in these three steps what we are doing is like we have this case 1 2 3 4 5 6 and null this is zeroth first second third fourth fifth position i am adding i want to remove this delete the second node right so now temp is pointing to currently this and the value of temp is 200 now its address is 300 its address is 400 i am doing node star a is equal to temp's next so temp's next is now storing 300 so a will store 300 B will store A is next, so A is three hundred. Three hundreds next is four hundred, so B will store four hundred. And temps next will point to B. That is this two hundred. This two's next will point start pointing to this four hundred. That is B. So simply this will be removed. And I hope this should work. Right? Let's just try and run this code. Uh, this is delete node. Uh, let's just create one more function. That is delete. node let me insert head and let's say we'll remove this 70 right the zeroth location one and then we'll uh, do the same printing right let me just run this code so yeah the 70 is removed that is the node the node that was at zeroth position that is now removed uh, something more we can try rather than zero we can we are removing the node at the second position now so now the node at the second position that is two is removed zero the first and second the yeah the two is removed let me just make it as seven seventh is the index that does not exist so if we'll check if that condition that case is handled yeah that case is also handled because seventh is not the position in this linked list and that we can't delete anything so i hope this was also easy and you have got a pretty good idea of how to insert a node in a linked list how to delete a node from a linked list uh, let's see some more things in linked list going forward so now we have seen insertion as well as deletion in a linked list now uh, that uh, was without using recursion now recursion is a very important concept and going forward we'll be using recursion to solve problems related to linked list in many ways right so i want you people to understand how we can insert or delete a node using linked list or uh, uh, a node in a linked list using recursion 
so this is something that i want you to understand now right so what happens in recursion we will basically be looking forward to three things in a recursion question that is a base case a small calculation that we perform and a recursive call right so let's just take one example the same example that we were taking for so long one two three four five and null so this is the link list that is given to us initially now i have two things that is i have data let's say i want to add a node with data 70 and i that is position is 2 i want to add a node at position 2 with data 70 this is 0th index first index second index third index fourth index right so i want to add the node 70 here that is my node should uh, my link list should look like 1 2 70 3 4 5 and null this is what i'm looking forward to right this should be my output right so how we'll go forward uh, doing this particular question is so what happens in a recursion question so whenever we are given a recursion question we first think of the base case right so this is the link list that we initially have so what will be the base case let's say if the head is only given to us as null if at any point head is equal equal to null so we can simply return null what will add in a null link list right we don't have any any position to add in that link list so we'll simply return null so this will be my base case also what happens in any recursion problem is we try to break the problem we try to break it into in such a way that we have a smaller part and there's a large part so let's just try breaking it in this way so that we perform on this smaller part and recursion gives us the answer by automatically doing the things for the rest of the part right so now if this is the link list right this is the part that we are concerned about that we will have to perform a small calculation on and this is the part that recursion will help us to like if there is something to be added in this part then recursion will give us the answer right so what we'll focus on uh, uh, while while uh, solving this particular problem is that for one right so we want to if uh, we want to add any node at the first position so what will happen right so if the value of i is equal equal to zero that is i want to add the node at the zeroth location so what will be my step so first step is if i want to create a new node with data 70 i'll create a new node so first step is creating a new node right after that what would be the step i will add the new node at zeroth position right so my first thing is i'll create a new node that is node star new node i'll do new node with data 70 now i have this new node so at ith position what will happen we'll simply do no new node connect will point to head right we'll make a new node and we'll make it point to head second thing in this what, what we'll be doing is uh we'll be updating our head now our head will be equal to new node right my head points to this and we'll return head so if we are to add any new node at the zeroth position so these are the three steps that we'll perform right yeah so after this we need to call on recursion right but like this is what we will do if uh, we are to perform at the zeroth position now we are to perform at the second position so we'll want recursion to do that we'll make a recursive call that is delete recursive sorry insert recursive and we'll pass on three parameters so which parameters firstly instead of head now what will pass on will pass on head connect because we are passing the entire link list except the head so we'll pass on head connect we'll break we are breaking our problem basically right uh, data will pass as such that we want to add and now the position right if let's say i have second position so this is zero first second third fourth so this would be my second position in that case 
right but now this part is already run by us now i'm passing this particular node so for this particular node what will be so these will be the indexes 0 1 2 3 so in actual we want to add at the second position but in our new node it is the first location that is i minus 1 mother 2 less 1 less than 2 so that is we'll pass on i minus 1 here and after this we'll we'll store it in a new variable that is node star x so this x will give me updated link list with addition of 70 here so this x will have now 2 70 3 4 5 now x is having this now the last thing that we need to do is we need to connect our head with this x that is heads next should point to x now we have our complete link list with head uh, as the operated head and we'll simply return this head let me just uh, explain it to you once again in a, a little more simpler way so that you can get an idea so what we are actually doing in this particular question we are to add a node in a link list using recursion right we are given this link list we are given uh, head is here initially we are given the data as 70 i as 2 that is we need to add a number at the second position 0 1 2 3 4 right now first is base case so we have seen that base case would be if head at any point becomes equal to null so we'll simply return null small calculation is like i'll do the small work we'll break the problem into two parts this part will be handled by recursion this part will be handled by me that is at if at all up the position is zero then what i'll do is i'll create a new node right this new node will be created what i'll do for this particular case is i'll do new nodes next is equal to head right and i'll update my head equal to new node and i'll return this head right these three things i will do what after this what after this so we have done this we have performed the base case we have done the small calculation now it's the time for recursive call so what happens in a recursive call is yeah so now it's the time for recursive call insert recursive so here are the three arguments initially we were passing head data and i now what will pass i have one two three four five and null so now this is our breaking point we have performed the operation on the first that is the head now we need to pass this into our recursive function so this will be instead of head we'll pass on head ka next data will be same now carefully observe what will happen here now initially it was indexes were 0 1 2 3 4 right so we were to add at the second position but now we are passing this as our link list so its indexes will be 0 1 2 3 instead of this two now we have one that is to be passed that is one position prior to my actual position so we'll pass i minus one instead of i i'll get this in a new node that is node star x i believe this x will contain my two seventy three four five this is something that recursion has done for me right it's stored in x now the only thing that is left is i need to connect my head with this x head ke next me i want x so i'll add on 1 2 70 3 4 5 and this will be stored in head i'll simply return my head this is how it looks like when we are performing insertion using recursion right let me just take you through uh, the code part so yeah let's just create a new uh, a function that is node insert recursive here we'll have node star head 
we'll have int data we'll have int i that is the position so the first thing that we do is we'll create a new node is equal to new node with this data right i've created a new node after this what we are going to do if we are to perform this in a recursive manner is uh, the first thing that we'll do uh, if you have to perform this in the recursive manner is we'll do the we'll check the base case if at all my head is equal equal to null then what i'll do is i'll simply return my head that is null right after that so we are to perform the small calculation for a case if i is equal equal to zero if the value of i is equal equal to zero then what we are going to do is we are going to attach this new node in the front of my linked list. So new node ka next is equal to head. We'll update this head also. Head is equal to new node and I will return head. These are the things that we will be we are doing for our case. Next is the recursive call. I'll get the answer of this recursive call. What are the parameters that I'll pass on? I'll pass on heads ka next. I'll pass on the same data. And this is very important, i minus one, right? Now we have x, we have head. So I simply need to connect head ka next is equal to x and I will return my head. I hope this should be fine with you. So let's check if this is fine. What we are actually doing is we are creating a new node. This is like this node is being created 70 and null by this particular line. We are checking for if the head is equal equal to null. This is the base case. We are doing the small calculation for this part of my linked list. For this part, I am doing this work. If I have to add a node at the front location, then I'm passing on the entire linked list in a recursive call instead of head we are passing head ka next we are passing the same data we are passing i minus one i minus one means the position that is prior to the actual position because we have we are passing head ka next right so now this x will hold on by uh, adding the number at this particular position i'll simply connect this head ka next equal to x and will return this updated head so this is how we perform insertion using recursion let me just uh, see if uh, if this runs well right insert recursive is what we need to call upon so instead of node insert node what i'll do is i'll call upon insert recursive so let's see if it uh, adds upon instead of 70 let's say i give 69 this time so yeah, you can see 69 is added at the fourth position let me just change this index to zero 69 is added at the zeroth position. So recursion is able to help us in inserting a node in our linked list. And the code looks a little more simpler, right? So let's just see how we can uh, perform deletion operation using uh, recursion, right? We have already seen uh, deletion using uh, a normal method. Now we'll try to see deletion using recursion, right? Yeah. So now what we have is it's very, very similar to what we have seen in the case of uh, insertion we have this linked list and somebody tells me to delete the node at the ith position that is second position so this 0 1 2 3 4 so somebody tells me to delete this node my linked list should be the output should be something like 1 2 4 5 and null this is the output that I want right now currently I have this so how using recursion we can do this so again we'll have three three things in recursion so which all three things we are concerned about first is base case base cases we'll check for if my head is equal equal to null if it is we'll simply return null second thing is small calculation so what will be the small calculation that is if the value of i is equal equal to zero that is if i want to remove this head what i will do is i'll simply do head is equal to head connects that is my head will start pointing to here and i'll return my head this will be my small calculation what will be my recursive call so recursive call will be 
I'll take a variable. I'll take a node x, node star x, and inside this node star, I'll call recursive. That is delete recursive. I'll pass on three uh, two parameters. That is, I'll pass on this part of my linked list. That is head connect. Instead of i, again we are passing i minus one. I hope now this is clear why we are passing i minus one, not i in this case. Right now we have x also. We have head also. We need to connect both of these. What we'll do is head connect equals to x and return head this is what we are looking forward to do in this particular question let me just uh, take you through on uh, how we will be performing the deletion operation right let's just try and see if we can copy paste this only and make some changes to get the answer it will save your time as well as my time so instead of insert recursive, I'll use delete recursive. We should pass head. We don't need data this time. We don't need to create any new node this time. We'll simply check for this is this the base condition will remain the same for value. I equal equal to zero. We'll remove all this. What we simply need to do head is equal to head connect. We have simply removed the first node. I'll return head again. Right now we'll uh, call upon the X that is insert, uh, sorry, delete recursive here. It will become delete recursive. I'll pass on head connects. I'll remove this data as a parameter. I'll pass on I minus one head connects. I'll put X and I'll return my head. This will be the perfect function for delete recursive as well. Let's just try and see if we can, uh, how it goes here. So instead of insert recursive, what I'll do here is delete recursive head is same 69 is what I need to remove. I want to remove the number that is present at the zeroth location. So let's see how it goes. Yeah. So we have successfully removed 69. That is the number at the zeroth position. Let me just change the index to four, three. So we have removed the number that is present at the third index that is zero first second third third index is three so we've successfully removed the number that is present at the third index and these both are working super fine so we have been able to successfully insert as well as delete elements from a linked list using the normal operation as well as using recursion going forward we'll be solving a lot of questions using recursion so make sure you do these questions uh on your own Make sure you use a copy and pen and try to dry run these approaches so that you can get a better clarity on how you can get inside this very, very interesting topic of linked list, right? So the next thing that we're going to understand is basically calculating the length of the linked list, right? We are going to see how we calculate the length of linked list. So let's say we have this particular linked list, one, two, three, four, And we'll try to see the recursive solution for the same, right? So what happens is in a recursive solution, we need to check for the base case first, right? So base case would be if the length is equal, equal to zero, uh, sorry, if the value of head is equal, equal to null, that is linked list does not exist. We'll simply put length is equal to zero else will break it here and this is something that will pass on in the recursive function that means our recursive function will return the length of this part and we'll have to do the small calculation like what for this part we'll have to calculate so for this part what is the answer like it is of length one so we'll add one in this so overall it would look something like length function and we have node star head so what we'll do is we'll check for base case if head is equal equal to null will return zero and we'll simply return one plus we'll call the recursive function and we'll pass head connects. That's it. This will give us the length of linked list right now there is one more thing like i'll try to code this also 
but before going forward let's just discuss one more concept that is how to calculate the middle of our linked list right calculating the middle of linked list so it is very very simple like we have already discussed how to calculate the length of the linked list so calculating the middle is no big thing right let's say you have this kind of a linked list right so you have to calculate the middle of the linked list so using the above function you know what is the length of the linked list so the length of the linked list is 5 length comes out to be 5 so what you can do is you can simply find out the mid mid will be equal to length by 2 right length by 2 that means 5 by 2 2 so it will be 0 1 2 3 4 right so this is the index that will be our middle index so we'll simply return the data that is present at the middle index let's say our linked list is even linked list like the length is even So how will find out the uh, the same let's say we have 6 now 6 by 2 is 3 again so we can find out by 0 1 2 3 4 5 so the third index that is the second middle now for a for an even linked list we have two uh, cases right it can be either the first one or the second one so for calculating the second one we can simply use 6 by 2 and we can return but this is again a little bit uh, of uh, more complex let's just try to simplify this right so simplifying this is a very very important technique that is basically known as hair and tortoise method so what is there in hair and tortoise method is how we calculate the length uh, of the middle of the linked list uh, we are given a head of the linked list we initialize two pointers that is node star slow and node star fast we initialize them to head head let's take this example now this is my head initially I created a slow pointer I created a fast pointer both point to this head initially right now what I will do is I'll move the slow pointer one step at a time slow is equal to slows next and I'll move the fast pointer as fast is equal to fasts next next right so in the first step slow will come here and fast will come here the next step slow will come here fast will come here right so for whenever whenever fast reaches null or a number before null that is whenever this thing becomes null or only fast becomes null so then we can't access this thing at all so we will not go so we'll put up put up the condition so whenever this fast will point to either null or one less than the null then the number that is there at the slowth slowth uh, node is my middle i'll simplify it when you will, will do the code that will make the things a little more clear to you right so what what actually we are going to do is we are going to put down the condition here and I'm going to move slow by a single time and fast by two times. Right, and I'll return the slow point. So what should be this condition? So there can't be a time when fast connects is equal to null, right? Fast is not equal to null and fast next is not equal to null as soon as fast next becomes null so we can't access this 
hence this will give a segmentation fault otherwise so we can simply turn the slow pointer right so this is this is something that is an approach that you should keep in mind you can categorize it for even and odd link list as well now let's just move on to the code and see how we'll code this particular uh, question so now let's see the code part of this uh, we have a link list let's first find out the length for this the return type will be integer only and we'll be passing on the head right so first thing is if head is equal equal to null so we'll simply return the length as zero right else what will return one plus length of heads next hey this is what we discussed so probably this should give us the correct length let me just find out length is equal to length of my head and i'll see out end l first and then length right let me see if we can get the correct length yes we are getting the correct length that is six so this link list is containing six elements now let us just find out the middle also so it will its return type will be node let me just name it as middle only node star head we are passing on the head and how we'll calculate the middle the first thing is let me just uh, take a temporary node let's just not mess around with the head we'll take a slow pointer that is initially equal to head we'll take a fast pointer that is also equal to head we'll run a loop while head is not equal to null sorry let's just write this condition later on first thing is slow is equal to slows next is what we are going to do fast is equal to fast next next right and we'll return this slow pointer so here the condition should be firstly fast should not be equal to null and fast next should not be equal to null right these are the two conditions that we have let's just find out the middle as well so let me just have this as node star mid is equal to middle i'll pass on the head again i'll see out mid and that's it right let's see what does the answer mids data right this is a node so we'll be finding out mids data so yeah so the middle number out of this this list is we are getting the second middle that is three as the answer we can also get the first middle if let's say you are given a same given the same question and you need to find out the first middle right in this particular link list you need to find out the first middle so this is the question for you to try think upon it do a dry run and try solving how on how to get the first middle if the length of the link list is even let's also try for an odd length link list right let me just remove this insert recursive so now let's see what is the answer that we get so yeah so this is the link list that we have the length of the link list is five the middle that we're getting is three and i think we are all set to go with the next questions i hope you have understood finding the length of the link list middle of the link list insertion deletion recursively as well as with a normal method so this this creates the base for you to move ahead with other questions so we'll talk about other questions now so now we have very well discussed what is a singly linked list so now i want to uh, just focus upon what is a doubly linked list and how can we uh, operate on a doubly linked list right so when i say a singly linked list or a linked list in general is what we say singly linked list it looks something like this one two three four five and null 
right this is what a singly linked list looks like it just has the forward arrows right but what happens in a doubly linked list is the structure is something similar to this <coughs> 2 4 and 5 so it is something like this right so uh, in this case we had the node structure as our node was something like we had int star int sorry int data and node star next so this was basically the components of a singly linked list or the data members of a singly linked list but in doubly linked list what happens is along with this next pointer we have something known as previous pointer so what is the benefit of this is like at any point we don't need to uh, like we can access the previous element to that also and the next element to that also using any particular element so the node in this case would look something like int data node star left and node star right or you can say them as next or previous right node star next nodes are previous so this pointer points to the next node this pointer points to the previous node right so now let's say you are given a case in which you need to remove this particular node right you are given a node let's say a and this points to this fourth node and you need to remove this particular node from the linked list how can you do it without traversing the linked list at any cost right what we need to do we simply need to put this here and we need to put this here right and this we need to explicitly delete right now let's say this is this is the node that is given to us the node is node star a right this is the node that is given to us now what we'll do is we'll do a's previous so what is a's previous a's previous it's three right and three's next right three's next that is a's previous next so a's previous is three and three's next is this so what we want to put in this is we want to put five so what is five with respect to a so this is a so this is a's next right so we can say that a's previous ka next is equal to a's next right this is the first line of code now after this like this connection has been made we have successfully made this connection right now this connection we want to make it again so how we'll do that so now again so what is this node so this is a's next a's next is this now is ka previous a's next previous is equal to a's previous right what is a's next a's next is 5 so 5 ke previous mein what we are putting a's previous right so these four lines of code are something that will help us in this particular case so this is how a doubly linked list works apart from that let us just go through what stl in lists look like right so how like for every time when we are solving particular questions we don't uh, explicitly create linked list so we know something known as linked list stl so stl you all know that it is standard template library so what happens in linked list stl is linked list stl uh, it is categorized into two parts one is forward list and one is only list and we need to specify the data like the type of elements that we want in this list whether it's integer or whether it's something else right so this is 
known as doubly linked list. This list corresponds to doubly linked list. And this forward list corresponds to singly linked list. Right? So let us just have a more closer look at forward list and list uh, through our website. Like there's a website known as c++.com through which you can get entire information about all the STLs. So you can see forward list, they have uh, mentioned it very, very clearly what forward list is. Forward list are sequence of containers that allow constant time insert and erase options anywhere within the sequence. So there are a lot of uh, pre-built functions, pre-built member type functions that you, that are already defined so that you can use them directly. So these are the operations, right? You can use insert after, you can use erase after, you can use remove, unique, merge, sort, reverse, different, different functions are there that you can use with forward list. Similar to forward list, there is uh, an STL known as list STL. So list STL also it has uh, some of the functions like uh, begin and and some others. So make sure you check out c++.com for more information about STL on uh, linked list, right? You will get entire information about all different kinds of standard template libraries that are available in C++, right? So now let's see uh, how we can use them in our questions ahead. So the next very famous question that you all might uh, know about or might not, not know about is reversing a linked list. So you all might ha have heard of an ad. Do you know how to reverse a linked list? So I hope you all know this, right? So reversing a linked list, what happens when we are to reverse a linked list? We are given such nodes like one. We are given this linked list, right? five and null and you need to reverse this linked list like let's say its addresses are 100 200 300 400 and 500 when you will reverse this linked list it will like it should become it should not become something like this let me just write it down and show it to you It's not that you are just uh, taking out five and putting five here or taking out four and putting four here at the same address. No, this is not to be done. Instead, what you need to do is you need to change the connections. How you will change the connections? That is if five, four is pointing to five, now five should point to four. If three is pointing to four here, now four should point to three. If two is pointing to three here, now three should point to two. If two, one is pointing to two here, now two should point to one. One is pointing to nothing, then one should point to null here. And you need to return this head. This null will be removed. So this is what is our aim. This is what is the output that we are expecting. Right? So this is what we are looking forward to in this particular question. So how we'll do this? There are two particular methods that we'll see to implement this particular question. One is iterative method. And the other one is recursive method. So we'll see both methods. Let's start by iterative method so that you can have, you can understand the in-depth analysis of how we are reversing a linked list, right? So what happens in this case is in an iterative case, let's say we have this linked list one, two, three, four, four, five and null. We have this linked list, right? Let's consider its address as 100, 200, 300, 400 and 500. So now let us say we want to, what we want to actually do, we want to reverse this pointer. That is, if this is the head node, right? So heads next, now this is currently pointing to two, right? Now we want to make this two to point back to one. This is what we want, right? So let's consider three pointers. We can solve it using, uh, by taking three different pointers, right? So let me just mark them as, so this is my current pointer. My current pointer will be here. 
I'll take a previous pointer. My previous pointer will be here and next pointer that is my next pointer will be here. So this is my current number. This is my next number in the linked list. This is my previous number. So for the first case, the previous should be equal to null because there's no number before one. Right now, what we are actually trying to do is in this case is uh, what will be C's next. So we want to connect this one instead of two, we want to connect it to null, right? We want to put C's next as null, right? We want to put C's next as null. So instead of null, like now we have previous, but every time when we'll, let's say this is the current situation, let's say PC and N are here, right? So now what you want to put in fours next, fours next, we want to point to three. So C's next, we want to point to previous, right? So this is one thing that we'll do. So we'll point C's next to previous, right? After that, what we'll do, we'll move on right we'll move on this entire thing to the next part now current will come here previous will come here and next will come here and we'll same repeat the same cycle right now what we have done in this case is after c's next is equal to p we have made p is equal to c previous becomes current and c is equal to n current becomes my next right and what happens to the next next has changed to from here to here that is next is equal to n ka next right and like we will be putting a check in front of the n because as soon as we move ahead in our linked list at some point of time n will become null when current will be at this particular position so we can't access null ka next this will give segmentation error so i'll check put a check if n is not equal to null then only we'll do so these are the three conditions that will help us reverse the linked list right and what we'll simply do once we reach uh, till here, we'll simply return P at the end. Right. So these are the steps that we'll follow. Now let's move on to the code. I hope you will better understand it using the code. So this is a question that is there in front of us. It is basically uh, reversing a linked list. We are given the head of the linked list and uh, we will be performing. So first thing is we may, will check if our head is equal equal to null. If our head is equal equal to null, we don't need to do anything, which simply return null, right? After that, what we took three pointers, list node star P, that is previous pointer, it was initially pointing to null. We also took list node star C, that is currently pointing to head. We took list node star n that is currently pointing to heads next, right? These are the three things only we have. Now we'll, we were repeating the steps again and again until and unless c becomes equal to null. C is not equal to null. So which all three steps were we are performing? C's next becomes previous, then previous becomes my current and current becomes my next. These are the three steps. And the last step was if n is not equal to null, we will be moving n is equal to n's next. So these are the steps that we were doing actually. And what will simply return? So my last will be pointing to what? The previous one, let's just see how it is. So what we have done in this case is we have created, so first of all, we have been passed ahead. Right. Let's say this is the linked list that we have one, two, three, four, five, and null. Right. I have made three pointers P, C, and N. P is here, C is here, N is here. Right. C is at the head, N is at heads next, and P is at the null. Right. Now we'll run this until C reaches here, until current reaches here. So what we are doing, C's next is equal to P. C's next is equal to P. That is C's next. One's next is equal to P. So it is null. One's next becomes null. And what happens next is previous equals to current. Previous becomes current. So previous becomes comes here. Current becomes next. 
सो नाउ करंट बिकम्स नेक्स्ट एंड इफ नल इज एन इज नॉट इक्वल टू नल एन बिकम्स एनज नेक्स्ट सो दिस एन बिकम्स एनज नेक्स्ट दैट इज एन कम्स हेयर राइट नाउ अगेन विल मूव ऑन टू द लूप सी इज नॉट इक्वल टू नल नाउ ऑल्सो सो वॉट विल चेक सी इज नेक्स्ट इज इक्वल टू पी नाउ सी इज नेक्स्ट इज इक्वल टू पी सो वॉट इज पी वन सो विल मेक दिस कनेक्शन that is two's next so two's next is pointing to one now this is we have done p equal to c again so now this becomes a uh, p this becomes c n is equal to n arrow next so this becomes n again we'll simply run we'll move here we'll move these three things one step forward this becomes n now again for this it becomes like this we'll move again this becomes p this becomes c n becomes none now at this point n becomes null so we'll not be moving we'll not be performing this step any forward right and we will simply uh, uh now in the next step c is still not equal to null we'll again run the loop c is next become equals to p c is next matlab 5 is next becomes equal to p 5 starts pointing to 4 present becomes current so now this becomes p this becomes c so now 5 is pointing to p right p is pointing to 5 that is the last node that is the head node we need to return this only we need to return this linked list right 5 4 3 2 1 and null now p is pointing to 5 so we'll simply return this 5 in this case right i hope this is a little more clear i would say try to dry run it on your own on a piece of paper you will understand it a lot better right let's just try to run this code So yeah, so one, two, three, four, five linked list was given to us, and we have successfully reversed this linked list as five, four, three, two, one. So this was the iterative method of reversing a linked list. Now let's see how we can do it using recursion. So recursive method is also very, very simple. You just need to understand a little bit uh, the steps of recursion, basically, right? So which all steps of recursion do we know? So in every recursion question, we uh, first uh, we take care of the base case, we take care of the small calculation and we take care of the recursive call right so in this question also let's just say yeah so in this question also recursive solution right so we have this linked list 1 2 3 4 5 and null So what happens is we try to break our problem in in recursion, right? So if we we'll break our problem from here, now this is one part, this is one part, right? So this part basically is something that will pass on to recursion, and we expect recursion to give the correct answer. What we expect from recursion is recursion will give us this five, four, three, two, and null. With this as the Answer that is this is the answer that is coming from recursion. So we have thought that recursion should give us this, right? After this is done, now what is the thing that is left on us? Now we have this head, right? We want to point this two to this head. We want to point this two to this head and this head to null. So these are the two steps that we need to perform, right? So what is two? So two stands for, I mean, if this is the head currently, this is pointing to head. so 2 is what to, what is 2 so we want to make two we want to point this 2 to 1 right so now uh, head points to 1 so what is heads next heads next is 2 so we want to point this 2 to 1 right we want to point this 2 to 1 we want to point this heads next to heads next to Well, the heads next is two, and we want to point two's next to one again. So heads next is two. We want to point two's next to head again. That is one. So now this connection is made. Well, this is a very very important line. Heads next next is equal to head. This line. is very very important what we are doing in this is heads next is 
टू टूज नेक्स्ट इज वन दिस इज वॉट वी आर पुटिंग टू के नेक्स्ट में वी आर पुटिंग वन टू के नेक्स्ट में वी आर पुटिंग वन राइट आफ्टर दिस हेड सो हेड शुड पॉइंट टू नल सो विल राइट हेड इज इक्वल टू नल these other steps that we need to perform also there is there should be one base case so what should be the base case like this recursive call when it should return when the value of head when the value of head ka next becomes equal to null when heads next become equal to null we simply return head right this will be my base case now let me just try to submit this recursive code also and see how it goes right so let me just create one more function list node star reverse list node star head right what we'll put inside this is we'll make a check like this is the base condition let's just write this base condition afterwards first thing is we will call upon the recursive function list node star x so we want that answer should be stored in x that is the head that should come after uh, this recursive call should be stored in x so we'll say reverse and we'll pass on head ka next in this right now x is having the entire linked list like x is having what it is having 5 4 3 to 1 with x pointing to 5 now my my task is my task is heads next ka next should be equal to head like the last second step 2 should i am pointing this 2 to 1 right and head should point to null this is what i want to have and what should i return i should return this x only right this x only should be returned because it is pointing to 5 and i want to have a linked list with 5 4 3 to 1 so what should be the base case base case will be if heads next is not equal to null I'll simply return head. ठीक है जी. Let me just remove this iterative code from here. Here also we'll put a check if let's say if head is equal equal to null initially only, then we'll simply return null. Right? And else we'll return reverse. of head we'll call upon the function reverse of head i hope this should work fine let's just try to see try to run and see how it goes okay 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 there is a little bit of problem mm -hmm. it should not it is equal equal to null but when heads next becomes equal to null then only we were returning now this should be the base case right Okay, so there is some error. Let's let me just try to debug. What is the error? Hmm, it should be head itself, right? Just a minute. So it should be head ka next is equal to now. This this was the problem, I guess. So. No, not to make the head equal to null. We want to make the heads next equal to null, right? What what actually I'm trying to say in this case is like we had this one, two, three, four, five, and null, right? This part was handled by recursion. We get the answer in x. X is pointing to five, and we have this linked list five, four, three, two, right, and null. This is the linked list that recursion. Gives us and x is pointing to this five. So now I want to point this two to this one. So this is the step that does that. Heads next ka next equal to head. So this is done. Now one this is head. Heads next should point to null. So heads next should point to null and we should return x. So this is the step that we were missing. Let me try to run it again and see how it goes. Probably it should pass. Let's see. So yeah. 
so it is passing we have one two three four five and we have the expected output as five four three two one i hope this code is clear to you and now you can successfully reverse a linked list using both iteration and recursion uh if somebody asks you to what is the time complexity in both the cases right this is something that can be asked in our interviews so what will be the time complexity time complexity in both the cases will be almost similar right because we are moving at n uh, nodes of a linked list so it will be o of n space complexity in iteration case will be no will be o of 1 right because we are just making three pointers nothing else but space complexity will be there in the recursive case because we create a recursive stack internally so space complexity wise iterative solution is a little better right so make sure you check with this point as well in your interviews so the next question that we have is basically merge two sorted linked lists right so what is given to us in the question is the problem statement is like this we have a list one let's say this is the linked list one we have list two we have a second linked list and both of them are sorted this is given in the question let's say we take an example of three uh, let's say five eight and null let's say another linked list one four nine and null so we have the situation we have been given two linked lists linked list one and linked list two and we need to merge both of them that is our answer should be something like one three four five eight and nine null this is what we are looking forward to as an answer in our merge two sorted lists right this is the answer that we need so how can this be done in uh, in the best possible way right so there are two approaches again for this particular question and we'll discuss both of these approaches one is a recursive approach a pretty simple one the second is basically an iterative approach firstly i'll help you understand the recursive approach right so let's say we have two pointers l1 and l2 pointing to list one and list two right so now you see in this particular given linked list the like it is the sorted list so the smallest element will lie at this the head of the list l1 and the smallest of the list two will lie at the head of list two right so out of both these lists which will be the minimum element the smallest one right so how we can get that we will get it can be either the smallest of l1 or the smallest of l2 right so we'll compare l1 and l2 let's say out of l1 and l2 one is the smallest right so now i know that i have got the smallest element that is one right so i'll pick this up so this will be my list two list two comes out to be the smallest like i'll compare list one value and list two's value so now list one value is greater than list two so list two is the smallest element right so list two i'll start from here and the rest of the part like the rest of the part i will say to recursion ki recursion this is the list i am passing this is the list i am passing merge both of them and give me the final answer right so what recursion will do recursion will pass this also and this also and it will give us the final answer that is x so now this x will be having a merged sorted linked list containing the the complete list l1 and the remaining part of l2 so our next task would be we just need to attach list 2's next with x so as soon as we attach this we will say that our lists are sorted pretty simple right what all test cases oh, sorry base cases we need to solve upon let's say we are given list 1 is equal equal to null if list 1 is given equal equal to null what we can do is we can simply return list 2 right second thing can be if list 2 is equal equal to null if list 2 is given equal equal to null we can simply return list l1 right 
let's just try to code it a bit and then we'll dry run it uh, so that you can understand it a little more better right so this is the problem that is given to us that is merge two sorted lists you are given heads of two sorted lists list one and list two merge the two sorted lists in one sorted list the list should be made by splicing together the nodes of the first two lists right so let's say so we are given this particular function merge two lists lists one and list two we are given right let's create our own merge function list nodes star merge in this we have list node star l1 and list node star l2 right so the base cases were if at all l1 is equal equal to null then what we'll do will simply return l2 right and if l2 is equal equal to null then what we'll do will simply return l1 so these are the two things these are the two base cases that we have right after that what we are going to do is we are going to compare if uh, l1's value let's say l1's value is less than l2's value so that means the first element the work that we are doing is on l1 that is l1 is the smallest element or the minimum of both the lists right so what we'll simply do l1's next may i will put what i will get from the recursion so what i'll put in recursion now i know l1 is the smallest element so instead of l1 i'll pass l1's next uh, right and along with that i'll pass l2 right so now list one this this recursive function that is list one ka next and list two this merge function i am expecting that it will give me the combined merged results of both of these lists lists l1's next and l2 right after that i don't need to do anything i just need to return this l1 and we are done but what about the second case right else part let me write down the else part so what happens in the else part is i will do l2's next is equal to merge well if l1 is not smaller then it's obvious that l2's value is smaller from both of these sorted linked lists so i'll merge here l1 complete and l2's next what i'll return in this case is i'll return l2 right so now we have l1 returned we have l2 returned and this uh, function i believe is done let's just try to uh, return and call this merge here we we could have done it here only that would not have been a problem we can do it here also let's let's just do it like this list 1 list 2 and let's try to run the code so we have successfully merged both of these two linked list 1 2 4 1 3 5, uh, 1 3 4 as 1 1 2 3 4 4 1 1 2 3 4 4 right so now you can see what what is happening is if l1 is equal equal to null we return l2 simply like let's say if list 1 is not there then we simply return list 2 similarly if list 2 is not there we simply return list 1 so both of these things are done right after that the first case we'll compare the first element of both of these 1 2 4 1 3 and 4 we'll compare the first element of both of these so of uh, the first element of both of these is same so we can take any one let's say we take this one right so l1's next so now this is what i am passing on to recursion and i believe that recursion will give me the correct answer after merging so what recursion gives me is 1 2 3 4 4 this is what recursion has given me and this is stored in merge now what i just need to do is l1's next may i need to put this one so i get this final answer as 1 1 2 3 4 4 4 right similarly if l uh, we take the second case if l2 is smaller then we'll take this case and we simply merge this is how recursion works here right if let's say we don't use recursion and i want to do it by iteration right so how we'll do that let's just discuss the approach for that as well right so now what uh, we are uh, what we are doing here again is so yeah 
so here again now let's just take that same example 1 4 8 null this is list 1 this is list 2 list 2 is 2 3 and 5 null right again what we have to do is we'll have to compare this first element of l1 and l2 l1's value and l2's value so i'll compare both of them if l1's value is less than l2's value right so in this case i'll take a dummy node let's say i create a dummy node and i initialize it as minus one also i'll maintain a tail variable which will point to this dummy node let's say dummy node is answer let me name it as answer and this tail is pointing to answer again we'll point the same base matlab, for here what i will do is i'll compare l1's value with l2's value if l1's value is less than l2's value then i'll point tails next to l1 and i'll update my tail so as to keep a track of that how far we have gone this tail variable is due to that right tails next is equal to l1 so now this is done what i will do is i'll move l1 here and l2 is still here again this will these both will be compared l1's value and l2's value which is smaller so now 2 is smaller so what i will do is tails next will be equal to l2 right then again l2 will move l2 will come here now we'll compare this l1 and l2 again l2 will again put tails next is equal to l2 now this is done l2 will be here now we'll compare l1 and l2 again so now 5 and 4 which is smaller l1 so we'll put tails next is equal to l1 and we'll move l1 here uh, now we'll again compare l1 and l2 which is smaller l2 is smaller we'll put tails next is equal to l2 now l2 becomes null as soon as any of these linked list becomes null then the second linked list as such we'll have to attach in our linked list right eight is left let's say we had nine or we had 12 also so now we have reached a null here so the remaining elements of the first linked list will attach as it is right so i believe this also when we'll code it uh, right you will be able to understand it a little more better right so let's try to code this as well uh, let me just comment down this code right so merge to sorted linked lists or oh, sorry merge to lists so uh, here also the first thing is if at all i know that list one is equal equal to null so what will happen is i'll simply return list two right if list two is equal equal to null i'll simply return list one right i'll maintain a dummy node let's say list node star answer is equal to new list node and let me just initialize it to anything we can initialize it can be zero it can be anything let's say we initialize it to something as minus three right this is something that i have initialized after that i'll maintain a tail variable list node star tail is equal to answer so this is pointing to answer this is just to maintain ki where we are reaching in our linked list this is basically a tracker you can say right again this loop i'll run until and unless either of my list one is complete or my list two is complete until l1 is not equal to null and l2 is not equal to null either of them is not equal to null so now i'll see if l1's value is less than l2's value right if l1's value is less than l2's value then what we are going to do is tail k next may we attached l1 right and now tail becomes equal to l1 and l1 increases so l1 here is like in the previous question we took it as l1 and l2 here we are taking it as list 2 and list 1 so let me just name rename it as list 2 and list 1 so tails next it's list 1 tail is equal to list 1 and list one is equal to list one's next right 
so this is the if statement the first if statement else if this is not the case that is list one ka value is greater than list two then same thing we'll do with the list two tails next is equal to list two tail is equal to list two and list two is equal to list two's next right so this is something that we have done and we'll have to check those two cases if at all one link list is complete and then the rest of the link list will be as such so for that if l1 is equal equal to null then what we can do is we can use tails next is equal to l2 right else tail ka next will be equal to l1 to l1 again it's l1 l2 is list 1 and list 2 right after that what we are going to return is we are going to return the next of the dummy node right let me just explain it to you once we write the code answers next are going to return let's just run this code okay so it is list 2 So we've successfully submitted and the solution has been accepted. So what we are doing in this particular case is let's just uh, try and see again. So firstly, we are making the checks. If list one is null, we'll simply return list two. If list two is null, we'll simply return list one. After that, what we have done is we have created a dummy node answer, right? This is the dummy node answer. And we have made our tail pointer to point to this answer. Initially, its value is minus three. It does not matter. You can name uh, give it as minus one, minus five, minus ten, anything, right? After that, we have put a check. We have two lists, list one and list two, right? It Let's say it is one, three, five. It is two, four, six, and then it is null, right? So what is happening is until and unless list one is not equal to null and list two is not equal to null, right? So we'll perform these operations. First thing is we'll check this. If list one ka value is less than list two ka value, that is if one is less than two. Yes, it is true. So what I will do is tail ke next me I'll put tail ke next me answer me I'll put list one. Matlab, I'll put one. So this is this is what is happening, right? Answer ke next me sabse pehle one chala gaya. After that tail is equal to list one. Now tail is updated here and list one moves forward. Now list one becomes here. Now again, this is done. So uh, if statement we have gone to again, we'll move into the while loop is list one null. No list two null. No, we'll again compare L1 and L2, which is smaller two or three, two is smaller. So what we'll do is uh, now two is smaller, right? So we'll not go in the if part we will go in the else part. So tails next is equal to list two. So tails next is equal to list two. That is two will attach here. Now tail is increased to here and list two becomes here. Now again, we'll compare L1 and L2, which is smaller three or four, three is smaller. What we'll do tails next is equal to list one. So it will become three tail is equal to list one. So tail becomes list one tail is here and list one is equal to list one connects. We'll move L1 here. We'll again compare this four and five and so on. We'll go till the end and we'll have a sorted link list one, two, three, four, five and six so this completes the this these this particular line of codes <coughs> right so after this let's say why these two lines are there let's say i have this link list one two sorry i have something of this particular sort one three five seven nine and null and second link list is two and four null right we compare this and this we attach one two then we attach three then we attach four now after four this has become null as soon as list one becomes null or list two becomes null so is it that i'll stop doing anything no what i will do is after one two three four i'll put all the elements five seven nine in the complete list this is what i'm doing in these two steps <coughs> right so at the end what we are doing is we are returning answers next that is initially answer was minus three minus three can next say he hamari like link list was starting and that is what we are returning i hope this is clear
right so we have successfully solved this problem using recursive approach also and using iterative approach also now let's see another problem so the next thing that we're going to see in this particular uh, video is the question it's also an easy problem remove duplicates from a sorted list right you are given the head of a sorted linked list and you need to delete all the duplicates such that each element appears only once and you need to return the linked list sorted as well right so this is the linked list that you have one two two three three this is the sorted linked list that is given and you need to return a linked list by removing all the duplicates one is occurring two times so we need to remove this for once two is occurring one time that's fine three is occurring two times we need to remove one so we need to return one two three this is the problem statement right now let's discuss the approach how we can solve this particular problem so uh, remove duplicates right so this is the problem statement that is given to us so uh, let's say this is the example one one two three three and null so again for solving this particular problem i have two approaches one is recursive and one is iterative let's first understand the recursive approach then we'll go on to the iterative approach and we'll see how we can solve it in the best possible way so this is the list that is given to you and you need to remove all the duplicates what happens in recursion is we take a small part and we tell recursion to solve the larger part for us right so we break this uh, linked list here we pass this entire thing to our recursion and i believe that recursion will return me the list after removing all the duplicates that is recursion will return me one two and three right so this is the result after i pass on to the recursive function so now the next thing that is my turn what i need to do is i need to check this head and the first element of the recursive result so if they are same that means one is here also one is here also so i need to remove this so i'll simply return my recursive head else if they both are uh, different right this head is different and recursive head is different so i'll have to attach this recursive head to heads next so heads next will be equal to my recursive head and i'll return this head in that case right you will be able to understand it better when we'll code it so let's just move up on to the ide and try to code it right so we are given uh the head of the link list so the first thing that is the basic thing that what we need to check is we need to check if head is equal equal to null or heads next is equal equal to null if both of them that means it's just one number so it can't be duplicate so we need to simply return head in this case right next thing next thing is i'll call upon recursion list node star x so i will store the answer of that recursion in x so what i will do is i'll call delete duplicates heads next right so the entire result after recursion will be stored in this x right now i need to check if the heads value is equal equal to the value of x if this is the case then what is the next step we'll simply skip the head and we'll return x as such right else what we'll do else i will attach the heads next to x and we'll return this head i hope this is clear to you there is nothing uh, very very difficult to understand so what we are doing in this particular case is let's say we have this example 1 1 2 3 3 and null right so initially we are checking if head is equal equal to null or heads next is equal equal to null so we have checked both of them they are not equal to null else we would have returned head simply right next we are calling upon recursion for this part we are passing upon heads next and we are expecting the answer in x so what will x have x after recursion will have 1 2 and 3 and null now next case is i'll compare if the value of head is equal equal to value of x that is this value if it is equal equal to this value yes this is true in our case so we'll simply return x so we'll simply return this x as my answer else if they both would not have been same then what let's say it is it, it would have been zero then i'll compare zero and one else part will go on 
विल पुट ऑन हेड नेक्स्ट एज एक्स मतलब जीरो का नेक्स्ट आई पुट दिस एक्स एंड आई रिटर्न दिस हेड सो नाउ माई आंसर वुड बी इन दैट केस जीरो वन टू थ्री राइट आई होप दिस इज ऑल्सो क्लियर राइट नाउ लेट्स डिस्कस द आई ट्रेटिव अप्रोच ऑन हाउ वी कैन सॉल्व दिस पर्टिकुलर प्रॉब्लम जस्ट थिंक अपॉन हाउ द आई ट्रेटिव अप्रोच वुड बी राइट सो हाउ द आई ट्रेटिव अप्रोच वुड बी सो लेट्स वी हैव दिस वन वन टू थ्री थ्री एंड नल राइट सो इन द आइटरेटिव अप्रोच ऑल्सो दीज टू दिस स्टेप इज गोइंग टू रिमेन द सेम विल चेक फॉर इफ हेड इज इक्वल इक्वल टू नल और हेड्स नेक्स्ट इज इक्वल इक्वल टू नल विल सिंपली रिटर्न हेड वॉट विल चेंज इन आइटरेटिव अप्रोच इज विल रन अ वाइल कंडीशन अंटिल नलनेस दिस हेड इज इक्वल इज नॉट इक्वल टू नल वॉट विल डू इज विल सिंपली कंपेयर द डेटा ऑफ हेड विद हेड्स नेक्स्ट राइट विल कंपेयर द वैल्यू ऑफ हेड If it is equal equal to head k next की value, right? If both of these values are same, so what I need to do is I need to simply skip this part, right? So for skipping this part, what I need to do is I need to make this connection. So for making this connection, I need to have the address of this. Let's store the address of this and a variable a list star a will be equal to temp k next का next. so temp is this temp or head you can say head ke next ka next head is this head ka next is this next ka next is this so we stored the address in a variable next what thing i am going to do is temp ka next i am going to make it as a that is is ka next i am going to make it as a and this will be removed else what i'll do if this is not the case like both of them are different 2 and 3 are different so what i will do is i'll simply move temp to temps next So this is going to be the code for this particular question. Let's just try to see the approach. Let's just try to see the code so that you can understand it in a more better way, right? So what happens in the code part is this uh, head is equal equal to null or head ka next is equal equal to null remains the same. Again, let me just remove this code part. So instead of using head, I'll create a temporary variable list node star temp is equal to head. fine so what i am going to do after this so after this i'll check for uh, i'll put a while loop right while temp temps next is not equal to null so we'll check for if temp ka value is equal equal to temp ke next ka value right so that means both are same so we need to skip that number how we were skipping that number was list node star char a is equal to temp k next ka next right and we were simply putting temp ka next is equal to a that is we have skipped the middle node directly else part mein i was simply moving temp temp is equal to temp ka next right let me just try and run this as well mm -mm. okay there's one extra bracket Is there some problem with the brackets? Let me just check. Right. This is for this. This is for. So this. This is for this. Mm hmm. There is no problem with the brackets. Let's just try and run this again. Oh. so we haven't returned anything in this case okay 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 sorry 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 yeah so we we are to return head itself 
yeah so we have finally got the answer this is correct answer 112 the uh, list with all the duplicates removed is 12 and let's just submit this and see how it goes so you successfully submitted this as well so now i hope you have understood the recursive as well as the iterative solution of remove duplicates from a sorted list this can also be asked in your interviews so now let's move upon to the next problem in this video we are basically going to discuss a new problem that is add new two numbers so what you are given is you are given two non empty linked lists representing two non negative integers so this is a condition that is given the digits are stored in reverse order basically the digits that you are given they are stored in reverse order each of their nodes contain a single digit add the two numbers and return the same sum as linked list so you will be given uh two heads of two linked lists and they will be representing two numbers present in reverse order and you need to add these two numbers matlab the you need to add these two individual elements of linked list separately and then you need to return the answer in the form of head of the linked list only right so let's see with uh, this with an example and then we'll try to see how we can code this better right so let's take an example where we have uh, something of the sort let's say we have 4 let's say we have 4 we have 6 we have uh 2 and we have null second like we we have this linked list l1 we have this linked list l2 in this we have 2 let's say we have 8 we have again 8 and let's say we have 1 so we we are given this l1 and l2 that points to the head of linked list l1 l2 points to the head of linked list l2 and we need to return our result so the result would be in such a way that uh, these numbers are given to us in the reverse order as per the mentioned so the original numbers will be 264 and 1882 so when i add these two numbers so it will be 4 plus 2 uh, 6 it will be 8 plus 6 14 so 4 will be here and 1 will be given as carry so 8 9 10 and 1 11 1 and 1 will be again carry 1 and 1 when added will give us 2 so the answer is going to be 2 1 4 6 so we need to return let's say we need to return result and the result should look something like 6 4 1 2 3 so this is something that i want to return i want to point this result to this head uh, of the answer and i need to re return this result so this is something that we are looking forward to in this particular question so uh, for solving this question let me take a dummy node let's say i'm taking a dummy node d so this is the dummy node and uh, let's start pointing it to Uh, let me just take this is this as l1 this as l2 we'll take two variables sum and carry right so we'll try to add individual l1 and l2 we'll uh, first of all i'll go and check if l1 is uh, empty or l1 has something so if l1 is not empty i'll go to l1 and i'll add l1 and l2 together so when i'll add l1 and l2 i'll add, uh, i'll put that uh, thing in the sum so 4 plus 2 comes out to be 6 so i'll have 6 in the sum and also i'll make a new node with 6 that is sum i'll insert into this list and i'll point this to uh, this let's say point it's pointing to temp and i'll point this dummy node to 6 now temp will move on to this 6 as of now this is what is happening till till now right and carry is 0 in this case right so what what we're going to see in the next like we'll move l1 one step forward we'll move l2 one step forward now again we'll uh, once 6 is written here we'll remove 6 from here and it again turns out to be 0 so now we'll add 8 plus 6 we'll check if l1 is empty or l2 is empty as soon as any one of them is empty we'll uh, will not do anything but they are not empty so we'll add 8 and 6 adding 8 and 6 will give us 14 so we'll put 14 in the sum right and will create a new node and inside this new node what will put we will be putting sum modulo 14 this is something that will put in uh, sorry sum modulo 10 
so what is the sum now it's 14 modulo 10 that is 4 so we are going to put 4 in our uh, new node and we'll point this temp to this and inside our carry what we are going to put inside our carry we are going to put 14 divided by 10 so when i say 14 divided by 10 it gives out to be 1 so my carry becomes 1 now right so now again 14 is gone and 14 turns out to be 0 right with carry 1 so now this carry is also there right now this carry is also there so what happens is as soon as i move l1 to here l2 to here now while calculating sum i'll add this carry also right I'll, one I, once i'll add this carry so it becomes 8 plus 2 plus 1 so it is uh, 11 so 11 is there in the sum carry becomes 0 now what i'll be putting in the next node in the next node i'll be putting uh, sum modulo 10 right so that is 11 modulo 10 that gives 1 so i'll be putting 1 here and in the carry what we'll put again 11 divided by 10 so 11 divided by 10 is again 1 so i'll put 1 in the carry again right as soon as this is done so we'll uh, put sum is equal to 0 again and we'll move l1 and l2 further now l1 is not there right so we'll not take l1 now but l2 is there and along with that a carry is there so carry is 1 l2 is 1 when i'll add l2 and l1 uh, sorry when i'll add l2 and carry so it comes out to be 2 so i'll add i'll have 2 in the sum so what will be there in the carry that is 2 divided by 10 uh, sorry 2 divided by 10 and 2 modulo 10 uh, 2 modulo 10 so 2 modulo 10 will give me 2 again so i'll add 2 i'll move the temp here earlier also i'll move the temp here and 2 will be pointing to uh, 2 i'll create a new node and i'll add 2 into it 2 divided by 10 gives me 0 so i'll add i'll make carry equal to 0 so in this way now uh, my l1 is also empty now like till how long i'll have to run this loop either we'll check for l1 whether it's empty or not we'll check for l2 whether it's empty or not and also we'll check for carry if it is empty or not if there is only carry left then also we'll add only carry to our new uh, we'll make a new node and we'll put that carry into our new node and we'll point that to null so that is basically what we are trying to do in this particular question we'll point this to null at the end and we'll return the dummies next well, the, uh, dummy ka next is basically the head of our new answer so we'll return dummies next as the output so this is going to be the approach talking about the time complexity so it will be uh, o of m or n the length of the longer linked list right if it's l1 or l2 so it's basically the time complexity goes according to that also uh, let's now discuss the code part like if you are trying to code this particular solution then how uh, this go this is going to actually work and what all things we need to do basically we will be doing the same what i have explained to you here in the explanation part right now let's move on to the code part and see how we can code this so basically what we are given we are given l1 and l2 so l1 and l2 points to the head of two linked lists l1 and l2 so firstly i'll create a dummy node as per i have explained to you it's list node dummy is equal to new list node then what I'll do, I'll create a temp variable that is pointing to this dummy. So this temp will be taking uh, uh, forward when we add a new node to our result dummy linked list, right? So temp will point to dummy. After that, we'll initialize a carry variable which is equal to zero, right? So we'll run this while loop until and unless we discuss about three conditions. Firstly, l1 should not be equal to null or l2 should not be equal to null or carry should not be equal to null so these three conditions uh, will sh these should satisfy un until and unless this loop will run right so int sum is equal to zero initially i have initialized the sum is equal to zero its value will be what we are uh, what will be going to see from l1 plus l2 plus carry right we are going to do this so 
inside this we'll take check two other conditions if l1 is not equal to null until and unless l1 is not equal to null what we'll do we'll add the value of l1 in sum sum is equal to l1's value right and then we'll move on l1 further l1 is equal to uh, l1's next right again if l2 is not equal to null then what we'll do we'll uh, do sum plus equals to l2's value right hmm. and we'll do l2 is equal to l2's next right so we have done these two things after that what i what i was doing is i was adding the value of carry in sum that's the third thing right and what was the value of carry carry was equal to sum divided by 10 uh, what after this we were creating a new node list node in which we are storing the uh, answer node is equal to new list node and what will this list node have list node will be having some modulo 10 right why the sum modulo 10 because like we saw that the last part was uh, like let's say we have 14 as the sum so 4 will be there in the list node and 1 will be given to the carry so we have given uh, carry as sum divided by 10 and the number in the list as sum modulo 10 next thing is we'll be moving apart our temp temps next is equal to uh, this node that we have created and then we'll move on temp further temp is equal to temps next right at the end what will return will return uh, dummies next and we are done this is basically what we uh, have uh, done and what we have uh, understood in that particular solution let's try to run this code and see if it is working so we were we were to create list node here i think everything else should be fine or if there is some typo okay so it's val not value okay so for this particular case like 2 4 3 5 6 4 we should have 5 plus 2 7 6 plus 4 10 0 1 is carry 4 5 6 7 and 8 should be the answer 8 7 0 8 is what we are getting as the reverse number so exact answer should be 8 0 7 but we need to return the reverse so it is 7 0 8 hi so the next question that we have uh right So the next question that we're going to discuss is basically uh, to detect a cycle in a linked list, right? We have discussed some of the problems in linked list. Now uh, it's also a very, very important problem from the point of view of interviews. So linked list cycle detection, right? So what exactly does this mean? Let's say we, you know, what is the structure of a linked list, right? We have uh, something known as nodes in which first node is connected to the second node second node is connected to the third node third node is connected to the fourth node and fifth node let's say this is connected to null so this is a kind of a linked list that you are aware of we have something known as head where from where we can access the complete linked list right but let's say you have an example in which you have linked list of this particular form 1 3 right or it can be 1 it can be of this form so now what happens in this linked list is there's no null right you don't find any null here or it can be something like this also right so now you move from 1 to 2 2 to 3 3 to 4 4 to again 2 2 to 3 3 to 4 4 to again 2 and this continues forever this is a linked list with a loop or a linked list with a cycle so here this cycle exists right similarly here also you start from one you go to two you then go to three 
and again go to 2 go to 3 again go to 2 again go to 3 3 2 3 2 3 2 3 and it again forms a cycle so what we are supposed to do in this particular problem is we need to detect these cycles right so when i say detect these cycles so from the point of view of uh, cycle detection you need to tell you need to return a true or a false to confirm whether a cycle exists or not and if it exists you have to return which is the first node where it meets right you'll have to tell which is the first node where it meets so this is basic basic uh, cycle detection part so what can be the approach how we can solve this particular problem or how we can approach to this particular problem there can be various methods right so the first and the most important thing that comes to our mind is let's say i have something of this sort one two three four five and we have this particular cycle right so we have nodes like one two three four and five and uh, four traces back to two then two to three three to four and it's in this fashion right so what can be done so the first thing that comes to my mind is let's say i create a hash map so hash map is a data structure in a in which i put all the nodes along with their frequencies right let's say one is there one and i put its frequency as one again uh, or you can say like i have a uh, uh, a hash map like let's say one then two with an entry one then three with an entry one four with an entry one as soon as it moves from four to two again so i can see one is already present in the two's column that means two already exists in this linked list so as soon as this conditions occur what we can say is that this link list contains a loop or contains a cycle right this part is done now at which node the cycle exists so the cycle exists at this node 2 so the first number that exists more than once is the node where the cycle exists right so this can be one simple approach that we can follow for solving this particular problem right but what is the problem in this particular approach when i say problem so there can be a problem with respect to this hash map so to create a hash map we need space right so this accounts for a time uh, for a space complexity of o of n so I have this extra space complexity. So I need to reduce this at any cost, right? So this is a very, very, uh, I would say lovely method uh, that we have already used when we are finding the middle of the link list, right? We found the middle of the link list by some method. I'll just uh, make you revise that as well. Uh, but uh, for discussing this problem, we are discussing a very very important algorithm that is known as floyd warshall cycle detection algorithm so what happens in this particular algorithm is and it's very very magical look you will love this uh, way that we uh, solve this particular problem right so how we are going to do this actually let's say you have this linked list one two three four five and five traces back to two right so what you are going to do in this case is you take two pointers concept pointers you take two pointers slow pointer and fast pointer so both slow pointer and fast pointer are initially at this point right slow pointer is also here fast pointer is also here both slow and fast pointer are pointing to this now make the slow pointer point a move one step at a time make the fast pointer move two steps at a time right 
so what i'm trying to say in this particular thing is like let's say if uh, slow is moving here fast will move here this slow is here fast will move here at the same point then both fast and slow will be cut slow will be here then fast will be here slow will be here then fast will be here then slow will be here and fast will be here so this is a point where both slow and fast meet so this thing suggests that cycle exists so at any point in a linked list if at all i find that slow and fast pointers this is logically correct also right pointers meet at any point where slow and fast pointers meet with each other that is the point where we can say that uh cycle exists in a linked list because that thing is something that is occurring twice right this tells us that that thing is occurring twice and let's let's take it as uh let's let's just take one more example so let's say you have this kind of uh, a situation in which it is 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 7 and back to 3 so like let's say this is the linked list that is given to you right and you have your slow and fast pointers here right now you know that slow moves by one step at a time fast moves two steps at a time right this is something that you know so now slow moves here fast moves here then if slow moves here then fast moves here 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 now this is the point where both slow is equal equal to fast right so this suggests that cycle exists in the linked list so this is the point that cycle exists in the linked list and how to detect that first node तो फर्स्ट नोट कैसे डिटेक्ट कर सकते हैं हाउ वी कैन डिटेक्ट दैट फर्स्ट नोट सो द पॉइंट वेयर बोथ ऑफ दीज नोट्स मीट कीप योर स्लो पॉइंटर देयर एंड मेक अ न्यू पॉइंटर स्टार्ट विच शुड पॉइंट एट द फर्स्ट नाउ मूव स्टार्ट बाय वन स्टेप एंड स्लो बाय वन स्टेप वन स्टेप स्टार्ट मूव्स फ्रॉम हेयर टू हेयर स्लो मूव्स फ्रॉम हेयर टू हेयर start moves from here to here slow moves from here to here so they will ultimately meet at the first node matlab yahan se if you will start matlab the point where both of these meet yahan se itna distance will be equal to this distance thoda ajeeb lag raha hoga na i think you might not have understood iska proof dekhte hain right why i am saying all this what is the logic behind this so what i'm saying is let's say if we have something of this particular sort let's say this is the cycle that is existing uh, this is a certain distance a that i am traveling and this is the point let's say where both slow and fast pointer are meeting right so let me just name this point as p right so let's say this is the starting of the uh, linked list this is the pointer p this is the distance b and this is the distance c so we have three different distances a b and c right and what we want to see is like this is the point where both of them meet and i am saying that if we start a pointer from this p and you start a pointer from this start both of them will meet at the starting node right so let's see uh, what the proof looks like and how why i am claiming all this right so now this uh, let's calculate the distance that is traveled by the slow pointer and the distance that is traveled by the fast pointer 
obviously the distance that is traveled by the slow pointer into 2 will be equal to what is the distance traveled by fast pointer this is by logic because slow is moving at single space single pace fast is moving at double pace let's say what is the distance that slow travels so slow pointer travels is a distance then let's say it covers some rounds of this circle and it covers this distance b again and it meets fast pointer here right so what i will write this as it will be a plus b plus c that means complete circle let's say it covers some m number of rounds plus this b again right into 2 will be equal to fast how many rounds will fast take it will take a plus uh, b plus c that is the number of rounds into n n is the let's say it fast pointer takes n different rounds plus b again right am i clear so now this is the equation that we have let's just try to solve this particular equation and see what what, what are the results that we are getting right so it will be 2a plus uh it will be 2m b plus c plus 2b is equal to a plus n into b plus c plus b right so if at all i solve this i will get this a is cut with a b is cut with b i'll get something like a plus b is equal to n minus m times b plus c n minus 2m times b plus c so this is uh, again a constant because let's say a takes n number of rounds b takes m number of rounds so this overall terms comes out to be a constant so let's say a plus b will be equal to lambda times b plus c this is the relation we have let's try for different values of lambda lambda equal to 1 and lambda equal to 2 right now let's say i have lambda equal to 1 so what will be the case if lambda is equal to 1 so this becomes a plus b is equal to b plus c that means a is equal to c so what were a and c we had something like this we had a point k this was a this is b and this is c right right i hope this is fine so now a is equal coming equal to c that means this distance is equal to this distance is what i was saying but you will say sir you have taken lambda equal to one now let's say i take lambda equal to two what will happen it will become something like a plus b is equal to two times b plus c is it it will become a equals to b plus c plus c so this b plus c is the repetition right b plus c is the circle repetition so no matter how many times the circle repeats from here to here so this will again be of no value matlab circle to kitni bar bhi wo kar sakta na well it can do infinite number of times so i'll neglect the circle also right because at the end goal yahan se yahan tak he has to reach yahan se yahan tak he has to reach so this a will become equal to c ultimately so a will be equal to c in any case right so this is what we have proved let's just dig into the code part and then we'll move on to how we are coding this one basically kar kya rahe detect cycle right what we were we will be given will be given list node star head and have a cycle detect karna right so the first thing that i did was i took a slow pointer equals to head i took a fast pointer equals to head then i uh, took a uh, what i say while loop while this fast is not equal to null and fast ka next is not equal to null what i do is i move the slow by one step ahead slow is equal to slow ka next and fast equals to fast k next ka next right at any point if slow 
बिकम्स इक्वल इक्वल टू फास्ट मतलब दैट मीन्स कि दे आर मीटिंग एट सम पॉइंट सो वॉट वी डिट इन दैट केस वी रिटर्न द ट्रू मतलब दैट मीन्स साइकिल एग्जिस्ट इन माई लिंक लिस्ट एल्स वेन वी कम आउट ऑफ दिस लूप आई एल रिटर्न फॉल्स दैट मीन्स दर इज नो साइकिल इन द लिंक लिस्ट लिंक लिस्ट में कोई साइकिल नहीं है राइट हाउ विल डिटेक्ट द फर्स्ट नोड वेयर बोथ ऑफ लाइक वेयर द लूप स्टार्ट डिटेक्ट द फर्स्ट नोड वेयर द लूप स्टार्ट नाउ यू हैव द प्रूफ राइट प्रूफ ऑफ वेयर द लूप स्टार्ट इज लाइफ दिस इज द केस दिस इज सम पॉइंट बी दिस इज सम पॉइंट ए सॉरी दिस इज द डिस्टेंस ए दिस इज द डिस्टेंस बी दिस इज द डिस्टेंस सी राइट सो नाउ you know that once you get this point that is the midpoint right in here in case of true let's say i return the original value instead of true i return slow and at the last i return null matlab the point i am returning ki yahan yahan pe uh, they both are meeting so now for detecting the first loop what i need is i need to have a pointer that starts from the start let's say i have one start pointer and i should have a pointer from this mid that is the mid pointer matlab how i can get this mid i will simply pass my head to this function that we have made above so i have start i have mid now i'll move both start and mid by one one point and the point where start becomes equal equal to mid is the point that is the starting of the loop right now let's just try to code matlab this is something that i believe you would have understood if you still have doubts make sure you watch this video again it will clear a lot of your doubts now this is the problem that is there in front of us linkless cycle so you'll have to tell you'll have to return ki whether this linkless contains the cycle or not so the first step that we did was list node star uh, slow pointer it's pointing to head list node star fast pointer it is also pointing to head right so these two things we have while fast is not equal to null and fast ka next is not equal to null now i have two things what i will do is i'll move slow equals to slow ka next and fast equals to fast ke next ka next right now if at any point slow becomes equal equal to fast what i will do is i will return true once i come out of this loop i'll return false so this was the basic code behind this particular linked list function similarly we can implement a little bit of change in the second part that we discussed and we can submit this problem we are returning a true so this contains a cycle yes that's true so that was it for this particular video let's move upon to another problem uh right so the next question that we are going to discuss in the series of linked list is to remove um linked list elements right so you'll have to remove linked list elements what i mean to say by this is let's say you have this kind of a linked list in which the nodes are connected 1 3 6 2 6 4 8 and null right let's say you have this linked list and you are given a value let's say 6 you need to remove 6 from this linked list entirely and you need to have a resultant linked list of this form your output that is expected should be of the sort of 1 3 2 4 eight and null so this is the output that is expected right so you will have to remove this six you will have to remove this six so how can we do that maybe uh, we can uh, directly connect this particular node to this particular node that's one thing we can connect this particular node to this particular node so we need to move to a node that is behind that particular node right so after removing this node what will have is one is connected to 3 then 3 uh, 6 is removed 3 is connected to 2 2 uh, now 6 is removed 2 is connected to 4 4 is connected to 8 and null so we get something of this particular sort 
right so uh, how we can change or how we can uh, do this maybe there can be some more cases let's say if uh, uh, six is present at the first place right like the link list is something like six three six two six four eight and null so what you will do in this case you don't have anything behind this so it will again be a problem should we handle this case separately or rather than handling the case separately what we uh, generally prefer to do in questions related to linked list is we create something known as a dummy node right so how this dummy node will help we'll try to see it uh, in this particular question right so let's say i create a dummy node i create a dummy node this is dummy node d uh, let's say its value is minus 1 dummy node with a value minus 1 right and i connect it with the head so it will be 2 minus 1 6 3 6 2 6 4 8 and null right i create this dummy node and i uh, uh, attach it with my head right so now what i will be doing is i will be i need to ignore this or i need to remove this what can be done in this case is I'll directly connect the next value of this to uh, 3. I'll directly connect the next value of this to 2. I'll directly connect the next value of this to 4. Right. So this is what I'm currently looking forward to uh, do in this particular question. So uh, this is the same question that is available on uh, lead code. Let's just go to the question uh, and uh, see uh, what is the possibility, right? So the question states that you need to remove link. It's, it's an easy marked problem. Uh, similar to what we have discussed, they have given an example. You need to remove uh, six from the linked list, right? So you are given uh, this function. You are given the head of the linked list. You are given the value that you need to remove. So the first thing that we did in this particular question is to check the base case. If at all, let's say the head is equal equal to null. So what we'll do is we'll simply return null, right? This is uh, one thing. After that, uh, uh, the second thing is we created a new dummy node list list node star dummy is equal to new list node and we initialize it with minus one right so we have created this dummy node and we connect this dummy node to the dummy nodes next to the head of our original linked list that is dummy ka next is equal to head of my original linked list so our normal linked list has a new node that is dummy and it is attached at the front of my linked list right i also create a new node by the name of list node star tail right and it i initialize this tail to dummy so now i'll iterate over this link list using this tail pointer i'll move tail one step ahead every time and we'll continue this loop until we traverse the entire link list so while tail is not equal to null and tail ka next is not equal to null right so this is the uh, format that like for used for traversing because we'll traverse until and unless this tail is not equal to null or tail ka next is not equal to null what we'll check is if tails next key value is equal equal to the given value if this becomes equal to six let's say in this case so what are the steps that we are going to do we'll create a new node list node star temp to store the address of tail ka next then what we'll do is we'll uh, change tail ka next to tail ke next ka next tail ke next ka next what what does this means right so tail ke next ka next means ki uh, this let's say if i have tail ke next ki value is equal equal to 6 so tail let's say this two it comes upon to 2 so 2 k next that is 6 key value is equal equal to value yes this is true so what i will do is i'll create a temporary variable temp which will store the value of tail connects it will store the value of this temp right and what i will do is tail k next may i'll put tail k next connects so this is what i'm going to put this is the connection that i'm going to make between 2 and 3 right 
so this is the case and after that what i will do is i'll explicitly delete because they have been created dynamically so i'll delete temp and that's it i guess i'll create an else case if if the value doesn't matches what we'll do we'll simply move tail is equal to tail connects bus this is what is expected out of this particular question and at the end what we are going to return is we are going to return dummy connects right because uh, our head starts from after dummy na dummy is the node that we provided so this is the case this is the question that we have done right so we are getting the correct answer let me just try and submit so we'll be able to submit this problem and i hope this is clear also there's one more solution to this we can do this using recursion as well recursion can help us solve this problem in a much uh, i would say in a cleaner fashion not if not uh, uh, help us in reducing the complexity or so but it will help us in solving it in a cleaner manner right so what what exactly i i am looking forward to if i if i'm saying recursion uh, is let's say what what i am saying so now let's say we have again we again have this linked list one uh let's say i have six i have three two six null again right so what i will do is what happens in recursion we solve a smaller problem we break the problem and we smaller smaller part and we want recursion to solve a bigger part right so we'll break the problem from here now this part of the problem will be solved by recursion and i will do a small part i'll check for this particular node whether this is equal to value or not if it is equal equal to value then i'll simply return this uh, what i have got from recursion else i'll add this head and i'll return right so what the code will generally look like uh, the base condition will be same so first thing is i will recursively call and i'll pass head ka next along with value so this i believe will give me this as the answer 3 2 and null so this is the answer that i'll get from recursion and then i'll put a check on my head if the value of head is equal equal to value that means if it is equal equal to 6 then what i will do then i'll simply return this else what i will do is i'll attach head ka next and head ka next equal to the recursive answer and i'll return this head so this is the question this is the approach that can be followed if you are keen on using recursion here let me just clean this code and see this this uh upper line will be the same if head is equal equal to null we need to return null in this case also so this serves as the base case for this particular question right and uh, yeah so uh, what i would uh, be doing is i will create head ka next is equal to i'll recursively call remove elements i'll pass head ka next and i will pass this value so now i have a linked list in which head is not checked but rest of the linked list is checked whether it contains the same element or value element with the same value or not right now i'll uh, need to check with my head if at all head ka value is equal equal to my original value then what i will do is i'll create a list node star answer is equal to head ka next right and i will delete this head explicitly maybe i'll return the answer right in this case if the value is equal equal to same so i'll simply return head ka next this step i am doing just because i need to explicitly delete we can uh, skip this step also it will not create much difference but uh, we should be completely correct else we'll simply return head this is the case let me just try and submit this as well yeah so this is also getting submitted i hope this is clear to you now now let's see how we can uh, solve the next problem so now let's read another question in this question they are asking us to design browser history 
right how our browser history is made and how it is uh, used in a particular browser let's say in google chrome right so what they want us to do is you have a browser of one tab where you start on the home page and you can visit another url get back in the history number of page number of steps or move forward in the history number of steps uh, implement the browser history class right we need to implement the browser history class so browser history class initializes the object with the home page of the browser correct visit url from the current page it clears up all the forward history back move steps back in the history if you can only return x steps in the history and if steps are greater than x then you will return only x steps you return the current url after moving back in the history and similarly you'll have to create string forward so what they're trying to say in this particular question is i'll try to make this a uh, statement pretty simple for you right so what they want us to do in this particular question is they want us to design browser history right browser history is how our browser actually work let's say you all might have used google chrome or you might have used mozilla firefox right so let's say we are on first site let's say i have opened my linkedin then from my linkedin i move on to another site that is lead code I fill, type in the URL of lead code and I land it on lead, uh, lead code. Then from lead code, let's say I want to go to interview bit. And from interview bit, let's say I want to go to Instagram. So these are the four sites that I'm visiting from my browser. First, I was on LinkedIn. I typed the URL lead code. I was on lead code. I typed the URL interview bit. I was on interview bit. I typed the uh, uh, URL Instagram. I am on Instagram. Now using the back functionality, there's a back button on our browser. Using the back button, I can move from Instagram to interview bit. I can move from interview bit to lead code. I can move from lead code to LinkedIn, right? Again, let's say I, I'm, I'm uh, like, I haven't like, again, I want to move to lead code. So again, I'll do the next, I'll move a step forward and I'll go to uh, lead code. Now let's say I am on lead code and in between there, I felt that there's a very important mail that I have got. So I want to go from lead code to Gmail, right? I will, I want to go from lead code to Gmail and I'll put the URL of Gmail on the same lead code page. Then I'll move on to Gmail. And now once Gmail is opened, this entire history is lost. This is lost. Now I have this chain found. Uh, the new chain that is formed is LinkedIn. Lead code. And Gmail. Right, so this is the new chain formed. So how can we implement this functionality particularly in our code? So this is what they want to want us to uh, implement. Firstly, like once we open any browser page, once we open LinkedIn, we need to initialize that page. Initialize that page, first thing. Secondly, we want to move from one site to another. Let's say I want to move from lead code to Gmail. So this entire thing is to be deleted. That is after lead code. So a uh, visit function I need to create. Third function that I need to create is back function. If I want to move from interview bit to lead code or lead code to LinkedIn. Fourth thing is forward function. If I want to move from LinkedIn to lead code or lead code to interview bit or interview bit to Instagram. So this is the functionality that I need to implement. And as you can see, we are going backward and forth at the same time right we are moving ahead also we are moving back also so what which data structure provides us this functionality isn't it a doubly linked list doubly linked list of this form only now we can move back also we can move front also it has two pointers previous and next previous and next previous and next for each node right it is of this particular format it's of this particular format so i will create a doubly linked list Right. So using this doubly linked list, what I will be doing is I will be 
uh, implementing this functionality right so i'll i'll quickly take you to the code but before that i was just want to remind you one thing like we have already discussed stl right in stl how we used to uh, write a doubly linked list we used to write it by the name of list and here the type of list like what type of uh, elements i want to insert in that list so i'll create list using stl and we will try to solve this problem right so now this is the problem that i have in hand so i i need to first uh, these are the four functions that i need to implement first is browser history i have been given a home page i just need to open that home page that is i want to start right and next i need to visit a particular url and remove all the urls or all the pages that are in front of that i if i want to move from one node to the previous node or if i want to move from first node to the like forward button and backward button that i need to implement right so the first thing is i'll create a list and the type of list will be string because we have will be passing urls so list string what is the name of this list let me name it as browser page right i'll also create an iterator that will iterate that will help us iterate over these pages so how how we generally create an iterator list of string let's say um, it iterator it so this is how we have uh, initialized our iterator now the first page is browser history so this is the first page and they have given us this home page now i simply need to push this home page in my browser page right so for this what i will do is browser page dot push back home page uh right and i will make my iterator point to home page dot begin right so uh, this is sorry it's not home page it's browser page sorry home page is so something that we have added it will be browser page dot begin right so this this is done i guess like we just need to push that particular home page in our browser page that's it now if i need to visit a new url from the middle right what i will do is i'll uh, delete all the nodes which are from which are next to that particular url where we are currently are right so how to find where we are currently are we'll find it using the iterator because that iterator will point to the current page right so let me just name it as auto uh current is equal to it so this will give me the current uh page iterator what i will do is i will increase this iterator sorry current plus plus right after that what i will do is from this browser page i will erase all the elements starting from this current to browser page dot end right after this is done now the new url that i have i want to visit that simply i'll push back in my browser page b r o w s e r page dot push back and i will what i will push back is url and i will do it plus plus so this is the visit function we have created now back function if i want to go to the previous pages using the back function back functionality right so what i will do is uh, and they have given us how many steps you need to move back so until these steps are decreasing we'll simply use a while loop while steps minus minus what i can do is i will do it minus minus that is my iterator is pointing one step uh, below behind and i'll simply return star it that means i am returning that particular string right but uh, i think this is not sufficient like at a certain point we need to stop right when we are at the first page because after before after uh, before the first page there is null after the last page there is again null so we need to stop at some point so for that stopping condition i need to put one more condition and uh, it 
is not equal to browser page dot begin right so this is the back functionality implemented so what we'll be doing in front functionality is the code is going to be almost similar just we need to move it forward so i'll do uh, steps minus until uh, sorry uh, steps are decreasing matlab how many steps we need to move forward right until this it dot end is equal equal to browser page dot begin ki jagah pe end aa jayega right and matlab this end will be browser page dot end matlab this is the internal functionality this will give us the page which is after the end browser page so we need to be at a position which is matlab which is the last browser page so last browser page i'll get it by using minus minus of uh end browser page dot end right simply here also we'll return uh and here we are increasing rather than decreasing i'll return i uh, star it and this is it i hope this is clear now let me just uh, take you through how we have implemented this okay so now if you see so we have been given this browser history function to be completed and we are given this home page so what we are simply doing is inside this list initially which is empty which is null i am adding this first home page and i am pointing my iterator to the uh, starting of this particular browser history oh sorry browser page link list right then they have given us a function to complete that is visit and inside this they are given a url so let's say i am uh, here first page that i've opened is lead code then it's interview bit now from interview bit i want to go to gmail interview bit se pehle i have opened already uh, uh facebook right now from i moved back to interview bit now i want to move to uh, gmail so for this what i will do is i'll firstly point uh, take my current pointer that is it this will be pointing to the current i'll increase the current pointer then i'll erase all the uh, pages which are after interview bit like facebook and all this these will be deleted and then i'll push back my new url that is gmail so it will be come like lead code interview bit and gmail then I'll again increase the iterator and in this way this function is complete next while moving back uh, matlab these many steps we need to move back steps minus minus and until and unless it is not equal to browser page dot begin we'll keep decreasing this it and we'll return star it last function similar to what we have done in the previous function we are uh, increasing we are moving ahead we are moving in the forward direction so we are moving in the forward direction again we are increasing the iterator in this case iterator plus plus and we are returning star it so i hope this is clear to you uh, try implementing this particular problem yourself you will understand a lot of things and this is matlab this these kind of questions can also be asked in the interview from application point of view right so the next question that we are going to discuss is basically lru cache so lru cache it's a very very important question from the point of view of uh, interviews like this is the mostly asked interview question of amazon if you haven't heard of uh, this question so make sure you watch this uh, very very seriously we'll try to demystify what this problem they're trying to say and uh, then we'll go ahead with the solution part right so what they're trying to say is you they are trying uh, they're saying that you need to design a data structure that follows the constraints of a least recently used cache so what is cache so we'll we'll discuss about this as well what we are actually uh, what they actually want us to do is they want us to implement the lru cache class and lru cache initialize the lru cache with positive size capacity then int get that will return the value of the key if the key exists otherwise return minus 1 update the value of the key if the key exists otherwise add key value pair to the cache if the number of keys exceeds the capacity from this operation evict the least recently used key right so this is uh, this is the question let me just try to explain you what they are trying to say right so what is a cache right it's a form of a memory right where we store some data databases right uh, consider a situation you have a large database right there are a lot of users thousands and lakhs and millions of users so from those users if at any point you want to search something so there are million users 
if you want to search something from those million users so it will take time right it won't be that efficient matlab how much efficient uh, sorting algorithm you use but it will take some time to search from those million or billion of entries right so instead of th- that database there is a special memory known as cache memory that is uh, maintained and that contains the elements which are most recently used the uh, the elements which we are free, we are using frequently right so they are stored in the cache and it's a smaller memory matlab smaller space and searching inside a smaller space becomes easy searching inside a smaller space becomes easier so this is matlab very very layman terms explanation of what is a cache if you are not aware of when you will uh, understand operating systems as a subject maybe you will uh, or databases as a subject so you will understand uh, this concept in a more clear and precise way now coming upon to our uh, question right so what we are trying to say is we are try we, they have told us to implement least recently used uh, cache algorithm right so uh, least recently used cache algorithm so what uh, actually uh, the question says is question says that let's say we have database it has they have given two functions int get and int put right so from this get function what they want is they want ki you should search a database and return the value corresponding to the key matlab they will give a key here and they want us to return a value corresponding to this key so this is the function for that and there's a put function which has key and value as arguments so this key and value arguments we if we want to add a new entry to our database right so let's just look at the function how it looks like so yeah so this is the function that they have given us to complete uh, this is lru cache with int capacity as one of the arguments they want us to complete two functions int get and void put right so a uh, first thing is let's say if we don't consider anything very very simple approach let's say we can set create a map we all know how to create a map of uh, let's say both in teachers i name it as m to get a function what i will uh, do uh, is i'll search if m dot find this key is equal equal to m of n now if this key is not there at all so what i will do is i'll simply return minus 1 this is given in the question else what i will do is else i'll return the value that is corresponding to that key simple right and what will be there in the put i'll uh, in this uh, m uh, map i'll put the value corresponding to the key as value and it's done so this is this is something very very simple right but here we haven't taken care of a lot of things so let's come on to that so for solving this particular problem i will be using uh the most free, uh efficient data structure that can help us solve this problem is a doubly linked list right so doubly linked list it's something of this form right you have a node going here you have a node going here with previous and next pointers previous and next pointers previous and next pointers let's say this is pointing to null this is pointing to null now this is the database right so once any new entry that comes up we'll we try to add here right so this like in this complete database this is the most recently used data this is the m most recently used right and the uh, and the data that goes on to the last this is the least recently used data now as soon as we perform any operation be it get or be it put right as soon as i perform a get function or a get operation and a put operation 
what i will see is as soon as i perform a get operation like uh, i want this particular uh, the value corresponding to this particular uh, data right so this particular data becomes my most recently used data so this should shift to here so this will become the most recently used so removing this from here i will connect this to this and i'll connect this to this directly and the data which is not used for quite long time it will automatically reach the end it will automatically go on to the end and if at all we put some data so if we want to add some data what we'll do is we'll check for the database if it already exists what we'll do we'll erase that data and we'll create a new data and add it in the front that is this will be the most recently used so this is something that we are trying to achieve and they have given us a capacity right so uh, we'll work according to this particular capacity so let me just try to code in and try to explain you what we are actually going to do right so we have already created this map so let's uh, go ahead with this i'll create a list list of integers list l i'll create a integer capacity capex i'll create an integer size s i z so capacity and size is capacity is the maximum available database matlab the maximum available storage capacity and size is how much is that how much is it filled at that particular moment right so this lr you guys basically i need to initialize this so my capac will be equal to capacity and my size initially will be equal to 0 because there is nothing in the database right now uh, going ahead now if i want to get something from the uh, from the database if i want to get something from the database first thing is uh, if if i'll check i'll make a check if database doesn't exist matlab that particular key doesn't exist i'll simply return minus 1 so this holds valid here also but along with that matlab i can't simply return uh, the key here what i need to do is i am performing a get operation as soon as i am performing a get operation that particular key becomes my most recently used character so to make that key to the most recently used character i need to uh, know ki what which uh, which which node is corresponding to this particular key so to get which node is corresponding to this particular key i'll have to traverse the linked list till this key so that i can get the address of that particular uh, linked list uh, let's say if this is the linked list right if i want to remove this particular want to get the address corresponding to this key the key that is present here right so uh, as per my as per our understanding we need to remove this from here and we need to move it here so to do that i will need the address of this how we can get the address of a particular node whose key value we know maybe we can uh, create one more map and inside that map what we can store is we can store key value pairs matlab key and along with their addresses like what is the address of this so that i can simply uh, attach this node here matlab it will be easier for me to attach this node here so i'll create another map so this is this was map of intended this will be map of int and how do we store addresses we store addresses in the form of pointers right but we have already been using iterators iterator points to that particular memory address so we'll be using iterator here as well iterator of the form list of integers and it will be iterator it iterator right and let me just name it as address right so we have created another map from where we can get the corresponding address to a particular a key value right so that we can simply erase that value we can remove that value we can delete that value from its current position and we can put it in the front that is it becomes the most recently used uh, thing right now we have done till here now next step would be Uh, I'll calculate the iterator that is corresponding to this key. So to calculate that, I'll do list of integers and uh, what I what uh, what I was uh, what I was to do uh, iterator it is equal to address of this key. 
right so this will be the address that is corresponding to this particular iterator so this iterator is corresponding to this particular key so next is i will erase from erase this entry from my already present linked list so i'll erase this key next i will erase this key from the address uh, map also so address dot erase i'll erase this key so for removing from link linked list i need to provide the iterator to that particular point rather than providing the key and also where we need to put it again we need to put it in the front because that becomes the most recently used so i'll what i will do is i'll do push front push front key right after this what is to be done now new position of address is to be assigned to this key so new position of address will be address of key equals to uh, l dot start Nee, l dot begin right so we'll return m ka key this these steps basically were used to move this key, remove this from remove this uh, key from here and add it here right so this is probably our corresponding get function now we'll try to see how put function works what we actually do in put function is we try to create this new key value pair like firstly we'll check we'll check through this entire list if this key value pair is already present if it is already present if it is already present then i'll erase that then i'll erase that and i'll add new if it is not present then i'll add new it and will add it in the front matlab it will again be in l dot begin so how we can do that <coughs> so the first thing that is very important that we will we will be doing here is firstly checking whether that particular key value pair is already present or not so i will do that if m dot find key is not equal to m dot end right so what i will do is like if we find that particular element we'll erase l dot erase address corresponding to this key basically the iterator you can say right next is from that address block also i'll erase this key also from the map will remove this right because we are trying to will make it one more will make it new so m dot erase key and i will reduce the value of size by 1 because we are removing something ठीक है जी आई होप दिस इज क्लियर एंड इन द अपर केस वाई वी डेंट यू डू साइज प्लस वर्स बिकॉज वी आर नॉट रिमूविंग एनी थिंग वी आर जस्ट रिमूविंग इट फ्रॉम वन साइड एंड वी आर एडिंग इट इन द फ्रंट सो साइज रिमेन्स द सेम राइट नाउ हेयर वी हैव डिक्रीज द साइज आफ्टर दैट वॉट वी आर गोइंग टू डू इज वी वॉन्ट टू एड दैट की वैल्यू पेयर इन द फ्रंट पोजिशन राइट सो टू एड दैट की वैल्यू पेयर इन द फ्रंट पोजिशन वॉट आई विल डू इज एल डॉट पुश फ्रंट key right i'll also add it in the address of key is equal to l dot begin matlab because it's the front element of that list along with that m of key is equal to value right so this is something that we uh, have uh, already done now also uh, the size will increase because we are adding a new entry in the front so size will be increased there is still one problem let's say if size becomes equal equal to capacity then what we should do if let's say this is the linked list this is the linked list this is the most recently used this is the least recently used and there is a new entry there is a new key value pair that you want to add into this particular list or this database or this cache so what you will do will you remove this most recently used or this least recently used so we'll remove this least recently used matlab in that particular database we'll remove the last entry how when will this condition arrive this condition will arrive whenever the size is equal equal to 
capacity right so let me just try to code this as well so what we will do is if size is equal equal to capacity what we'll do is uh, we'll take the uh, the last element of this list that is let me store it in k l dot back right then i'll remove that back element l dot pop back then uh, from address also will erase address uh, map also will erase address dot erase k from that m map also will erase m dot erase k and size minus minus so if at all size becomes equal equal to capacity and we still want to add something so we'll erase the we'll remove the least recently used uh, scenario right let me just try and erase this and then we'll see ki what have, what is left now i hope this thing is clear right for most of you this thing is clear right so what we are actually trying to do till here is let us just revisit the code and try to see if you have understood or not right so we were to create a so we were to implement lru cache so you understood what is L, uh, cache and what is lru so now what we say that we create a list list that is in the form of a doubly linked list so stl for doubly linked list is L, uh, sorry list right so this will point to null this will point to null so we have lr matlab we have we, we try to implement in this particular fashion right where cap capex uh, den denotes the capacity that means what can be the capacity of my database size denotes the current number of objects matlab how many we have already added this is the function where we initialize capacity and size matlab initially the capacity is equal to the given capacity size is equal to 0 because we haven't added anything then there are two functions int get and void put so what does this int get function means this function says that i will give a particular key and you return the value corresponding to that key but once we operate on any key value pair so let's say this key matlab our functions call for this key ki once this key is called you need to return the value corresponding to this key but we are using this key right so this will remove from here and we will be adding it here because now this becomes the most recently used matlab abhi abhi we have used now only we have used so we need to remove this from here we need to make this connection as this we need to make this connection as this right and this will be added in the front yahan pe we'll add this node so this becomes the most recently used so this is only what we have done so the first thing is first step is we try to find that if that number is uh not present in the list then we'll simply return minus 1 else what we'll do is we create an iterator now what we have created the second thing is we have created a new map because to get to this particular uh, node right matlab how i will reach this particular node i know the key right but i don't know the address of this node so that i can remove it or i can move this to this this to this so maybe first thing is i i need to iterate matlab i need to uh, traverse over this linked list from zeroth position to this position and then get some answer or get some query but that will be a tier some uh, tier some process instead of that i've created a map where i've stored the integers and their corresponding addresses in uh, in the form of iterators now i have this so i have created this particular iterator and from this particular map i am getting the value of the address corresponding to this key right now what i will do is i'll try to erase the matlab if this this is already available so now we need to erase it so i'll erase it from this list also i'll erase it from this ad, uh, address map and i will put it in the front l dot push front is equal to key i'll put it in the front right then address of key may i'll matlab address of key also change na if i put it here so what will be its new address its new address will be corresponding to the address that is l dot begin and i will return the value corresponding to it i hope now it is a little more better right cool 
so the next thing is a put right so put functions tells us to add a new key value pair so if i want to add a new key value pair like this is the current structure that we have this is the current structure that we have and they tell us to add a new key value pair so where we'll add the key, a new key value pair we'll add it in the front for sure right but before that before doing this i will check whether this key value pair is already present or not if at all this key value pair is present so i will erase that key value pair right and then only i will add this so this particular thing we are doing it for finding and erasing that particular uh, key value pair from my already available database if at all this does not work well the, this erases that particular key value pair from my already available linked list and after that i try to push my uh, key value pair in the front and uh, address corresponding to begin is mentioned and we uh, assign that key value the correct pair right but still one problem is there if at all the size becomes equal equal to capacity if at all the size becomes equal equal to capacity then what i am going to do is from this linked list this is the most recently used i know this is the most recently used and this is the least recently use so which one i should remove should i remove the most recently used or should i remove the least recently used obviously this is something that we are not using from quite some time so i will be removing this so here also what i have taken is i have taken the last element i have removed that last element erase that from the address and size i have decreased so this is what is being done right i hope uh, things are clear to you now so what i want you to do is try to dry run this particular question because some of you might face difficulties in understanding it for the very first time if you're doing it for the very first time right make sure you try to dry run it on your own on a piece of paper right after that try to submit your code on platform and try to analyze what is its time complexity and space complexity you can do comment the time complexity and space complexity if you are doing this question uh, on your own i'll try to reply to all the comments that you do on this video right now i hope this question is clear if you still have doubts make sure you ping your doubts in the comment section i'll be more than happy to take from it uh, take it from there right so moving on to the next question so the next question that we're going to discuss is basically a palindrome linked list so you might have heard this term before also what is a palindrome number right uh, palindrome number is such that let's say we have 1 1 2 one, 1 right you read it from the front you read it from the back it is one and the same thing right 1 2 3 2 1 it is also a palindrome number and you might have also done this question in the in arrays or vectors right you are given an array and you need to check whether this is a palindrome array or not let's say if an array has these numbers 1 2 3 4 3 2 1 so this is a palindromic array right so you need to check and return whether it's true or false that means the array is palindrome or not right so you have done this in arrays how we do it in arrays we use two pointers approach we take a pointer a left pointer here we take a right pointer here and we start comparing left and right as soon as any of them mismatches we return false else we return true so this is a very very efficient and a good approach but now the case is not like that we are given a linked list right we are given a linked list of this particular form let's say 1 2 3 2 1 null so this is the linked list that is given to us and we need to return whether this linked list is palindromic or not right so how can this be done the first way that comes to your mind may be let's say i convert this linked list in the form of arrays or vectors arrays 
और वेक्टर्स एंड आई यूज टू पॉइंटर अप्रोच बट इन दिस केस देर विल बी अ लॉट ऑफ स्पेस कॉम्प्लेक्सिटी इन्वॉल्व अगैन सो विल अवॉइड दिस विल नॉट यूज द स्पेस कॉम्प्लेक्सिटी वाली चीज इन स्टेड देर इज समथिंग एल्स लाइक वॉट कैन बी डन इज लेट से वी हैव दिस लिंक लिस्ट राइट वन टू थ्री फोर थ्री टू वन एंड नल लेट्स यू हैव दिस लिंक लिस्ट राइट सो वॉट वी कैन डू इज मे बी वी कैन डिवाइड द लिंक लिस्ट इन टू टू पार्ट्स दिस इज वन पार्ट एंड दिस इज अनदर पार्ट राइट और वी कैन हैव लाइक वी कैन डिवाइड द लिंक लिस्ट इन टू पार्ट्स एंड रिवर्स द सेकेंड पार्ट सो दिस बिकम समथिंग लाइक वन टू थ्री फोर इफ यू रिवर्स वन विल कम हेयर वन टू थ्री सो विल मेक अ पॉइंटर हेयर विल कीप अ पॉइंटर हेयर एंड विल स्टार्ट कंपेयरिंग वन इज इक्वल टू वन ट्रू टू इज इक्वल टू टू ट्रू थ्री इज इक्वल टू थ्री ट्रू सो this is uh, what i can say is a palindromic link list right this can be uh, one way so and let's say this is for the case when the number of elements are odd let's say we are doing it for when the number of elements are even right 1 2 3 4 टू वन राइट सो फॉर दिस विल डिवाइड इट फ्रॉम हेयर विल हैव इट लाइक दिस वन टू थ्री विल रिवर्स दिस लिस्ट विल गेट वन टू थ्री अगैन एंड देन विल कंपेयर बोथ ऑफ दीज टेक अ स्टार्ट पॉइंटर टेक अ मिड पॉइंटर विल मूव स्टार्ट पॉइंटर वन स्टेप मिड पॉइंटर बाय वन स्टेप एंड कंपेयर एट ईच पॉइंट एज सुन एज एनी ऑफ दीज मिस मैचेस what we'll do is we will return false else we'll return true right and make sure like if the uh, elements are odd then we need to return the middle uh, we need to find out the middle and then uh, uh, reverse the next linked list matlab an element prior to the middle we need to find right and similarly in even case also we need to find the first middle and the rest linked list is to be reversed right let's let's just move on to the code and see if we are able to code this particular problem then you will be able to understand it a little more better way right so let's say this is a problem right so this is a problem that is given to us we are given the head of a singly linked list we need to return true if it is palindrome or not right so this is the head that is given to us we need to check if it is palindrome so the first thing that we will be doing in this particular question is we'll be finding out the middle and then reversing the middle so how we fi found uh, generally find out the middle of a linked list using slow and fast pointers we move slow pointer by one step fast pointer by two step we have already done this question in in the previous uh, portion of this video right so what i will do is i will uh, initialize a list node star slow is equal to head list node star fast is equal to head right while fast connects is not equal to null and fast ke next ka next is not equal to null why i'm doing this because i want the first middle first middle element try to dry run this and you will get the answer of this why next fast connects is not equal to null and fast connects connects is not equal to null earlier we were doing fast while fast is not equal to null and fast connects is not equal to null now we are we have changed the condition because we want the first middle right slow will be equal to slow connects fast will be equal to fast ke next ka next 
right so both of these are done after that what we are trying to do is slow now we have got now the slow pointer carries the middle element and after slow matlab slow ka next we need to reverse so how we reverse a linked list we have already written the code for reverse a linked list i'll just copy paste the same reverse the uh, linked list code and i'll uh, use it in this particular problem right so what i can do is i can simply say slow ke next me what you can put is reverse list starting from slow ka next right reverse list true so now we have half linked list as uh, straight and half linked list as reverse right now what we need to do is we need to compare how we'll be comparing these two uh, linked list is we'll have two pointers one is again a slow uh, a start pointer one is again a mid pointer and we'll compare both of them how we can compare both of them is uh, let's say i take a new node list node star start is equal to head list node star mid is equal to slow ka next right while mid is not equal to null what i will do is if mid value is not equal to start value will return false right at any point if this doesn't happen will return false and we'll move start equals to start ka next and mid equals to mid ka next right and we'll simply return true after that the after moving coming out of the linked list will remove uh, return true that means the linked list is a palindromic linked list right try to submit yeah so we have successfully this is has been successfully implemented right so what we are doing in this particular question is uh, i hope you can understand it now with the help of code as well so let's say we have this now it is better 1 2 3 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 23 24 25 26 27 28 29 30 31 32 33 34 35 36 37 38 39 40 41 42 43 44 45 46 47 48 49 50 51 52 53 54 55 56 57 58 59 60 61 62 63 64 65 66 67 68 69 70 71 72 73 so what we did here is we took a slow pointer we took a fast pointer both keeping here fast pointer and we tried to move fast fast when it in a while loop until fast ka next is not equal to null and fast ke next ka next is not equal to null so that as soon as my slow reaches here i get the mid of my linked list now what i have done is in slow ka next matlab after this i am attaching reverse list slow ka next matlab this entire list is what i am passing out out in the reverse function and this list becomes something like this this becomes my new list now this becomes my new list it is 1 2 3 1 2 3 and null this becomes my new list now what i did was i made a start pointer that was pointing to head i made a mid pointer that was pointing to slow ka next that is this now i start comparing mid ki value with start ki value this value is being compared with this yes if at any point they don't match matlab this is not matching this this is not matching this this is not matching this i'll return false and i'll keep on moving else matlab if this comes out from this loop will return true so this is how we check whether a linked list is palindrome or not i hope this question is also clear it's also one of the important questions you can say from the point of view of linked list so make sure you do it on your own once uh, and uh, let me know if you have any confusions any doubts please uh, type it down in the chat box uh, in the comment section i'll be more than happy to take all your queries right so the next problem that we are going to see is basically intersection of two linked lists what we are given in this particular question is you are given the heads of two singly linked lists head a and head b you need to return the node at which the two lists intersect if the two lists linked lists have no intersection at all then we can return null For example, the following two linked lists begin uh, to intersect at node like we are given a one, a two, b one, b two, b three, c one, c two, c three. So we need to know the intersection point of both these linked lists. We have been given two linked lists with head A and head B, right? Let's just see how uh, ca what can be the approach. 
so the question in like the, the, the lead code example was a1 a2 c1 c2 c3 null here it was i guess b1 b2 b3 right so this was the problem that was given on lead code and they wanted us to know get the intersection of <clears throat> linked lists right so this is the intersection point and we need to return this know this right so what can be the first way what can be the brute force approach right uh, maybe uh, i'll pick i'll choose this one and i'll uh, traverse b link list b right i'll see i'll move from b1 to b2 and i'll match it with a1 whether it is matching or not i'll move from b1 b2 b3 c1 c2 c3 if at no point they, do, they don't meet at any point so we'll move to a2 then i'll check match with every node of uh, b whether it is matching or not if it is not matching we'll move to this now in this case if we'll traverse the link list b so the, they both will match hence we'll return true or we'll return this node but this will take the time complexity of o of m into n if m is the length of this <coughs> this linked list and n is the length of this linked list then o of m into n time complexity which is very very expensive right so we'll not prefer this instead what can be done is let's say there's a set uh, like uh, you know set data structure right set in stl we have seen so what we can do is for one linked list we traverse and put all the nodes in a set unordered set or map you can say and like a1 will be here a2 will be here a c1 will be here c2 will be here c3 will be here c uh, and so on now we'll start traversing linked list b and we'll see if b1 is already present in set or not b2 is present in set or not b3 is present in set or not c1 is present in set or not we have significantly improved upon our uh, complexity but again we are using an extra data structure that uh, can be a problem at any point so what can be a, a little more better approach let's discuss uh, once again like what is the solution a1 a2 c1 c2 c3 null in this case it is b1 b2 b3 right Th these are the two linked lists now now the next thing that i want to do is uh, yeah what i will do is i'll calculate the length of both length of a and length of b now length of a is 1 2 3 4 5 length of a is 5 length of b is 1 2 3 4 5 6 length of b is 6 now to make them both uh, move in a synchronized fashion what i will do is i'll uh, traverse the longer one well i'll take the difference of both the nodes one and i'll traverse the longer one by the difference right so i'll traverse it till here so this is the starting point now i'll move both of the uh, both of the linked list from here uh, they'll move they'll see if they're equal no if they are equal no at this point they meet each other so this synchronization can help us in uh, understanding that how we can improve the time complexity now this synchronization concept if we try to implement in one more way how can that be done right let's say i have this uh, link list again a1 a2 c1 c2 c3 and null here it is b1 b2 b3 and so right so let's say this is list 1 this is list 2 right i start from this list uh, a1 starts from this list it, it list 2 starts from this let me just consider this distance as hypothetical x this distance as hypothetical y this distance as hypothetical z right so total distance that list 1 covers is x plus y total distance that list 2 covers is z plus y right let's say i want them to cover the distance of both of these linked lists like list one covers first x plus y then it covers z plus y 
similarly list two covers uh, its own distance z plus y then it covers list one's distance that is x plus y so again these both distances become equal or they are in sync i can say as soon as they are in sync will traverse like uh, i'll traverse list one from a1 to a2 to c1 c2 c3 as soon as it reaches null i'll start traversing it from this side b1 b2 b3 c1 c2 c3 so what happens in this case is they both will be in sync at this point whether they both will meet at this point and we don't need to do anything this is the best possible solution that is available let's just try to dry run and see if this works right uh, let me just use an eraser okay so what i uh, tried to say was like a is here b is here right a moves to this b moves to this 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 now after this a moves to this and b moves to this a moves to this b moves to this now now they both are in sync again right they both are at the same place now b moves to this a moves to this b moves to this a moves to this now again both b and a are equal as soon as they are equal we got our point now this is something that we wanted to know in this particular question so this is the approach this is the best approach that you should give to the interviewer once like if this particular question is asked to you in an interview right so let's see how this code uh, works how we can code this particular approach so yeah so the first thing that uh, you should do is list node star let's say a is equal to head of a star b is equal to head of b so i have two nodes a and b i'll run a loop until a is not equal to b while a is not equal to b what i will do is the the point at which a equal equals to b so that means that is the intersection point right so we'll run this loop until and unless a is not equal to b so i'll see if at all a is equal equal to null a becomes null then a should point to head of b right we'll start traversing from b if a equal equals to null else a equals to a connects the a moves forward similar as the case with b what we'll do in case of b if b equals equals to null b equals to head of a else b equals to b connects right so as soon as they come out of this loop we can return a let me just try and run this code if this works okay uh, so there is a declaration problem let's just run this again yeah so both of them are intersecting at 8 so we have got the correct output and it has been accepted so what we are doing in this particular case is let me just explain it to you again so let's say we have this particular linked list 1 2 3 4 5 here i have 6 7 8 and this null so i need to tell at which point they intersect now this is list 1 this is list 2 right i make i make it point to as a this i make it point to as b now i check for if a is not equal to b if at all a is not equal to b so if a is not equal to b i'll see if a equal equal to null no a is not equal to null then i'll move a forward similarly i'll see if b equal equal to null no b is not equal to null i'll move b forward and we'll do this until both of them are at the same position a is here b goes here a is here b goes here a is here b goes here a is here now a now a becomes null so b go uh, b goes here as soon as a is equal equal to null we move it to 
B. Now it starts from head of B. So now A is here. B goes to null. A is here. B goes here. Now both A and B are in sync, right? So as soon as they are in sync, now again we'll start moving. B is here. A is here. Now B is here. A is here. B and A both match at this point. We'll simply return A, or we can say we return B. मतलब as soon as they become equal so they will move out of this while loop and will return the answer so this is what we are doing in this problem i hope you are amazed by the solution and uh, uh, if you have any doubts still to do comment in the comment box i'll be more than happy to take all your queries right now let's move on to the next problem so the next question that we are going to discuss is basically a partition list now let's read the problem first and see what they are trying to say given a head of the linked list and a value x partition it in such a way that all the nodes less than x comes before the nodes that are greater than or equal to x you should preserve the original relative order of the nodes in each of the two partitions this is this line is very very important so what they are trying to say is like this is the example given in which we have linked list with nodes as 1 4 3 2 5 and 2 and they have uh, given us the value of x as 3 matlab all the nodes which are less than 3 should come at the front and rest of the node should be after that so how will be doing that uh like what what exactly they want is like uh, the number given is 3 so 1 is less than 3 yes 1 is here 4 is not less than 3 will not take it 3 is not less than 3 will not take it 2 is less than 3 so 2 will is 2 is here 5 is not less than 3 2 is less than 3 then 2 is here so we have all the numbers which are less than 3 uh as the first elements and after that maintaining the relative order of the nodes like 4 3 and 5 we have 4 3 and 5 here so we need to solve this problem let's just discuss uh, the approach on how we can uh, think upon this particular problem and how we can come to the solution after that right so yeah so the question that we are going to discuss now is partition list so the question name is partition list what you are given in this particular problem is you are given let's say 1 3 5 7 1 me thoda sa let's take another example right let's take our example 7 5 9 1 2 3 4 right so x value that is given is 4 so for all the nodes which are less than 4 should come in the front and all the nodes which are greater than 4 should come at the end right so we'll start comparing the first node with 4 is it greater than or less than no it is not uh it is greater than right so it should come in the end wala node 7 should come here we'll compare 5 5 is also greater so 5 should come here next is 9 9 is also greater so 9 should come here 1 is smaller so 1 should come here 8 is greater so 8 should come here 3 is smaller so 3 should come here right so the our output should look something like this 1 3 7 5 9 and 8 and you can see this order is preserved like 7 ke baad we get 5 ke baad we get 9 ke baad we get 8 so this order is very very important we need to maintain this order only so this is a very very peculiar approach that we are going to solve uh, this question with let's say the same question i have 6 5 3 1 2 9 and null and i am given value of x is equal to 3 what i will do is i'll create a dummy node by the name of left i'll create a dummy node by the name of right right and i'll start comparing start traversing this linked list from the head pointer until head becomes null i'll compare this with the value of x if it is greater than the value of x i'll put it in my right list if it is greater than i'll put it in my right list if it is smaller than i'll put it in my left list one is smaller i'll put it in my left list two is smaller i'll put it in my left list nine is greater i'll put it in my right list now once i have the left 
and the right list i'll combine both of them right and here along with that we'll maintain a tail pointer that will move to the last pointer because we need this uh, at the end because once we need to join this along with this so this tail of left should join to uh, right tail of left ka next should be equal to the right because we need to combine both of them together and the tail of right should point to null so we need to do this at the end after uh, creating a left and the right list right so once we'll code it i think you will be able to understand it uh, better right so this is the problem statement that is given to us we are given the head node and we are given a value x so we'll be uh, this value of x decides ki the number of nodes should how many number of nodes should be present in the front so we'll create two list nodes let's node star left equals to new of list node let's say we uh, start it with minus 1 we create another node list node minus 1 again let me just name it as right and also we'll maintain their tail tail pointer so that we can easily connect both of them after we uh, make them list node star l tail list node star r tail initially l tail is pointing to left and r tail is pointing to right theek hai ji so l tail and r tail are done so i'll move while my head is not equal to null and i'll compare the values of x with the head ki values if head ki value is less than x then what i will do is i'll put that term in the left wali point left wali link list with the dummy pointer so l tail the next will become equals to head and l tail equals to l tail ka next but the l tail moves forward right what will come in the else part else if this is not the case r tail ka next will become equal to head and r tail equals to r tail ka next so both our l tail and r tail are made right and we'll be moving our head forward like we'll traverse the entire link list head is equal to head ka next right after this is done at the end what we need to do is r tail ka next should be equal to null because r tail is the second list second list ka next is equal to null and l tail ka next should be equal to the right pointer matlab jo dummy pointer hai uska next right at the end what will return is left ka next why left ka next because left is containing a dummy pointer we don't need to return that dummy pointer of minus 1 dummy pointer ke aage wala number is what we are going to return let me just try and run this program and see how it goes okay there is a spelling mistake yeah so we have successfully solved this problem and the the solution has been accepted also so this was it let me just uh, dry run through it once again so what they have given us they have given us this example 1 4 3 2 5 2 and null right and they have given the value of x as 3 what we are doing is we have created a left dummy node and we have created a right dummy node so i am moving it inside this while loop until or unless this head is e head is not equal to null like this is currently head and i keep on traversing this link list if head ki value is less than x matlab 1 is less than x right then what i'll do is i'll uh join it in front of my left tail and tail moves forward this is l tail now 4 4 is greater than 3 so if it is greater than 3 we'll move on to the else part 4 is joined here and this is r tail 
अगेन थ्री इज देयर थ्री मतलब इट शुड बी लेस देन थ्री स्ट्रिक्टली लेस देन थ्री सो इट विल कम इन द आर टेल आर टेल विल मूव हेयर टू टू विल कम इन द एल टेल एल टेल विल कम हेयर फाइव फाइव विल कम इन द आर टेल आर टेल विल कम हेयर टू टू विल कम इन द एल टेल एल टेल विल कम हेयर एंड इट रीचेज नल विल डू इट अंटिल एंड अनलेस हेड डज नॉट रीच हेड इक्वल इक्वल टू नल राइट सो नाउ वी हैव टू सेपरेट लिंक लिस्ट लेफ्ट एंड राइट वॉट आई नीड टू डू इज आई नीड टू मेक दिस एल टेल्स नेक्स्ट पॉइंट टू राइट का नेक्स्ट मतलब दिस शुड पॉइंट टू दिस दिस इज वॉट आई एम डूइंग हेयर एंड आर टेल का नेक्स्ट टू बी नल आर टेल का नेक्स्ट इज टू बी पॉइंटिंग टू नल सो माई लिंक लिस्ट विल फाइनली बिकम वन टू टू फोर थ्री फाइव एंड नल एंड दिस इज पॉइंटिंग टू लेफ्ट लेफ्ट डमी नोड सो एट द एंड वॉट आई विल रिटर्न लेफ्ट का नेक्स्ट मतलब आई विल स्टार्ट रिटर्निंग फ्रॉम दिस एंड दिस इज द आंसर दैट विल गेट राइट आई होप दिस इज क्लियर आई होप यू आर एबल टू सॉल्व दिस पर्टिकुलर प्रॉब्लम राइट नाउ मूविंग अ हेड देर इज समथिंग नोन एज सर्कुलर लिंक लिस्ट मतलब आई विल नॉट गो इन टू द डेप्थ ऑफ सर्कुलर लिस्ट लिंक लिस्ट दैट इज समथिंग दैट यू कैन एक्सप्लोर अपॉन देर आर सम प्रॉब्लम दैट कैन बी सॉल्व यूजिंग अ सर्कुलर लिंक लिस्ट बट इफ यू हैव अंडरस्टूड द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ सिंगली लिंक लिस्ट दिन सर्कुलर लिंक लिस्ट इज नॉट एट ऑफ टॉपिक इट्स कंप्लीटली ऑलमोस्ट सिमिलर जस्ट सम थिंग्स यू नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड जस्ट from basic point of view if i talk about what is a circular link list right what is a circular link list so our singly link list is something of this particular sort right we have nodes we have nodes this let's say data is 1 2 3 Four address of this is hundred. This is two hundred. This is three hundred. This is four hundred. This stores the address of next. It is two hundred. It is three hundred. It is four hundred, and it is null. This is my singly linked list. What happens in a doubly linked list? We have discussed doubly linked list as well. So doubly linked list में क्या होता है? Doubly linked list में the picture is something like this. Now you can visualize it something like this. this is pointing to null this is pointing to null they have two pointers previous and next previous and next let's say the address of this is 100 200 300 400 so this will store 200 here the address of the next this will store the address of the previous here and the address of the next here this will store the address of the previous here address of the next here this will store the address of the previous here address of the next here these are the datas 1 2 3 4 and this was something known as a doubly linked list now what is the difference between what is a circular linked list so it is sim similar to singly linked list so what happens in a circular linked list is we have one Two, three, four, five. This was singular linked list. So now instead of five pointing to null, if five points back to one, right? There's no option of null in a circular linked list. Like there's no node that is pointing to null in a circular linked list. Of like there is a head pointer that points to the start node. There is a tail pointer that points to the tail node, right? And tail every time tail tail ka next is equal to head so this is the condition for circular linked list right if you want to insert a new node in a circular linked list insert a new node in a circular linked list what you will do is what you will do you will store the address of the head you know already the uh, the address of the head you will make a new node let's say 6 you will make tail ka next point to 6 and 6 becomes the tail and tail ka next points to head again this is what you will be doing right if you want to insert a new node 
similarly you can perform all the operations that we have already done on different different types of linked list like uh, insertion deletion deletion searching so all these operations can be performed on circular linked list as well right i want you all to try circular linked list on your own ones if you feel like uh, uh, solving problems on circular linked list is uh, difficult do let me know in the comment section i will come up with a separate video for circular linked list as well right so uh, that was all uh, about linked list as a topic we have extensively covered a lot of topics and i believe you would have understood a lot of them right so from the point of view of understanding of linked list now i believe all these things are clear to you uh, we have started with representation of a linked list right we've started with the uh, which all topics we have covered in linked list so we have started with the uh, need for linked list advantage over arrays then we discussed about representation of a linked list like printing linked list we saw insertion deletion searching size of a linked list we found out the middle of the linked list we did some different problems on lead code on different other platforms we solved problems like cycle detection that was done using floyd warshall algorithm we did uh, problems related to palindrome number palindrome linked list we did problems related to lru cache we did problems related to uh, uh, different different other problems we also discussed a doubly linked list structure of doubly linked list uh, stl in linked list along with that some more topics we have discussed so this covers all your fundamental concepts of linked list now what i advise you to do is once you have watched this video till the end go to any of the sites be it interview bit be it lead code or any other site that you want and try practicing some random questions based upon linked list now i feel that you are ready for this topic and you can solve all the problems be it from easy category medium category or hard category so make sure you utilize your time well and practice more questions it's not just about viewing these videos it's more about practicing a lot of questions that is ultimately going to help us in the longer run so make sure you watch this video if some concepts are not clear do comment in the comment box if concepts are clear make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to this channel as well and uh, let me know which all more tutorials you are looking forward to in the series i'll come up with the complete tutorials on any of the topics that you are looking forward to uh, that you are facing problems in currently so this was all for this particular video i thank you all for keeping the patience and being till here till the end of this video this was amazing to teach all of you the concepts of linked list soon some more videos are going to be uploaded on this channel as well Uh, before getting on to the very first question, let's try to understand what is a data structure and what are the types available in the data structure and where we can use the data structure in the day-to-day -day life and uh, what is the usage of data, data structures in the current organizations okay? and what are the fields that our, our data structures has been implementing. Okay, So it's very important to understand the applications of any concept okay rather than just solving few problems it doesn't make sense if you don't know why to use data structure then what is the need of using data structures okay so then first we'll try to understand uh, how can we use data structure and what are the data structures available so the very first question here is what is a data structure so a data structure is a fundamental concept of any programming language essentially for algorithmic design okay it is used for efficient organization and modification of data 
so let me put it in a simple terms okay so a data structure is uh, represents okay data structure represents a way of organizing or a storing that data in the memory so that it will be easy for us to easy for us to manage data okay like manage in the sense uh, it will be some operations like uh, insert delete update okay kind of operations so that we generally do perform such operations on any data right so here what is the need okay so what does it make sense like so if i store okay like i will be having 10 files if i store them in my memory like what is the purpose like why we need data structures so it is going to store in any way right so okay if you are talking about 10 files in your mobile it's okay now let me ask you a few questions let's say let's take an example of instagram so everyone uses the instagram okay let's assume one profile okay one profile uh, which has a 10k followers okay or let's consider virat kohli's profile okay virat kohli profile okay uh, where uh, he will be having uh, 150k followers i am not sure it's correct or wrong okay let's i am assuming that okay let's take an example okay now if virat kohli has posted one picture okay virat kohli has posted one picture or like post or he has shared some story now it has to reach for 150 or 1 million or any number of people right so it has to be accessible for the 1 million people now like uh, just imagine just imagine you are storing that data in somewhere okay in somewhere and whenever i have opened my instagram okay if i am huge follower of virat kohli since i am like whatever post he shares uh, i will be liking that okay and among all the stories that i have been displaying on my profile i will be first seeing the virat kohli profile okay in within fraction of seconds you can see that right so whenever someone posted it is going to share like amount of time that i have been posted as well like one second one hour or 10 minutes so do you think this is going to come in within one second you might be wondering my answer is yes it is going to refresh within the one second or two seconds at max so to get the data that much faster okay virat kohli is in mumbai okay let's assume let's say i'm in uh, australia or us okay then do you think it is traveling from mumbai to us within that many seconds no okay like from mumbai it is storing in some like with the help of some cdns okay it is storing somewhere in data centers and then it is getting access in the us okay by using the cdn us cdn like so how we are getting stored this data that is the matter so we need to store the data in such a way that we can access that very easily very fast okay so if like uh, you can easily assume that like say you will be storing all your books okay like randomly in your room okay now i want to get the one book from the uh, room okay where you have uh, stored all your books randomly okay in some some books in bedroom some books in kitchen some books in hall okay now how much amount of time it will going to take to fetch one book like search from one book now can i say that at max it is going to take 10 minutes for sure right now just assume if you have stored all the books all the books all the books in an organized manner in a organized manner now how much time it is going to take i'm pretty much sure that let's say i have stored all the uh, physics books in one rack chemistry books in one rack data structure test books in one rack then it is going to take at max one minute yes one minute okay so there is a huge difference between one minute and ten minutes right so even if it is not making sense for you but a client or user who are waiting for your data will going to make and 10 minutes of waiting time is a little hectic for them okay that is the 
usage that is the necessary of organizing the data so that we can easily access the things okay so this is the use case that we need to learn data structure okay now we have talked about what is data structure and why we need data structure now how many types are there in data structure so i can say that all the data structures has been classified into two types linear and non-linear what is this linear and non-linear so linear and non-linear what is this linear and non-linear okay so i can say that like if the elements of a data structure results in a sequence or linear then it is called as a linear data structure and when the elements in a data structure results in a way that traversal of nodes is not done in the sequential manner like you can easily remember this as a whenever we are talking about this linear we can say that storing the data in the linear manner or a sequential manner means i'll write one after one okay let's say if i have stored something here then uh, after right after that i will be storing another then right after that then right after that so if i want the third one i can easily go there okay i can easily go here and pick up that so because everything is in sequential order they are following the order whatever like so first you came then you go first okay so like that okay now when we are talking about non-linear types it is not like sequential it is storing in non-sequential order so what is this non-sequential let's say we will be storing the data structure like uh, we can assume our file structure okay file structure let's say i have a desktop folder in that desktop folder i will be having uh, let's say scalar folder and again in scalar folder i will be having another folder called data structure and again in data structure i will be having another folder called arrays again in arrays i will be storing something so here you might think that for along with data structure there will be something as well let's say my computer or let's say i have a folder of my name called womc and in scalar folder as well uh, i will be having many things okay so here the data is in not in sequential order it is in random okay and if you need something you need to go on search every possible way okay then only you will get to know where it is actually stored so that is what a linear and the non-linear data structure means now we'll talk about what are the data structures that comes under linear and non-linear so if you observe the things here for uh, under the linear data structures we will be having arrays linked list stacks and queues okay we'll talk about them each of them in detail in the further okay but as of now let's uh, remember the names okay coming to non-linear data structures we will be having trees graphs tables and sets okay we'll talk about them each of them for sure okay please bear with me till the end now let's try to understand the where we use these data structures so i have i have told you enough examples in the while discussing the data structure as well now let me put all of these thing again like i can simply say that wherever there is something like programming i can easily say that there is a data structure as well directly or indirectly if you are storing something then directly or indirectly you will be using concept called data structure it represents how you store your data that's it okay and uh, like you can see these things okay so artificial intelligence compiler design machine learning uh, database design and management blockchain numerical and statistical analysis operating system development image and space recognition cryptography not limited to these things okay there are few more other like even android applications web applications so everything is being uh, backed by some databases right so indirectly we will be using uh, the concept of data structures in storing the data okay like if you are talking about database how how we are using database okay so if you are storing any rdbms database Okay, like a sql now can i say that all the data is being stored in the form of tables where you will be having a columns and rows 
so can i say that this is going to be non linear data structure yes okay so this is how you will be using the data structure in the day to day life okay now let's get into the some okay this is what we have discussed so far applications of data structures and uh, this is the most important question that everyone should uh, have to be clear with the okay, benefits of learning data structure so as if you are a cs guy or if you are one who is aiming for a uh, cs jobs like computer science field then you are on the right page you have to learn the data structures for sure okay there is no middle way and even if you consider all the high paying jobs okay all the high paying jobs requires a test you or ask you a data structure on algorithm questions in an interview okay in an interview so why does this happen because these a data structure um, and algorithm problems involves a lot of problem solving skills okay like if you are given an problem where you will, you need to handle a 10 gb of data okay 10 gb of data then how can you organize that okay how can you store that in database and how can you make it is been reasonable for everyone to access so such kind of problem solving skills will come under this data structure that's why companies will ask a data structures and algorithms questions in an interview okay now another most question to be addressed here is data structures in c and java so people might be asking like questions like uh, so which language should i pick up for learning data structures be it a c++ java a python or any other uh, language like javascript c sharp so all i can say that is the concept is same okay the basic fundamental concept of any data structure is going to be same but it only differs in way uh, like how you are going to uh, store your answer and how you are going to represent in the things in a syntactical way and how you are converting your logical thinking to the programming so it's i can say that it's just an uh, syntaxes okay and um, that is what you need to understand if you know if you have the concept then no one gonna judge you or ask you to only code in this particular language i don't know that okay so no one is gonna tell you that so language doesn't matter okay you can learn it in any language okay so let's talk about this as well okay so uh, this is what we have discussed and in an object oriented programming language like java data structures are been implemented using class and objects okay so in object oriented means oops languages like java python c++ we use a concepts called classes and the objects to implement the data structures and uh, coming to c which is not an object oriented programming language we use the concepts called uh, structures okay structures and uh, functions to implement the data structures okay and i would like to tell you about this um, like inbuilt support of languages provided by the uh, different languages as well let's say if you are a java coder and uh, like you wanted to use your data structures in your programming so you might be wondering should i learn the implementation of like should i manually implement all the things in the programming no so java supports uh, in java there is a thing called collections collections library okay where you can get all the inbuilt okay all the inbuilt support for the data structures all you need to do is you need to just uh, declare them and you can define them and you can use them okay and coming to c++ you will be having stl library okay stl library where stl will provide all the unnecessary support for your uh, implementation of the data structures okay you don't need to implement them manually every time okay you can just import these uh, either collections in java c++ stl in the c++ and you can use them okay i think now let's get started with the actual questions so the very first question that we are going to discuss is 
difference between file structure and the storage structure okay so uh, let's talk about first file structure so a representation of data into secondary or auxiliary memory may say any device such as hard disk pen drive that stores data which remains intact until manually deleted is known as a file structure okay it is saying that whatever the data that you are storing okay whatever the data that you are storing in your hard disk or this and pen drives will be called as your file structure okay and what is about storage structure so a storage structure means whatever the data that you are storing in your ram okay in your ram that is called as an uh, storage structure so uh, what is the difference here so if you store anything in the hard disk or pen drive it won't get deleted even after you remove that thing or uh, if power cuts if you face any power cut but in case of the data which is stored in ram if if you guys have witnessed a power cut or if you have shut down your uh, laptop and uh, restarted your laptop then you can't see the data which is stored in the ram okay that is a major difference between the file structure storage and the uh, storage structure okay now the second question so can you tell me how linear data structure differ from non linear data structure so as we discussed earlier so linear data structure stores the data in the form of a linearly and these uh, non linear data structure stores the data in non linear manner so which is going to be either a uh, unit to traverse to all the things okay which is in connected way then that's how you can access them okay so if you observe in this particular diagram so this is called as an storing the data in the linear manner means sequential manner if you observe so okay like you can traverse through this um, elements using a uh, one single type of okay, what is a traversing okay what is a traversing so basically let's say you have an array okay if you don't even know what is array just tick okay like if you have something like this and you have some data here 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 now a traversing means a visiting all these blocks okay you can consider this as one block this as one block this as one block okay so traversing means you need to visit all the blocks at once at least okay now so if in in the case of linear data structure you will be starting from 1 and you will be coming to 2 from like you can't go to 3 here okay so if you are traversing in a linear manner with the speed of 1 and you from here you can go to 3 then 4 then 5 then 6 then 7 so it is going to be linear in fashion right but if you consider this okay like it is starting from the a and from a you will be uh, let's assume this uh, things are being represented as a, a connection okay connection connection means you can from a you can go to b from a you can go to c or e as well okay if there is exist a path now from a you will be having three choices okay from b again you can go to e or b a again so here there is it is not sticking to one structure one sequence order so you can go to any order that you want okay but in case of linear you can only move to the next thing okay that is in sequential manner okay so that is what and a difference between sequential and non sequential is now what is an array an array is an a collection of similar type of data stored in a contiguous memory location what is a contiguous memory location let's say okay so this is an array okay and uh, uh, my first element okay i have started at the uh, address of 100 okay address of 100 let's say i have stored 20 in it then i can say that i am storing all the integer typed values as of now and i know that integer takes a two bytes of memory okay integer takes two bytes of memory it means that so it will assume like it will take two bytes okay if it, if it has started at 200 if it is taken two two bytes then the next bit will start from 1 or 2 so and i will be storing another 10 over there 
and again i am pretty much sure that it is going to take only again two bytes okay so i will be going to the 104 and then again i will store another integer and it will take another two bytes so six then uh, i will be storing three again it will take 108 okay now again i will be storing one so it will take one sorry 110 so here everything is in sequential order now uh what is the array here like what is the uniqueness of the array so here if you observe we will be storing all the integer typed values only yes because in an array you will be you are allowed to store only one type of data okay whatever you have defined it now what is it defining an array okay or declaring an array so declaring means you need to if you wanted to use any a variable you need to declare that first okay how can we declare the int like array so let's say i have an a variable called arr which represents the array and this symbol will help us to tell this particular thing is a array okay means it is going to store the data in the sequential order okay and it will take multiple uh, values at the same time as well which are int types okay only int types now if i have um, if i have represented it as a something like character array okay if i have if i have defined it as something like this then it will take a characters okay one character at a each time okay or only it supports only character or either integers as well because uh, in c language or in c plus plus all the characters and um indirectly equal to the integers until 256 okay and all the numbers until 256 is going to indirectly represent the characters because of the ascii values and if you don't know what is ascii values please have a look at that like just go to google and search for this and you will find what is ascii values okay now let's move on to the next question what is a multi-dimensional array okay so uh, we know that array stores in the data of this manner okay the address might be 100 102 104 108 110 112 114 at last okay now what is this multi-dimensional array so a multi-dimensional array means so i can say that so if you observe this carefully i can say that it has one row and one two three four five six six columns right one row six columns so this is a single dimensional array so whenever you will be having one row okay one row then it is called as a single dimensional array so whenever you will be having a uh, multiple rows okay whenever you will be having multiple rows like this like this okay uh, it is called as a multi-dimensional array so again it is going to call like if you observe this thing carefully it is in the form of matrix right so if i represent this in the matrix so it will be having three rows and a uh, six column so three into six matrix okay so i can say that three rows six columns yep now here at max at max how many elements that you can store here i can say that you can store six elements okay six elements now here you can store at max 18 elements okay 18 elements so you might be wondering uh, like how to access these elements okay so for that you uh, we will be having a concept called indexing indexing what is this indexing so basically let's say we, we will be having an array with the size of uh, six okay size of six so one two three four five six okay so size of six means it can store a six values or six elements at max okay so if i represent these things in the integer or like indexing then it is going to start from the zero then one two three four five and for uh, like for every array the last like the last index is going to be size minus one okay and it will start from the zero okay start from the zero 
now let's assume here we will be storing a 10 20 30 40 50 60 now how can i access these elements and let's assume the name of this array is arr okay now if i write arr of 3 okay if i write something like this now we will be getting output as a thrad index value okay in arr okay array the thrad index value so what in arr what is the thrad index this is the thrad index now we are going to get the 40 as our output if i write arr of 1 what does it mean it means that in arr variable okay array we need a one th index so we are going to get the 20 as the output now if i try to access if i try to access array of 10 what are we going to get you are going to like first check is there any index with the uh, number of 10 no there is no index such that now we it is going to throw an error or exception if you are an java or python guys it will throw an exception which is a named as a array array out of bounds exception array out of bound exception okay which means that the index which you are trying to access is not there okay not there that's it now now this is okay for this is for uh, this uh, like single dimensional array how can we access the multi dimensional array okay multi dimensional like array accessing how can we access that so uh, in in the case of uh, like 1d dimensional array, one dimensional array we will be having only one row and n columns so we can just represent in one index okay but in case of a multi-dimensional array we will be having something like this okay now let's try to represent these things in rows first so it is going to be zero row one row and second row and if i represent these columns zero column first column second column so it's just as representing the things in the matrix okay represent the things in the matrix now so if i want this particular element i can represent it as zero comma zero like let's say if this is an a name of array okay this uh, name of array then i can say that array first i need to mention the row which is an zero then i need to mention the column which is again to be zero okay the first zero represents the row second zero represents the column okay if i write if i write 2 comma like 2 of 1 which means a second row this second row and first column okay this is now i am going to get this particular value okay so this is how we are going to access the like we can access the elements in a, a multi-dimensional and single dimensional arrays okay now what is a linked list okay linked list is an another data structure which is a uh, which follows an uh, linear data type okay so a linked list is a data structure that has sequence of nodes sequence of nodes where every node is connected to the next node by means of reference point okay we'll talk about that later like now elements are not sorted in adjacent memory locations they are linked using pointers from a to form a chain okay and each node is having data field and the reference point of so if you remember if you observe this particular diagram we will be like if you consider this as a node and at the first half we will be having data and the second half we will be having the pointer to the next node pointer to the next node what does it mean okay let's say okay uh, this is our node okay this is our node and node has been as two parts one is data another one is link to the next node okay so uh, this data represents something let's say 10 i wanted to store that 10 now what does this part is going to store i can say that this part is going to store let's say okay let's come to uh, let's try to define a few other nodes as well okay now this is storing 20 this is storing 30 
now this node is being stored in the memory location of 200 and this is being stored in the memory location of 500 and this is being stored in the memory location of 1000 okay now now i wanted to go to 20 okay i wanted to go to 20 after the 10 okay i wanted to go to 20 after the 10 so here i need to mention the node address which i would like to go next okay so i wanted to go to the 20 so what is the address of the 20 it is a 500 so i will mention 500 here now after 20 i, I would like to go to the 30 okay 30 now what is the address of the 30 it is going to be 1000 right so after 30 i don't want to go anywhere okay i don't want to go anywhere so now it is going to store the null okay it, which means that if you would like to not to go anywhere okay after visiting some node okay then you need to point that as a null point okay which represents this is the ending point okay which is the ending point and every starting node will be having a head node okay which represents the starting point of a node okay done okay this is how a linked list is been represented and if you observe the data everything has been stored in the everything has been stored in the form of sequential okay after one we will be storing like going to the 20 so here we will be just directly representing the things in the form of memory location okay we are not going anywhere we are directly going to the 500 after 200 so that's what it is in sequential way done now let's go our linked list of linear or non-linear type okay good question we have seen the answer just now right linked list can be considered both linear and non-linear data structure this depends upon the application that they are using okay so this can be treated as a both linear and non-linear but moreover it depends upon the where we are using the context the context where we are uh, using that term called linked list okay so when linked list is used for accessing strategies is considered as a linear data structure when they are storing data storage it can be considered as a non-linear non data structure okay so it totally depends upon the uh, application that we are using this linked list okay now let's move on to the next question so how are linked lists are more efficient than arrays good question okay so here i would like to mention the term called uh, time complexity time complexity and space complexity okay so whenever you are writing an uh, program or whenever you are writing an algorithm okay so these are the two aspects which talks about whether your uh, your code which you have written is an efficient or not okay so if it is taking minimal amount of space and time minimal okay minimum amount of space and time it can be called as an efficient algorithm for a problem okay like even in the case of uh, uh, real world applications let's say you are using a payment okay you are uh, like uh, let's say amazon okay amazon website you have bought one product okay you have bought one book let's assume okay one book and now you are paying amount for this okay you are doing payment payment so you just imagine if your payment took one minute of time to finish okay one minute of time to finish how do you think no yeah uh, i i won't i am not interested in doing the like paying the online okay because it will take one minute of time and uh, until that uh, you until that you receive the done yes payment has been received your uh, order has been successfully placed you won't be in a peace right <laughs> it is always like lub dub your heart will be like pumping up okay so what if my amount got detected from the account and if like if my order is being cancelled so you might be having these things until the, you have seen the payment has been done okay so in that case it should be done in the either one second or two seconds of time okay then only people will go and purchase the things on from the amazon website okay so in this case it is an time complexity 
so one minute of time complexity and one second of time complexity which one do you prefer the answer is up to you okay and that is the answer for the time complexity as well okay now let's come to the question so insertion and deletion operations so basically uh, what is this insertion and deletion so insertion and deletion process is expensive in an array as the room has to be created for the new elements and existing elements must be shifted okay let's say we have an array something like this okay you will be storing one two three four five now i would like to okay in between three and four i would like to insert the six okay like i am expecting my end array should be looks like one two three six four five now like to perform this operation what are the like what is the process first we need to create this six yes we need to create this six then we need to replace this okay we need to put this here okay to put that here is that as simple as that no so at first we need to create a space here okay then we need to move the four to the fifth position and uh, five to the sixth position right so we have created the room here and then we have shared like we have shifted four to the next guy and five to the next guy then you we have replaced six over there like so here to insert one element we are doing three operations three operations even for delete even for delete if i if i wanted to delete that okay if i wanted to delete that first what i need to do i need to delete this six okay i need to delete the i need to delete the six okay then i need to move my four to here and five to here again it's taking three operations right so which is an like complex thing to understand but in case of uh, linked list let's see i have a linked list something like this okay eight so i have linked list something like this now i would like to insert nine here okay nine here now how can i insert so it's just simple right so i will break this point okay connect a two nine after seven and i will connect eight after the nine that's it it's as simple as that we don't need to perform any uh replace operations or move operations here we are just deleting the like we are just breaking the bond over there and connecting the bond to the nine that's it okay it is as simple as that okay and it is going to take the big war of a uh, one complex and if you don't know what is time complexity and space complexity i highly recommend you guys to watch the tutorials which are being already created on the time complexity and uh, space complexity in this particular channel itself okay so there is a playlist called dsa okay you can go there and you will find a plenty amount of videos over there cool so uh, this is about uh, even if i take a deletion operation let's say if i wanted to delete this nine itself now what i can do so i will simply break this out and i will connect to eight and i will break this out and i will delete that that's it as simple as that okay we are not doing any complex operations like move 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 and all okay it's very simple but but uh, i would like to talk about something like accessing as well okay accessing as well so to access an uh, array elements it is going to be as simple as that okay you will put your index value and you will get the value so it is going to take constant uh, like time but if i wanted to access the linked list elements it is not as simple as that okay if i want to access this particular element first i need to start from the head okay i need to start from the head i need to go to every node okay every node until i found a node which i want then only i can access that element so i can't go in the middle and i get that okay i need to start from the starting position i need to go to the every node and I need to check okay yeah so uh, the second thing is dynamic in nature yeah. dynamic in nature so point to be discussed so here what is a dynamic in nature so basically there were two things static 
and dynamic so static means let's say if you are defining an array you will be mentioning how many number of columns that you need here itself okay here you can't modify this in later part okay you can store only five elements it is defined it is fixed okay but in case of dynamic you will be giving only like uh, the number of uh, elements okay that you required okay let's say so you have in the case of static you have defined five but later you observe that you will be requiring 10 elements to be stored that in that case it won't support yes yes now let's say let's uh, this is first point and second point is let's say you would like to store the uh, two elements okay you have defined five but i found that i only required two elements in that case three space is waste okay the space for three elements is waste okay you are not using that right but in case of dynamic let's say you will be defining the amount of memory or the amount of elements that you would like to shape okay then only you can create the things okay let's say if i want a requirement of two elements store then i will create a two elements if i requirement of 100 i will create a 100 that's how it works right so this is about a static and dynamic okay and in case of linked list it's always a dynamic it always dynamic in nature okay it is always in dynamic in nature uh, you there is no boundaries for that but in case of arrays while defining the array itself you need to mention whether like how many elements that you are going to store okay so it is one of the drawback for array but how can we make this as a dynamic so there are few concepts okay known as malloc so which helps us to define the memory or allocate the memory uh, in the dynamic space okay while uh, runtime okay you can call this as a runtime so basically we will be having two things compile time and a runtime what is this compile time so compile time means uh, after writing the code okay after writing the code you will be putting the things okay like uh, let's say uh, while writing the code itself you will be mentioning the things but runtime means after compiling the program okay based upon the user's requirement the coding has been changing okay that is called a runtime during the runtime so as we discussed it's a memory wastage as well so if i have defined five if i have used only two then it's a memory wastage right so that is what it is uh, discussing about now let's move on to the next question so explain the scenarios where you can use a linked list and arrays okay so i will like leave with this particular question to up to your imagination okay in total okay we have uh, seen a hell about these things okay where or uh, what are the different types of uh, linked list are available and um, uh, different types of arrays available what are the drawbacks here and what are the cons and pros of arrays and linked list now just imagine okay so just take out uh, just go through this and just try to imagine whether we can apply a uh, in this particular situation can we apply um, array or linked list okay so i will just go walk through these things okay so uh, following all the scenarios where you use linked list over array okay so when we do not know the exact number of elements beforehand so as we said there is no a boundaries for linked list so it is means that you can like if we don't know the requirement we can go with a uh, linked list so whenever something has been changed we can append those changes but in case of array we can't do that so when we know that there would be large number of add or remove operations so as we discussed uh, linked list is very easy to perform insert and uh, deletion operations when compared to the uh, arrays so in that cases we can prefer linked list so less number of random access access operations so random access operations means a searching let's say we have uh, different nodes and i wanted to access this particular node okay so i can't easily go i can't easily go to this particular node directly right so i have to start from the starting then i can go to each one manually then only i can access that element so so in that case let's say if i have thousand nodes thousand nodes i wanted to access the 999 node then how many nodes i need to check i need to check 
999 nodes right so it is going to be little complex operation so in case of array i can easily uh, say array of 999 then i will get the answer okay in such cases so you, like if it has a very less number of um, random access operations then you can prefer linked list then um, when we want to insert items anywhere in the middle of the list such as while implementing the priority queue linked list or more suitable so we'll talk about these priority queues later okay so as of now they are saying that if you wanted to insert something in the middle as we discussed earlier so in that case you can prefer linked list over array now what is the second thing so below are the cases where we use array over the linked list so as of now we discussed about using linked list over array now let's discuss about using arrays over linked list so when we need to create index or randomly access element from the frequent uh, like more frequently so as i said if we wanted to access 999th index we can simply say arr of array of 999 so you can access the thing very easily now the second point when we know the number of elements in the array beforehand in order to allocate the right amount of memory so as we discussed earlier as well so if you know the requirement exactly let's say if i wanted to have only 20 elements in my array then you can go with the, this particular uh, arrays okay if you are not sure about how many elements that are going to are required then you should go to the linked list third uh, thing when we need um, speed while iterating over the elements in the sequence so speed matters a lot right so that as speed directly depends upon the time complexity so if you are uh, going a little faster in the your uh, memory then you, uh, like in your uh, array then your overall time complexity is going to be little faster and efficient Yes, so this is about uh, scenarios where we uh, prefer either linked list or arrays. Now, what is a double linked list and what are its applications? So till now we have talked about single linked list. Now let's talk about double linked list. So a double, so in single linked list we will be having only the pointer to the next node. Okay, the pointer to the next node. So just imagine if you have a pointer to the next node the previous node okay the previous node then this is called as a double linked list okay so here your node would be containing three parts one is data and the next pointer and the previous pointer okay and the previous pointer so this is what a double linked list means let's coming to the applications so here so applications of dll so a music player list with the next song and previous song navigation options so everyone loves music right so if you have opened any music player okay if you have opened any music player you could have observed a uh, next pointer uh, like um, let's say so if you are listening one music okay there will be options right like go to the next song go to the previous song and pause the song and resume the song so something like this so here so you can uh, assume that this uh, going to the next song is a next pointer going to the previous song is a previous pointer okay this is one use case where you will be using double linked list and the browser catch with the back forward back forward of visit pages okay so let's say uh, i have currently opened uh, google chrome okay like interview bit uh, blocks website okay interview bit blocks website now like uh, before coming to interview bit platform i have opened a scalar academy website scalar academy website okay now uh before uh, back okay so like after visiting uh, interview bit as well i have visited another website okay which is called as a let's say scalar forever scalar forever website now now i am currently in the interview bit platform if i wanted to go to the uh, the web page or the website which i have opened uh, before before to the interview bit then what can i say so here you can see these navigation buttons right navigation buttons so this one represents the backward this one represents the forward so this is the current page which i am in so interview bit 
Now if I click on this back page, I will go to the Scalar Academy. If I click on this forward page, I will go to the forever, Scalar forever, right? So this is one use case where we will be using a uh, double link list. Now undo and redo functionality on platforms, right? So let's say uh, like you have opened a notepad, okay, notepad or word or whatever it might be. So you will be pressing control Z, right? So control Z will get the uh, like uh, recently deleted the values. So and something um, so there is something like a redo as well. So redo means you have uh, uh, like entered something and you have given a backspace like uh, deleted them and you wanted to get back them. So undo and redo. So these operations will also take a double link list. Okay. So this is about double link list and applications of a double link list. Now, what is a stack? What are the applications of a stack? So here, this particular diagram represents the enough explanation. I don't need to explain it manually. Let's say, so uh, let's consider this particular bookshelf. Okay. Now, what do you think about this particular book? So can I say if I have 10 books, okay, I wanted to put them in a uh, one rack so all i can do is first i will put the one book okay this book then i will put the, this book then this then this then this then this then this right so i'll put all of them and if i wanted to take the okay if i wanted to take the one book which is on top what it would be it is this particular book when i inserted that i inserted that the last when i'm taking that out the first Okay, last inserted, first taken. So this is called an LIFO. So whatever element which has been uh, pushed into the stack, okay, at first is going to take out as the last. Okay, so stack linear data structure follows the last in first out approach. So if you even see this, first I have pushed one, then two, then three, then four okay if i wanted to take one element okay if i wanted to take one element from the top okay this is going to be four right if i it is going to be four that is what a pop so basically stack has a three operations primarily one is push pop and top so push operation helps us to insert the insert the elements into the data structure and pop operation helps us to delete the topmost element which you have in in case of a stack which you have recently added so here the recently added element is a four so when i say pop four is going to be out okay so the top so this top is going to uh, give us the topmost element so what is the topmost element? I can say that uh, a topmost element is the element which is been added recently. Okay, which is been added recently. So four is the last element that I have added recently. Okay, hope you have understood the stack and stack operations, right? So if you want in detail, like uh, let me put here. So let's say I have these elements one, two, three, four, five, six. Now I wanted to put all of these elements in a stack. So, okay, let me put the operations. Okay, I have operations like this. So first push one, then push two, then push four, then push three, then pop, then a pop again, then top. Okay, before coming to top, let's say push. 10 okay now let's see so this is our stack so what is the first operation it is saying that push one so if i push one it is going to store something like this now again it is saying that push two okay two now again it is saying that push four now again it is saying that push three now it is saying that pop so what does pop do pop will delete the topmost element topmost element which you have added recently what is the element which i have added recently it is the three right it is the three so i will remove that i will remove that done 
now what is the next one again it is saying that pop okay pop so i will now what is the top element it is 4 right so i will remove this as well now what is the operation it is saying that push 10 okay so i will push 10 now it is saying that top okay so what is the top so top will give you the topmost element which you have added recently so it will give the 10 done so if you like a uh, top don't delete the element okay it will give you the only topmost element only pop will delete the element okay so here uh, these are the applications of the stack so we'll talk about them as well now so first is check for balanced parenthesis in an expression it's going to be one of the interesting problem in dsa so like where you will be given uh, like a parenthesis like this okay you need to check whether for every opened parenthesis there exists a closed parenthesis that is the problem statement so you can solve this problem using stack so give it a shot okay give it a try and evaluation of postfix expression so uh, there is three three things okay prefix postfix and uh, infix okay so like uh, these operations are like uh, if you have given a plus b plus into c minus d you need to convert this into the these three operations okay so in one such operation for postfix you can use the uh, stack okay you can use the stack and a problem of infix to postfix conversion and reverse testing so a reverse testing means you will be given a string okay you will be given let's assume string like this and you require to reverse this entire string so how can you do that so let's say you have a stack like this so i will start from the first element okay and i will push everything to the stack so v a m s i so once i am done now i will uh, i will take the top and i will delete it uh, the particular top element now if i say top I will get the i and i will delete this i will pop out this i now now i will again say top and i will de delete the pop the top now again i will say top i will get the m and i will pop out so i will again say top i will get the a and i will pop it out now again i say top i will get v and i will get top popped out so if you see there is nothing in the stack so and if you see the output i got the reverse of a womc that's how it should work okay so what is a queue so then the name only suggests that what is a queue okay so just guess okay so a queue is a linear data structure that follows a FIFO first in first out so what does it mean so if you see okay like uh, they have given one amazing example here so uh, you you have in a uh, movie mall okay you have went to the movie theater nowadays everything is online booking but just imagine okay uh, like and 90 kids can uh, imagine this so there is a movie ticket counter okay you need to go to the queue and you need to collect the ticket okay buy the ticket from there then only you will be entered to, into the theater okay so now just imagine so who is going to be uh, the uh, first person at the counter whoever come to the counter first they are going to be at first so who is going to get the ticket at first the person who entered first then then so who is going to get the ticket at the last the person who entered into the queue for the last right that is how it works right now let's say I have a few operations that we have taken out there uh, for Q we will have operations have NQ and DQ okay we call this so NQ will do uh, like something like insert what we did for push and DQ will do deletion of top element and a friend will give you the topmost element okay like the one which is very close to the counter here now let's say uh, if i give the operations like nq1 nq3 dq a top 
in q5 okay now so uh, just imagine this is a q okay this is a q and uh, if i have like first i have in q1 so i will put one here then i have in q3 now i have dq so when i say dq what is the element that i am going to get the out first the one which is entered into the first okay in this case the element which entered the q first is the one so i will i will remove the one done okay now i have top so what is the top element now say three okay after one has been deleted three is a top it will get three now again i say in q5 so i will say five okay this is how it should work now if i again dq what is the element that i am, that I am going to get so it's a three right so this is how q should work now what are the applications of q that are the applications of q so cpu scheduling task a bfs algorithm to find shortest distance between two nodes in a graph so if you don't know what is bfs and graph don't worry we are going to learn in this particular video itself so please watch this video till the end a uh, website uh, request processing used as a buffers in applications like mp3 media uh, cd player etc managing and uh, input stream so these are the some of the applications where we use q so let's move on to the next question how is a stack different from a q it's very silly question we have discussed so far okay so a stack follows stack follows leaf for manner last in first out q follows first in first out manner okay so that is the only difference between stack and q explain the process behind storing a uh, variable in memory okay so they are asking us to tell the process how the data has been stored in the memory okay like some variable take out one example as a variable then tell me so at first at first variable is stored in memory based upon the amount of memory that is needed so here uh, like say a uh, variable is declared as an integer type a float type a string type okay so depends upon the type of the uh, data that we are storing under one particular variable so following other steps are followed to store a variable so the amount of amount of memory is required is assigned first so in case of int we will be requiring two bytes in case of float we will be requiring four bytes in case of string we will be requiring the amount of characters it has okay so each character will have one byte so it will it will be uh, required the amount of characters it has then that's done with the first then it is stored based upon the data structure being used as well okay so uh, here let's say if we have defined integer typed array so it is going to require a contiguous memory locations right so it is not about one particular starting point it is about uh, like sequence of operation let's say i have given uh, 10 as my memory elements then it should assign 20 uh, 20 amount okay like 20 bytes of amount for that particular array so it should search for 20 uh, bytes when wherever there is a possibility of assigning 20 then it will show there but in case of uh, linked list it always finds an the large amount of space because it is dynamic in nature okay so requirement is not stated in the before assigning the things so it depends upon the data type as well let's see how to implement a queue using a stacks okay so how can we implement so we are asked to implement queue using stack so yes we can use uh, like um, there is two methods one is using one stack another one is a uh, two stacks so as of now we are sticking to this particular approach okay and uh, maybe in some other tutorial we will try to focus on how to implement a queue using single stack as well but as of now let's try to implement the using two stacks so first so we know that uh, stack operations are push pop and top 
and q operations so nq dq and let's say friend okay so now using these operations and two queues we need to implement these operations okay which is a uh, for q okay so first let's try to understand how what are the operations and how it is going to work so let's say uh, stack works in this particular manner okay when i say push okay push one okay and push three and pop so pop means the, the whatever the element which has been uh, inserted into a stack at the last that is going to come out of the first okay so this is going to eliminate it done now again i can say top now if i say what is the topmost element now currently it is one so i will get a one if i perform the same operations like nq1 uh, nq3 dq and friend okay now how it should looks like let's say so nq1 yes one and a D nq3 three and it is saying that dq so what is going to happen so first in first out so what is the element which has been entered into q for the first one so it is going to be eliminated now if i say friend what will be my output it would be three right so now you got what is the operations of stack and what is the operations of uh, q now let's try to implement the q using a stack okay so for that we will be taking two stacks okay like this stack one stack two stack one and stack two and we are going to perform this series of operations like this nq of one like nq of two nq of five dq of uh, dq that's it okay so dq and a friend okay these are a q operations okay whenever i do nq it is going to push whenever i queue dq it is going to be pop whenever i do friend it is going to give me the top now let's try to perform these operations by putting these as a reference okay at first it is saying that um, while a stack not is empty so here stack is empty so what we are going to do uh, so like first we are going to perform nq operation which is a push okay so we'll take this and we'll call this nq and we say that while stack one is not empty so here stack one is empty so simply we are going to insert this push this one to the here done now again we have seen the nq of two so here this time our stack one is not empty okay stack one is not empty so what we are going to do so push everything from stack one to the stack two so whatever we have in stack one we are going to pop out them one by one and push it into the stack two now here we'll pop out this one and we'll push it into the work two now push data to the stack one so what is the data here two so we'll push it here now push everything back to the stack one okay so we'll pop this here and then we'll push whatever we have popped to the stack one done done now again we have seen the nq of five so again stack one is not empty so push everything from stack one to stack two so whatever we have in stack one we need to pop them each one of them and push it to the stack two so if we pop each everything so first i i will pop a one and i will push it to the stack two then i will pop the two and push it to the stack one so first one then two now it is saying that uh, push a data to the stack one so what is the data it's a five so i will push here and again it is saying that push everything back to the stack one so whatever we have in the stack two will pop that each and everything like every element and push it back to the stack one so here first we'll pop two first we'll pop two and then we'll push it here and then we'll pop the one and push it back here so it is going to be looks like this now dq now dq so dq means a pop operation so in q how it is gonna work so whatever you have a pushed okay, whatever you have pushed at the first okay then it is going to come out of the a queue for the first 
so in this case let's say we have called dq okay and if stack one is empty then error so here stack one is not empty so pop an item from the stack one and return it okay so they are saying that pop the item from the stack one so if i pop what is the element so we usually stack eliminates the last in first of so here last has been entered this now i will pop this out and i will say here okay for this we got the answer as one so in this case one is the first thing which has entered into q right so that is what we got done now dq so again dq so what is the same so again stack one is not empty what we will do we will do pop the stack one element so if we pop we will get two and return the two here that's it now they are saying that friend so uh, we will be getting the topmost element that's it so here we have only five written that so this is how we are going to implement the queue using two stacks okay and there is another method so here we will be making a uh, nq operation little complicated yes right so we are performing uh, swapping operations and then we are putting back to the queue stack one and we are making a uh, nq operation little complicate but dq operation is in doing in some constant amount of time so the another approach follows a uh, making an nq operation little easier and dq operation little costlier that's it okay so just follow these uh, steps okay if i am pretty much sure that you will be able to do this okay now let's go so the next question is how do you implement stack using queue so this is the opposite reverse okay so earlier we have done q using a stack now they are asking stack using q okay so now we need to do this so again we are going to use a two queues two and we know the operations of q right so first in first out and stack is last in first out so we need to implement these operations so these are the sequence of operations that we can follow here okay so let's try to check okay whether we can able to do this or not so let's take first let's take two queues q1 q2 and i will take a sequence of op operations let's say push one push three push five push six pop pop top and push okay let's make it little complicated okay now let's do this thing so first step push one so it will come here and enqueue the data to the q2 okay i will be putting it one in the q2 let me change the color yeah now dq elements one by one from q1 and enqueue it to the q2 so here currently q1 is empty so we are not going to do this step now swap the names of the q1 and q2 okay so uh, swap the names in the sense like uh, whatever we have in the uh, q1 let's put them to the q q2 and uh, uh, whatever we have in q2 we will be putting them into the q1 okay so here if we do that like um yeah uh, it can be simply uh changing the names as well so we can do that as well like, so q2 and q1 done okay again we got a push 3 so push 3 so uh first thing nq to the data to the q2 so here we have q2 as here now so dq elements one by one from the q1 and nq to the two so here we will be having only one so we'll pop this out and put it in the uh, q1 now swap the names of q1 and q2 so swap the names q1 q2 now we'll follow this so push 5 okay push 5 so i will i'm going to push it here okay i'm going to push it here and sorry uh, sorry sorry so i need to do this here sorry. so a dq elements by one by one and put it back into the q2 so here what is the element that first has got into the q1 it is three right so i need to pop that of three first and i will push it back to the here and then one done now swap the names of two 
so it is going to be q2 and q1 done now again push 6 so uh, i will push 6 in the q2 and then uh, pull out all of these things and then put it back here so if i pull out all these things it will be looks like something 5 3 1 right what is the element that first got entered into the q1 it's a 5 so we have to pop that out first and we we'll need to put it in q2 okay now again same right now they are saying that pop so pop so we'll come to here okay we'll come to here so we we did not swap the things okay so we'll swap the q1 and q2 now they are saying that pop so dq from the pop q1 and return it so what is the element if i if i pop it from the q1 like if i dq from q1 what is the element that i get 6 right why 6 6 is the one which has entered into the q for the first so if i dq i will get the 6 so so yeah yes so this is what i want right so if i am doing stack so uh, i will i will be getting last in first order so what is the last element that got into the uh, q so 6 right so i will be getting 6 that's it so we, we we can eliminate this six now. Now again we have pop. Now what is the element that I get? So five. So I will get a five. So I will eliminate the five here. Now what is the element top? So what is the topmost element currently? It is three. So I will get a three. Now again saying that uh, push two. So first I will push it into the Q two. Then I will pop out everything from the Q1. So if I do pop out, I will get 3 and 1 and then I will be eliminating here and then just swapping the names. So it is going to be Q2 and Q1. Okay, that's it. If I perform a uh, pop now, it is I am going to get 2 as my answer. Done. So this is how you, you can implement the uh, stack using two queues. Okay. So I'm not writing the code here. Okay. I hope you can able to do that here and uh, we'll do a separate video on that as well. Now let's move on to the next question. What is hash map in data structure? Uh, so hash map is being called as an different names in different programming languages. Let me put it here. So in Python, we use a dictionary. Okay. In C++, we use a map or unordered map okay and in java we use hash map okay so the operations is same okay the operations are same and um, the names only different uh, while changing to the language to language so a hash map is a data structure that uses implementation of hash table data structure which allows access of data in constant time complexity if you have the key so basically let me tell you how the data has been stored into the hash map first so hash map follows two rules key and value so what is a key and what is a value so a key is a unique value okay a key is a unique value so which helps uh, this particular thing to the uh, identify the uh, data from the or uh, access the data from the map so let me take one simple example so uh, let's say you will be given an array of elements okay array of elements like this and now you need to calculate the a uh, frequency okay frequency of each element okay frequency of each element now how can you do that so by using the hash map we can do that easy so let's say first i will check whether one is there in the queue or not okay like hash map or not yes one is not there so i will put one and i will make sure value is assigned to the one okay so uh, what does it mean so till now one has been occurred only once okay now again i can see that there is a one so here first i will check whether one is there in my hash map or not yes one is there so what does it mean what does it mean so it means that there is already exist a one which has occurred for once okay now what do i need to do if i can simply if i can simply update this uh, value then my job is done so here key is element and value is frequency of a that particular element done 
now again i have one okay now um which is like already have one in my map so what i need to do i need to just increment my value so if i do that it will become three now i have two so two is not there in the map so i will create one okay done now again i have a two but i have already two is exist in my map so what i can do i can simply increase the value so now it is a three so well the three is there in my map no so i can just say three to the one now the next element is four so four is not there in my map so i will increment it back now i have two okay i have two so but already a two is exist in my map so what do i need to do i need to simply increment the value of the key value of the two done so now let's check cross check the things okay here i have uh, an array size of the eight so three plus three plus six six plus one seven seven plus one eight so eight done so this is the frequency so this is how and um, we store data in the hash map so what are the things that you have identified here so in hash map we we can't store the duplicate values okay we can't okay we can't store the duplicate values yes and if we if like we can't store the duplicate values is an uh, passive statement okay uh, what we can say is it will get overrided like overridden that's it okay like if you have one and again if you have seen one it will just override that one with one and it will like what it will do whatever operation that you are performing okay that's it and how to access the uh, hash map elements by using these keys okay let's say this uh, particular hash map uh, is been under the variable of mp then you can say mp of 2 then you will get a answer as 3 okay like this is a key basically and uh, if you do this something like this you will get a value so this is how hash map works now what is the requirement for an object to be used as a key or a value in the hash map so we have discussed what is a key and what is a value and they are saying that what is the requirement for an object to be used as a key or value so now the key or value object uh, that gets used in hash map must implement equals or hash code method now ha the hash code is used when inserting the key object into the map and equals method is used when uh, trying to retrieve a value from the uh, map so basically it's something like um, equals is used for finding an element and a hash code operation is being used for uh, uh, inserting an element okay that's it simply how does a uh, hash map handle collision in java so what is a collision okay i will tell you that so let's say in hash map you have one two three now again i am trying to uh, like uh, i am trying to map this uh, one two uh, like first i have mapped one like 10 11 and 12 here now again i wanted to for one i wanted to map um, 15 now in that case this is going to be overridden right but i don't want like that i wanted to be all the values to be handled over there so in such cases how to handle this okay there is a collision right so we have already data again we are trying to insert the data back again so it will collide so how to handle these things so they are saying that uh, so this is that in java this is how you will be importing the hash map so in java uses the approach of chaining the handle collisions okay so we follow the chaining uh, method so in chaining if the new values or which is the same keys are attempted to be pushed then these values are stored in a linked list stored in bucket of the key as a chain long with the existing value yes so make sense so uh, the, I will tell you with an example how this is works. Okay, let's say I have a values of uh, 10, uh, 11, 12, uh, 11, 12, and 13, 14, and 15. Now I will be having one uh, hash key, hash key as um, two. 
okay hash key as two now how does it work so basically i will be mapping all these things with the mode of let's say i will take this and 10 mod 2 which is an hash key here so the value is 0 so i will map all the 0th reminder values to the one key and all the one uh, reminder values to the one key let's say here i have a key values of 0 and 1 right so if my hash key is 2 then i have these are the only two possible ways that i can get now so 10 mod 2 is 0 so i need to uh, assign the 10 to the 0th key so i will do that here done now i will take out the next guy which is 11 so 11 so 11 mod 2 is going to be 1 so i need to map the 11 to the 1 now i will get 12 so 12 mod 2 is going to be 0 so it means that i need to assign this 12 to the 0th key so already if you can observe already there is a 10 which is been assigned to the 0 now how can i assign 12 so here i will follow an link list matter okay link list so uh, starting with the, the node of uh, for the key of a 0 i will be having a link list done now 13 so 13 is going to give me the reminder as 1 so which means that i need to give it to the 1th key so already 11 is existing there so i will form a chain here i will form a chain okay now there is a 14 so if i divide like um, if i the remainder is going to be 0 so it means that i need to map it here and again so you you got it right so i will for the every key if there is a colli collision is occurring then we are forming an chain like structure okay we are storing the data in the form of linked list okay this is how we um, handle collision in the hash map or hash tables uh, in worst case scenario it can happen that all keys might have the same hash code which will result in the hash table turning into a linked list so they are saying that uh, let's say if i have given all the even numbers here okay like uh, 10 12 14 16 18 20 22 23 like this then all the values are going to be mapped to the zero itself right zero only zero key only so that is what they are saying that so in this case a searching will be taking big w of n right big w of n so if i start from the like if i wanted to search for 20 then first i will be starting from 10 then 12 then 14 16 17 18 i will be searching in the mag at max of n elements n elements right so that is what they are saying that in worst case uh, big w of n will be the complexity as opposed to big of one time due to the nature of linked list hence care has to be taken while selecting the hashing algorithm uh, so this is an like uh, you need to be very careful while telling uh, if you have used a hash map in your data algorithm and uh, you, you should be very careful while telling the complexity over there because in worst case you will be taking log in time and in best case it will take big of n one time which is a constant time so please make sure that you won't get confused now what is the time complexity of basic operations get and put in hash map so yeah so they are saying that uh, get and put operations so basically these are the two operations that we perform on hash map okay get is accessing sorry accessing and put is for inserting Okay. so uh, they are asking us what will be the time complexity time complexity over there so in in best case okay if you are following and a uh, like a where you will be storing only one value to the each key then in that case the both operations will be big of one time which is a constant time but if you have uh, if you are taking like where your map is in this particular form we have discussed earlier the complexity is going to be in worst case it is going to be big of n okay let's discuss another problem so the next problem is what is a priority key we have talked about queue and stack right so what is this priority queue so a priority queue is an abstract data type that is a, like a mere a queue normal queue but as priority as n to elements so uh, let's take one example then i can uh, tell you in a better manner okay so let's say you are in a hospital 
okay and which follows the first come first serve right like first in first out now you are all guys are in a queue and you went to hospital for a normal checkup okay consultants okay normal checkup now um so you are you are standing in a queue and suddenly all of a sudden someone came up with an accident okay met with an accident now there is only one doctor okay who is uh, whom you are going to check up for so now what what is going to happen he will stop the queue okay he will stop the line here and he will directly jump to the accident based why because he is the priority case right he is the one which has highest priority we need to give them priority so that is what a priority means okay so here in our case of priority queue everyone will be having some priority okay everyone let's say uh, like um, if we have taken politicians okay someone like mla mp and a uh, governor a cm and pm so everyone has their own priority okay if uh, like mla until this pm comes everyone is like cm is the top one we need to give them priority something like that okay so here we will be maintaining two queues two queues so one to maintain our data and one to maintain our priorities priorities okay so this is what a priority queue means so the one who, who is um, having a highest priority will be going first okay one who is having lowest priority will be going out so it can be vice versa as well like if your program wants to be like um, who is having a lowest priority they need to go to the first so it totally depends upon the application that we are using okay now so elements with higher priorities are processed before the elements with a lower priority that is what we have discussed in order to implement this a minimum of two queues are required one for data and another one for priorities so this is what and uh, another thing about a priority queue is so we have a concept called heaps heap data structure okay which we will be talking about in a later part okay so in heaps we have a max heap and min heap so mostly for to implement these things we will be writing periodic queues okay we will be using periodic queues so we'll talk about what is heap and what are these max heap and min heap in the last question which is in 40th question i guess okay we'll talk about that during that time so just as of now we will just we can implement max heap and min heap with the periodic keys that's it just keep that in mind now can we store duplicate key in the hash map so i guess we have answered this question earlier so we can't uh, store the like uh, we can't store the duplicate values in the hash map uh, if we try to do that it will override the values and keep only one copy that's it so this is what they are saying no okay duplicates keys cannot be inserted into hash map if you try to insert at any entry with an existing key then the old value would be overridden okay so old value would be overridden with the new value doing this will not change the size of the hash map right so we are just overriding so size doesn't matter so this is why the key set method returns all keys as a set in java since it doesn't allow duplicates now here comes the trees yeah so tree data structure what is a tree so so what is a tree so tree is recursive non-linear data structure as we talked about what is a linear and non-linear so tree comes under the category of non-linear uh, consisting of set of one or more data nodes okay where one node is designated as a root and remaining nodes are called as a children of a root so basically we again just like a uh, linked list node for tree as well we will be having a node okay node so you can consider this as a node and here every node uh, will be having three parts one is data and this is a right node pointer and this is left node pointer okay so every node will be having these three pointers they are saying that so at, for every tree we will be having one root 
so root means the topmost element the very first element that has been uh, created in the tree and all other if we of uh, if we have a one root node then all other nodes will be called as an either children's okay or uh, like sub tree kind of things okay so we'll talk about the terminologies and all in the later part now tree organize the data in the form of hierarchy manner so what is this hierarchy manner so if you can see like uh, let's say i have a uh, folder named a desktop okay under the desktop i have two folders one is a scala another one is personal okay and again in the, uh, this scalar a uh, folder i will be having few other folders let's say arrays like where i will be storing all the programs related to the array topic then linked list then trees and in personal i will be having let's say documents and uh, pictures and uh, videos and again in trees i will be having different topics if i say like um, a two point uh, okay a sliding window technique and uh, uh, queues or stacks kind of thing and even in trees as well we will be having different types like binary trees binary search trees avl trees red black trees okay so i will be storing something like this so can you tell me now this is going to look like as a tree right okay where we will be having one root that has a uh, desktop under that desktop we will be having folders so this is what hierarchy right so one two layers so on very first layer we will be having desktop then scalar and personal folders again folders again programs kind of stuff so this is what they are referring to as a hierarchy data structure so the most commonly used data structure is a binary tree and its variants so as i said we will be having different trees okay different types of trees okay i will name the few okay binary trees binary search trees avl trees and a uh, complete tree complete binary tree sorry <laughs> okay and a uh, b trees and a red black trees so these are also all called as a trees okay but different types of trees among all these trees binary trees and binary search trees are very very important okay and even binary trees are <laughs> more important than binary search trees if i wanted to put it in name here okay so if you are preparing or if you are aiming for big companies big tech companies or big product gate based companies then you should need to solve at least uh, 50 plus problems on binary trees so that is going to be a good count and you can able to solve the any problems and to learn binary trees or any trees then the request or uh, prerequisites would be recursion okay recursion for sure and some uh, hashing hashing we use hashing in few tree problems so yeah even this is secondary okay this is secondary like recursion is a must to learn the tree so if you if you wanted to are looking to learn tree topics and recursion please i have made a video on both trees and recursion where i will be solving few plenty good, good amount of problems starting from the uh, basics so you can watch it there as well now uh, let's come to the uh, applications of the trees so first applications are file systems we have seen this right so we have seen this um, application here so this one application where we will be saying that this is how our file architecture is being stored okay then comments on social media so what is comments on social media so if i say let's say someone has posted or uh, posted a picture post and i have commented and for my comment multiple people can comment it again yes and for again for comment multiple people can uh, comment it again right and can i say this is going to be tree structure yes okay and family trees so a family structure so where we will be having starting from the grandparents then parents then uh, we uh, generations and uh, then our next generations like children and so their children so this is going to be uh, like tree structure okay and uh, if you want uh, you can like they will be representing two things here so let me open my 
so uh, they we will be having a root okay let me take this out okay let me draw this here okay so we will be having first root a root okay so under this we will be having different uh, trees right so i will be writing binary tree here so um, here it is an nra tree so where we will be having uh, like different number of amount of uh, child to a particular root okay now this is a root this is a root and here this is called as edge so what is the edge so edge is being called as a connecting point to the one a level to the another level okay it creates a representation okay it creates a connection between two nodes and the data present in the a node is called as a key done done now these two okay like uh, for this particular root these two will be called as a siblings yeah siblings these two will be called as a siblings so what is a siblings so in general in real world we call um, like a uh, one level okay like if i say me and my sister we call as a siblings right so uh, we are belongs to one same generation you can consider this as one generation okay and then we have a parent okay and we have parent let's say if i want let's say if i want a parent of if i wanted to parent of these guys i can say that for these two this is the parent parent right and i can say that this is also another subtree okay subtree and the nodes which don't have any children the nodes which don't have any children are called as a leaves okay nodes which don't have children are called as leaves okay the subtree means a part of a tree a parent means uh, which has and uh, some children then that is called as a parent an edge means connecting point between the two nodes a key means a uh, data which is present inside a one particular node and the root means the topmost element where a tree has been begin a siblings means which belongs to the same generation or the which belongs to the same parent okay which belongs to the same parent so uh, we have discussed enough and um, yeah um now let's move on to the next question so what are binary trees yeah good question what are binary trees what is a binary what is a binary i can say that two either zero or one so when i say binary it is two right one or zero so this is what a binary tree means okay so uh, for each parent or for each root node we will be having two children at most two children at most okay so let's say i have a, a root okay let's say i have a and for a we will be having two children b and c okay and for b again i have two children for e and d and for c i have only one children called f and for f again i have two children so let's say g h okay and for e i have another uh, children called x so here you can you can if if i say if I, for each node each node we will be having at most at most two children then it is called a binary tree okay so a node okay a tree which has okay at most two children for every node then it is called as a binary tree so you can uh, you can consider these two diagrams as well okay so where uh, in in the first in uh, left hand side we will be having a normal tree okay where we will be having uh, three nodes here then again like uh, for again for everything we will be having again three so which is not a binary tree right which is not a binary tree so if you consider this tree so here we will have two nodes for this and for this we will be having two for this two for this two and for this we will be having zero 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 so i said at most two so it can be zero it can be one it can be two okay these are the three valid uh, things accepted so this is what a binary tree means
now let's move on to the next question so what is the maximum number of nodes in a binary tree of height k what is a height okay what is a height so let's say a height is the number of levels it has okay so from this it can be considered as a one height it can be considered as a one height two three okay like sorry three four okay this is a height of four okay now their their question is there will be having a height k and they are asking us to what is the maximum number of nodes that you can have for the height of k binary tree so let's see okay first let's try to draw the tree which has the uh, some minimum number okay let's say okay so i have this then two then three then i have this sorry three and uh sorry four five this six seven for this again i have eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen and fifteen so this is the height of tree okay three so here okay like um so until here one one and one okay so the height is three here okay the height is three so now tell me how many nodes are there can i say that 15 nodes so here it belongs to the eight it belongs to the four it belongs to and one so what is the one thing that you have identified so by increasing the one level at each time we will be going in a two power manner two power manner okay so for three size we will be having at max we will be having 15 nodes which is going to be 2 power k plus 1 so here k is 3 right so uh, 2 2 power 3 plus 1 is going to be 4 so 2 power 4 is 16 so and minus 1 so this is the formula that we can get yes so they are given something like that totally now write a recursive next question is write a recursive function to calculate the height of a binary tree okay height of a binary tree so let's take one binary tree here um 10 2 3 4 5 6 and 7 so in this case the height is uh, 3 okay the height is 3 so if I am currently standing at this particular node, if I am currently standing at this particular node, so um, can I say that the maximum left subtree, the height of maximum left subtree and the height of maximum right subtree plus one. So why plus one? I need to include this particular uh, uh, node as well, right? So can I say that uh, max of a left subtree okay sorry a max of left subtree comma right subtree plus one as my answer yes i can i can so by using this formula how can we write our code so for this we need to know a traversal we need to traverse through all the nodes of a tree yes all the nodes we need to traverse through all the nodes of a tree so how can we traverse through all the nodes so we have uh, three things okay to traverse through a, uh, all the nodes so which is we have two techniques one is dfs and bfs okay uh, dfs means a depth first search we will be first let's say we have a tree something like this so we will go till the depth wise like we'll reach till the leaf node and then we will go back and then we will come to the another way okay which means we will come to the start from the root come to the leaf then again we'll go to the another uh, way okay but in bfs manner we will be going in the fashion of breadth wise okay so one breadth two so breadth means horizontally dfs means vertically okay uh, so for this we have again under this uh, dfs again we have three things pre-order post order and in order okay pre order post order in order and we'll discuss about them in detail okay in later part now just uh, try to solve this particular problem 
then uh, we'll see okay so if I'm currently let's say I have three like this okay now first I will I will give the pass the argument as my root node okay which means I'm starting at here now what is the first thing that I need to check so I need to check if that particular root node is null or not if it is a null what does it mean I don't have any nodes okay so I can simply return 0 right so first thing check if root equal to null so if this is true you can simply return a 0 right if it is false if it is false what does it mean you need to go to the left subtree then you need to go to the right subtree and you need to check the maximum of them okay you need to get the maximum out of the left subtree and right subtree okay now let's say i will go here first i will go to the left side okay then i will calculate the height of this particular two okay again i will check okay i will make a recursive call okay you can see that here okay i will be making a recursive call and then i will check root is equal to null and no so i will go to the left subtree now left subtree now again i can check root is null or not so again i can see root is not null so i will go to the left now is there anything here no there is nothing so i will return zero i will return zero here okay i am done going to the left side now i will go to the right side and i feel that there is nothing here as well okay there is nothing here as well so the right uh, the right subtree of a 4 is going to return 0 now you need to take the maximum of for each node you need to take the maximum of left subtree right subtree and then you need to add the 1 which is a current level right so maximum of 0 and 0 is going to be 0 right now you need to add the 1 so 0 plus 1 is going to be 1 okay which is which is this Okay, the left subtree of 2 is going to return 1 okay and then you, you will be going to the left side right side of the 2 and again you will say that it will return 0 it will return 0 so you will return 1 so among 1 and 1 of 2 so left subtree of 2 is 1 right subtree of 2 is also 1 so if you take the maximum out of them you will get 1 and you will add the current node which is again 1 so 2 ok so I am going to the left subtree of 1 you will get a height of 2 done so now let's go on to the uh, right subtree so I will go here and I can see that there is a the, the root is not null so I will go to the left and then again root not so I will go to the left so here I will say it will return 0 and return 0 because it don't have any uh, left and right subtree so I will return 1 here right 1 now uh, it will go to the right which is a null okay it will return 0 so among 1 and 0 which means a left subtree and right subtree the 1 is the maximum 1 so it will return 1 plus 1 so 2 here now for 3 it will go to the right and there is nothing so it will return 0 and out of 2 and 0 2 is the maximum so it will return 2 plus 1 so which is a 3 done now for this again you will return 2 plus 1 which is a 4 done so for this the height would be the 4 done I hope you have understood so this is how like if you wanted to write the code for this you can check this out this is how you will be writing the code so write a code to count the number of nodes in a binary tree so they are asking us to write the code to check the how many number of nodes present in the binary tree okay let's say if i have a given a binary tree like this okay now how many nodes are present in this so one 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 so at max I have 9 nodes 9 nodes so my answer would be 9 here so can I say can I say if I want the total number of nodes here total number of nodes here then can I say that 
the total number of nodes at the left hand side plus the total number of nodes right hand side is going to be my answer plus one like so uh, count left side okay plus count right side plus one right so whatever uh, how many number of nodes are there in my left hand side it is going to return three and how many number of uh, nodes are there in my right hand sub tree uh, it will return five and uh, here i will do plus one for the current root nodes i i will do plus one so at the, at match it is going to be three plus nine sorry three plus six it is totally nine done okay so it is uh, simple okay you can try it on your own so this is the code that you can check it out so three table source okay as we have discussed there will be three traversal techniques now let's try to understand three traversals in this tutorial we will be learning about trees right from the basic so uh, what are the contents that are going to cover in this entire tutorial is different types of uh, trees available and binary trees and what are the techniques to travel cell in a um, particular tree and also we are seeing implementation of trees and implementation of travel cell techniques and coming to prerequisites it will be good if you know what is the structure and the class and to study trees the recursion is must and should okay so if you don't know what is recursion please go and watch my previous video which is made on a recursion and uh, yeah that's pretty much okay so let's get started oops before starting we do have few formalities to do so first one if you are visiting channel for the first time don't forget to subscribe if you like the content please hit that like button up and if you have any queries please let us know in the comment section now let's get started now let's get started with introduction to the trees so i can simply say that a tree is a non-linear a data structure what does it mean by non-linear so basically data structures has been classified into two types one is a linear data structures uh, like um, a linear data structures like uh, arrays linked list stacks queues okay and another types are a non-linear data structures so non-linear data structures means trees graphs why this is or called as an norm these are all called as an non-linear data structures basically a tree and graphs uh, stores the data in the form of hierarchical okay so what does it mean by hierarchical again so let's see so basically if there is something here okay if there is something here and data has been stored in, inside to that like whatever it stores it will be linked to that on top of that level okay now again for this level it might have something okay so it might be anything okay it can have n number of things okay so can i say that these are all one level one level these are all one level can i say that so these are all in one hierarchy so here one hierarchy then hierarchy it has something it has something it has something right so this is how the tree stores the data okay now by this means we are calling it as a hierarchical data structure now let's see uh, there are a few things that, uh, we, we need to know before starting the actual uh, tree representation or coding whatever it might be okay so first one a root okay so i will take a simple uh, tree okay now uh, then i will explain everything on that tree itself okay so let's assume we have a tree something like this okay now let's see so what is a root so a root can be defined something like this so root will be the starting point of the tree okay so here where did that uh, root has been started sorry tree has been started here right so is there anything on top of a no there is nothing in top of a is there anything below the a yes everything whatever the comes whatever the data comes that will be below the a so can i say that a will be my top so by that means i am calling it as a root okay now something parent now the next one is parent what does this mean by parent what does this mean by parent so a parent is a node okay so which has some chains okay let's see let's see let's see so i can say that a has this uh, b and a c okay so from a 
there are two things are coming okay so they are called as an chains okay chains so this b and c are chains of a okay so now these are the chains who will be called as a parent a right so it's a parent a and chains are b c and b of the chains of a cool root is a now what are all the other parents that you have you can see on this particular diagram so here can i say that b is a parent of d and e right so b is also a parent so can i say that g and h are uh, chains of c yes okay now is there anything is there anything below this d nothing so i can say that d is not a parent okay so that is what happens now the next one is so basically each uh, so i forgot to say everything will be called as an one node okay so this will be called as one node this will be called as a node okay this will be called as a node now a degree 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 of a node what is a degree of a node a degree of a node means the outgoing nodes number of outgoing nodes from that particular node let's say from c how many nodes are going like how many chains let's say chains okay so how many chains are there for c there are two chains right this is g this is a h so there are two chains for a how many chains are there again two okay now tell me if i add one thing to g something x okay now tell me what is the degree of a g it's a one i right? hope you got it right so it can i can say that a degree is something the number of the number of children it has okay particular node has now mm, parent done root done child done degree done and center so and center what is this mean by and center so and center is something like this okay so let me draw another tree okay so okay now can i say that for this particular node this is and center so the top okay the previous one where it has been generated okay now can i say that this is a and center of this particular node yes so let me tell you one simple trick okay so this will be your current generation okay so this will be called as a parent grandparent grand grandparent right so these are all the and centers of this particular guy okay now what are the and centers of this guy who are the and centers of this guy this one this one okay so who are the and centers of this guy no one because a root itself is the starting point okay so there will be no and centers for the root okay now if there is a and centers then there is there will be a descenders as well so who are called as a descenders okay the one the one uh, which it has uh, like the chains of that particular node okay let's see okay let's see so this is one thing okay now if i wanted to say who are the descendants of that particular node you can say that this guy and this guy i can say that right this is all now you can simply call as n so consider this as your parents okay parent okay now you might be having like he might have one daughter one son so something like that right so you can relate to that particular thing as well and the next one will be siblings siblings of a node let's say what are all the siblings okay so uh, the siblings means which comes from a same parent okay the nodes which comes from same parent let's say i have a tree something like this now for these two guys who is the parent the same one this one now can i say that these two nodes have came from same parent so by that means this will be this particular node will be an a sibling of this guy okay again it will be a vice versa as well so for this guy who is a sibling he might right so let's suppose he has another uh, node okay another child then for this particular node there are two siblings okay two siblings so this is how uh, things works and the next one is a leaf node leaf node leaf node what does it mean by leaf node a node which don't have any outgoing nodes okay a node which doesn't have any children's okay child nodes 
then we are calling it as a leaf node okay so here if you consider if you consider this particular node has no chains this particular node has no chains this particular node has uh, no chains and this guy this guy has one node this guy has one node this guy has one node this guy has two nodes this guy has one node again right so this is the okay so a last level of a particular a node okay will be called as a leaf nodes leaf nodes okay and and again internal node okay a internal can be defined as an a node which has at least one node one outgoing node or one parent or sorry one children is called as an internal node okay a node which has at least one children is called internal node okay now uh, let's see now there is another important term height and depth of a tree okay height and depth of a tree so in basic okay so height can be defined as an the max path from root to leaf node let's say i have a tree something like this okay i have something like this okay now tell me what is the highest path from starting from a root to leaf node okay now this guy this guy this guy so here i have path the which is very highest okay it, it has a four nodes okay four nodes path so if i consider this path it is only three it is only three right so here the, we have a four nodes four nodes so I, by means that we can say that number of nodes in a path minus one so then that will be your height okay so here we since we have four nodes involved in that particular path it's a n minus one okay four nodes minus one it's a three okay i can say that this the height of a this particular tree is a three okay now what will be the dip okay now let's say what is a dip okay you have a tree like this now if i wanted to uh, find if i wanted to find depth of this guy okay depth of this guy i can say that from root okay starting from the root what is the number of nodes involved in that particular uh, till that particular node so there were only one node which is a root right you, you, you can exclude this guy okay so now can i i can say that a depth from this particular uh, from starting from root to this particular node is a one now at the same time if you want to find this guy what will be the depth of this guy it will be two now it will be two so why because starting from the root till that particular node there are two nodes involved okay you can simply call it a path as well so one guy and two guy okay so you can consider that as well okay so that will be defined as a uh, depth pool let's discuss about a binary tree so binary tree is a very important tree which has been asked in many interviews okay so you can expect a lot of a tree questions from binary tree and binary search trees okay we'll talk about binary search tree later now we'll discuss about what is a binary tree so a binary tree is a node uh, a node or every node okay let's call every node in a tree in a tree must have at max of two children okay to a, a node so i'm saying that let's say you have a node okay it must have either zero or one or two children of the only okay let's say so we have a node and for this particular node we have two children this is valid okay we can have zero or one or two okay at max two no two children okay now we have a two it's valid now for this uh, particular node again we are having one node yes again it's valid now for this we have a two child nodes it is also valid now for this particular node we don't have any child nodes so the degree of that particular thing will be zero it is also valid okay you can consider these things as a degree as well degree of a every node should be less than two less than or equal to two okay now then we can say that it is a binary tree 
now again in binary tree we have a couple of types the first one is uh, first one is uh, full binary tree full binary tree or it can be called as a proper binary tree and strict binary tree as well okay a proper binary tree and a strict binary tree as well and then next one will be complete binary tree okay then the next one will be a perfect binary tree then a degenerate binary tree at last it's an balanced binary tree okay now we'll talk about each one of them okay so full binary tree means so a tree which has either which has either a zero or a two nodes or two children's then it will be called as an full binary tree let's say unlike a binary tree of our binary tree what are all the possible child nodes 0 1 and 2 okay so he, in this particular full binary tree we can say that one is not allowed okay so 0 okay so root and for this we have 2 and for this again 2 and for this particular node we don't have any child nodes it is a full binary tree okay we have only either 2 or a zero possibilities okay now let's say if i say just tell me is this a full binary tree or no this is not a full binary tree. just because of that fact that for this particular guy for this particular node we have only one node one child node so one is not allowed okay it has to be either zero or two okay in that by that means we can say that it's a full binary tree. now we'll see what is a complete binary tree a complete uh, there are certain rules to follow okay so first rule is all the nodes are completely filled except the last level okay let's see so if i have a tree something like this okay so before coming to this particular level we need to first fill this level okay so let's say so here here we missed out entering into this particular right of that particular node we have just uh, going in a left manner right so this is not allowed okay so before coming into this particular level you have to finish this level okay so let's say first i have to uh, fill the root then i have to enter the left okay then i have to enter the right okay so now it's completed because binary tree has only at most two things two channel nodes and now i need to start from the left okay left so for this guy yeah and this and now let's say i can't enter like this okay i can't enter like this just because i need to first before coming to right right side i need to first complete the left side of that particular node so i have to complete this then only i have to come like this okay now this is how a complete binary tree looks like okay now the second point is in last level all nodes must be as left as possible okay let's say we have another level okay so i have stopped here okay there are no nothing to enter in a tree okay nothing to push in a tree now so where this where that the where i'm ending at so i'm ending at left left most side of that particular tree you can say that right now that is what this second definition is now set third rule so the node should be added from the left so as i said earlier we need to start from the left side left side of the each level okay so this one is one level this is one level this is one level this is one level okay now for every time we are starting fresh a new line fresh level we need to start from the left side okay now that is a complete binary tree now let's see a perfect binary tree so now perfect binary tree can be defined like all the leaf nodes all the leaf nodes of particular tree should be in an same level okay same level let's say we have a tree like this now tell me what are all the leaves here this one is a leaf this one is a leaf this one is a leaf now all the leaves are in a one level no okay so this is one level this is one level this is one level so one leaf is in second level and all other leaves are in third level so this is not a perfect binary tree so how does that perfect binary tree looks like so like this so here all the leaves okay so this one is a leaf this one is a leaf this one is a leaf okay there is no another leaf so all these leaves are in 
same level so this is called as a perfect binary tree now the next one is degenerated tree okay degenerated binary tree so basically it's very simple okay so it, it, it looks like this okay it keeps on going at one end only okay so there is something like this as well it is going in a one side okay so let's say i have started from a root okay and then i move to right then i again 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 move to right now there is another possibility i have started from the root i have moved left then i have moved left then again i have moved left again i have moved left. so i am either i am going starting from the root and going in a left manner otherwise i have i am starting from a root and going in a right manner that's it okay so that is called degenerated let's see how to implement in a uh, binary tree in program okay so uh, in this particular thing i will be discussing the code of binary tree in uh, both a language like c++ and java okay let's see so a basical like a general binary tree something looks like this two and three and four and this will again have five and 10 and 11 okay let's assume so let's try to implement this particular binary tree in a program okay so i can say that this is one node okay so this is one node one node one node one node one node so everything is a node yeah so and what every particular node has like every node has some data and this particular node is pointing to something okay and this particular node is pointing to something so can i say that it is pointing two things one is a left one is a right yes now let's see how this particular thing will be represented so two it will have something like this okay now this a left okay so left thing will be pointing to again three so again which is a node okay so again three left is pointing to something called four again a three right is pointing to node five and right to the two is a ten again which is a node again right to the ten is eleven so here the things that you need to observe here is a, every node has something like data and a left pointer and a right pointer okay now let's first let's discuss about c++ code so how will you represent the same in c++ okay there is much difference between uh, both c++ and java code okay it's only syntactical changes let's see so in c++ uh, we will be using a struct to define a node okay so what it contains a particular node contains some data that is in the int format and again we have some both a left and right pointer can i can i say that again a left and a right pointers are nodes right again then what will be the type of these things again struct node star left struct node star right good yes now let's see how will you implement the same in java okay so in java you will you don't have any struct okay so you have to use a class okay a class node okay so you will have int data okay then here the type of a particular left and right are node node left node or right now so how to assign any data okay so we'll uh, we'll have it we have a concept called a constructor we use that concept to initialize the values to an node okay so how it looks like oh here a constructor name should be equal to either a struct uh, name okay so here the struct name is node and here the class name is a node okay so constructor name should be equal to that so int value okay so since we will be having some value like so while creating a particular node we have to pass that value to that particular given node okay now so we need to assign that value to data data equal to val now what will be our uh, left and right okay so just assume just assume so you are creating a node 
okay so since you are just creating a node of root you don't have any kind of uh, left and right right so you have to initialize them to the null okay so left right equal to null okay the same code goes in now uh, java as well a node into value so here you will be assigning uh, this dot data equal to val and both a left and the right equal to null okay in case of java your null should be capped okay you are done now you have created an uh, like definition for how to define an uh, tree node now how to assign a values to this let's see so we'll have a main class main so first you need to create an a root root of a tree so struct node star root equal to new node what if, what is the data of our node two like a root node it's a two okay so you will pass two here done so it will create an something like this done now so you need to create an left and right to that particular things now so how how will you do that so root left equal to so now you are pointing to here okay so root left so again it will be a new node new node of let's say three okay so you have created a three done so now you have you will be creating a left to the left okay so root left three three left four okay so you have to create something like this then how will you do that root left left equal to new node of four done now i wanted to create an right to this guy right to this three node okay so what will be the path so root left and root left right okay so root or left right equal to new node of five done now i wanted to create an uh, root right okay so i wanted to create something like this a root right of seven okay so how can i create a root uh, right equal to new node of seven that's it okay so this will form an tree something like this okay so done so there is not much difference between uh, c c plus plus and java code so here instead of uh, using this uh, things you will simply use a node and instead of this pointer symbols you will use a dot okay so that's it so you can try on your own as well so now let's see the traversal techniques of an uh, tree so what is a traversal so basically in arrays and linked list right from the zeroth index you will be going to the nth index so how you are using that how you are going that so by using for loop right so you will be initializing int i is equal to zero and i less than n and i plus plus so something like that so we need a something a similar okay to traverse in an a tree as well so what are they okay so we call them as a traversal techniques so we have our two things one is a bfs breadth first search and a dfs a depth first search okay so we'll see okay well we'll take some example one example and we'll try to apply these techniques on this uh, tree okay so we'll let's assume we have a tree like this okay so one and one to be right three four five six and eight now let's say so first we'll see the bfs so bfs what is a bfs so breadth first so breadth 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 right so I can say that this is one thing breadth this then this then this so similarly similarly can i say that we are going level by level so first we are printing first level then we are uh, visiting next level which includes a three two one three then these values of four five and seven and then this last level eight so simple right so breadth first in means so we are going a level by level so we are printing level by first we will completing the first level 
then we are going to second level and we are uh, seeing all the visiting all the values or uh, nodes in an particular level then we are going to the next level then we are going to the next level so this is the breadth first search now we'll talk about the depth first search okay so which is a very 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 important very 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 important okay so again in this particular uh, dfs we do have a uh, three types so pre order in order post order very very important okay so you can uh, do wonders in entries by using these uh, three things okay so you can solve many problems i can say that even i can say that without these things you can't solve a few most of the things okay most of the problems in entries okay let's see let's see one by one so before going into finding and how to traverse by using these things now you have to remember few things one is for pre-order pre okay pre so in in one particular node what are all the things we do have a data left and right okay so every node has these things now but with these things we are using uh, like we are traversing through the entire uh, tree okay let's say in pre-order first we are printing the root so when i say root it is the data root data okay now then left we are moving to the left okay left then we are moving to the right okay so first we'll do the whatever the data it has we'll visit that particular data then we'll go to the left okay then we'll go to the right of that particular tree okay, particular node okay so now what is about in order in order okay so it's a first we'll move to left then we'll move to root then we'll move to a right okay so in post order first we'll move to a left then we'll move to right then we'll move to a root so now we'll take an one example tree and we'll try to traverse uh we'll try to use these uh, three dfs techniques on that okay so let's assume we have a tree something like this two three five six seven eight 10 and 12 okay so let's take so first we'll solve start with pre-order what is a pre-order okay so pre-order uh, what are the rules uh what are the form of a pre-order so it's a root data and left and right okay now where, where do we start from we start from this particular a root okay so what is the formula r l r so here it's an root data okay root and this r is right okay so what is the first thing that we have it's a root data so whenever we have seen a root data we have to get that particular node data to the output board okay so here in this case here we have two okay so we'll print two here so by means that we have done with this particular r now what is the thing next thing it's a l so it means that it is stating that go to left side okay we'll move here now again we'll repeat the same task for this as well so first thing root data so we we'll have three now it is stating that go to left okay by going left we will we'll come here now r l r so now again it is stating that root data so you will have six done now again it is stating that go to left is there anything to the left it's a null there is nothing okay done with this l as well okay so since it's a null we are not going there okay now go to left right so is there anything to the right of the six or no so we are not going to the right as well so we are cancelling so done with that thing i can say that we are done with six okay now we'll go to the top whoever call this particular six okay it's a three so we are done with this l we have moved to l and performed all the operations right now we have to uh, go to right side of three so it's a seven now again we need to repeat the same task for 7 as well say r so it is stating that print the root data now go to left is there anything to the left is there anything to the left and uh, no is there anything to the right no right is there anything to the left no is there anything to the right and uh, no so we'll cancel that thing as well and then we'll go to the top whoever called this particular thing so we have visited the right as well so we'll cancel that Okay, now again from here we will go to top. 
so you have done this operation you have done this you have moved to right left as well now you have to go to a right side so you will come here so again you need to repeat the same task so first r so r means visit the data so it's a five now again it's a left so you will go here what is the left okay it's a again you will simply repeat the things so again you have eight then it is saying that goal left side there is nothing left okay now is there anything on to the right and no so we are cancelling and we are going to the top okay now currently you are here you are done with you have moved to left now you have to move to right okay so right is 10 so rlr okay now again first is data so we will print that 10 now it's a l so l means go left is there anything to the left yes there is to all right so you will move here and you will have lrl okay now again first is our data so you will print to all then again it is saying that left go left so there is nothing left again it is saying that going a uh, go right there is no, uh, nothing on to the right of the tool so by means that we have completed this particular node as well now we'll go to top whoever call this now we are done with l now we left with this r so is there anything to the right to that particular 10 no so we have completed that and we have completed this node as well and we'll go to the top okay so we have completed the r as well okay these are all the r right now we'll go to the top we have completed and we have completed the r so now check so we have uh, nothing to visit we have done with all now check whether all the we have visited all the nodes of a tree or not okay so first thing two then three then six then seven then five then eight then two all ten so done we have visited we have visited the all the nodes on a tree so this is how a pre-order works now let's see the in order okay in order so became little mess okay let me draw the tree again now we'll try to uh, see the in order travel cell of this particular tree okay so what are the in order travel cell rules first you have to go to left then you have to move to root data then you have to move to right okay so let's write these things l r r okay second thing is a root okay now first it is saying that go to left okay go to left now again you will have l r r so again it is stating that go to left again you will have l r r now is there anything to the left of six no so it means that we are done with left now what is the next thing it's a root data so whenever you have seen root data you have to print that out like whatever the node value you have to print that in the output board so here it's a six okay so by means that we have completed the all now it, it is saying that go to a right is there anything to the right no okay so we have completed this and we'll go to the top okay now we are done with left now what is the next thing it's it is saying that print the data of the particular node so here the node data is four okay we are done with this R. now it is stating that go to a right okay so we'll come here now we'll again have the llr okay now first thing it is saying that go left is there anything left no now the second r is a root right root data so you have to print the seven now it is stating that go to right is there anything right to the seven no done we'll cancel this then you will go to top so you are done with second r then you have done with third r as well so you have visited you have uh travels the entire subtree of this left side now we'll go to the top now we are done with this r ll sorry now we'll try to see this r so here a root data so whenever you have seen root data you have to print that particular node data so it's a two now we are done with the second r now we have to go to the right side now you have to repeat the same task l r so it is saying that go to left first okay so you will come here okay now it is same is there anything to the left no and next one is our root data so what is the data here 10 so we will print 10 here so is there anything to the right no so completed go to the top to call this particular thing now you are done with the left then what is the second thing you have to print the data so it's a 5 now it is saying that go a right side okay you will come here so it's a 12 okay sorry l r r okay now you will say 
go left again. So is there anything to the left of tool? Yes, it's a tattoo. Okay, you will come here. Now, it say is there anything to the left? No. Then it is a print. It is saying that print a root data. So we'll print thirteen. Then it is saying that go right. Is there anything to the right? No. So since you are done with this, then you will go here. So we are done with the left. And what is the next? We have to print the root data. So it's a twelve. Now it is saying that go right. Is there anything to the right of twelve? No. There is nothing to the right of twelve. So we have visited this as well, and you will go to here five. Now you are done with L. You are done with R. You are done with this R. You have a uh, more to write as well. So I have done this. Done. So did we covered all the nodes? So six, four, seven. So let's count eight. Okay. So eight. Yes, we have covered the all the visitor. We have visited the all the nodes in an array. Now what is what is the last order? So it's a post order. Now again we'll take another example and we'll see. So it's a two, three, five, four, seven, six, eight, and ten. Okay. Now we'll try to find the post order traversal of this particular trip. So what is the post order travel? It's first go left, then go right, then go root data. Okay. So L R R. Okay, so here R means the second R. Uh, second thing is a right. So last we are having a root data. So make sure you don't confuse. Okay. Okay. Let's start. So first it is saying that go left. Okay. So we'll come here again. We'll say R R. Then we'll go again. It is saying that go left. L R R. Now again it is saying that go left. Is there anything left of four? Or no. Now it is saying that go right. Is there anything to the right of four? No. Then it is saying that root data. So we have to print that data here. So it's a four first. Now you are done with this. Then you will go here. Okay. So you are done with left. Now you have to go to a right. Okay. So here right means seven. So yeah. So is there anything to left of seven? No. Is there anything to right of the seven? No. The last one is a root data. So it's a seven. Uh, now you are done with this. Then you will go here. Now you are done with this right as well. Now you have a root data, so it's a three. Now we'll go to the top. You are done with this three. Now you are done with this left. Now you are, you have to go to the right side. Okay. Now it is saying that go left again. So you will come here. Now is there anything to the left of six? No. Is there anything to the right of six? No. Is there any, is that? So you are, you are, you have to print the data. So it's a six. You have done with this node, then you will go here. So it's a five. So you are done with the left. Now you have to go to the right side. So first thing you will come here, and it is saying that go left. Okay, go left. So it's a ten. Okay, so is there anything to the left of ten? No. Is there anything to the right of the ten? No. It is saying that print that node. So it's a ten. Done. Now you will come here. Okay. So it is saying that go left. So done left. So it is saying that go right now. So is there anything to the right of the eight? No. Okay. Now it is saying that print the root data. So what is the root data? Eight. Now done with this. I will go here. Now we have more to left. We have more to right. Now we have to print the data of no. It's a five. Now done with this. Now we'll go here. We have more to right as well. Now it's a root data. So it's a two. So how many nodes are there? Totally eight. So we got eight. So this is how we'll travels these things uh, in entry. Okay. So again, I am saying that these are all very very important. So if you don't understand, please make sure that uh, take another example tree. Try it on your own. Okay. Try it on your own. Solve uh, to do take to do three examples and try to write the in order, pre order, post order traversals of that particular tree. Okay. Now we'll see the a uh, code of this how like implementation details of a this particular travel cells now let's see how to implement an at this the travels in an in c++ okay in c++ so there is no big difference uh, between a c++ and java code okay so if you have, could have understood c++ logic then you can easily implement a java logic if you know recursion okay so let's see first we'll start with pre order what are all the of rules of uh, pre-order so first we need more to sorry 
first root then left then right right so this is the pre order travel journal. so let's say now tell me one thing tell me tell me so this is the root okay so we need to start from here so i will have a function like this void pre order where i will be taking a node star a root okay root now tell me so let's assume if that particular given node is null okay if that given root is null what do you need to do you need to simply return like nothing nothing to return okay so like you won't have anything okay, let's say if root equal to equal to null you will simply just statement like a return okay you are not returning anything that's simply return that's it now if that is not the case if that is not the case if root is not null what you are going to do so first thing will print the root data in your output so see out a root data okay root data okay root data now tell me so we are done with this part now what you need to do you need to go to a left subtree right a left subtree so let's go there so again tell me after going to the left subtree what you need to do you need to do the same task what you did for root right so I can call a pre-order of root of left now my root will become a 3 okay now my root will become a 3 now again I will uh, check with whether root is null or not so if it is null I will simply return that's it if it is not null I will print a 2 then 3 then I will go to the left of 3 so I will come here now again I will do the same task again I will do the same task first I will print the file then I will go to the top uh, I will check now I will go to the left of this 5 now left of 5 is null so here my root is currently null so I will simply just return from that okay so if I return I will come here now what is the statement so after returning to the 5 so here we are done with the root we are done with the L now we are we have to do with go to right pre-order of root to right that's it now again after going into right side I will find that again my root is null so I will simply return from there okay so I am done with this now I will go here I am done with uh, left of this now I have to go to right of this now again I will do the check for root equal to null no it's not null so I will go come here so I will print a root data so root data is 6 now I will come to the second line here now I can say that go to a left okay so after going to the left it says that it's a root is null now okay so you, you will come to here now i am saying that go to a right right go to right so again the root is null there is nothing to do now you will come back to previous node you will come back to who call that's how you will get to here three right so after coming to three you are done with everything right so you have visited r you have visited l then you have visited right as well so done so you will go to here now you are done with uh, r done l done you have to go to r side so right side so you will come here now r l so again root so it's a 4 okay you will print 4 then you will move to left side again you will print the 4 7 okay then you will move to left you find out that there is nothing left on the left of the 7 so go and then you visit the right side of the 7 there is nothing then you are done you will come here so you are done with the left so you will move to a right so you will go print 8 then you say nothing you will go to 4 then you will go to 2 done so this is how pre-order code should looks like now let's go simply we can quickly write the code for in order so only one change right only one change what is that change what is that change so if root equal to equal to null what we will do we'll simply return from there if not if not first we need to move to in order l r r so this is a root so we need to first move to left of the root so root a left okay now what you need to do 
now you need to print the data after moving to which a root data okay now after doing this you will move to right side so in order root right that's it right that's it now now the one which is left is void post order again you will have a more star root if that root is a null if root equal to null you will simply return if not in all other cases you will first you will move to left side so post order root left then after moving to the left you will move to next right so post order root right after moving to the right at last you will print the root data root data done so let's discuss another question question number 29 so the question number 29 is binary search tree what is this binary search tree so it is also in binary tree it is also a binary tree for sure and but it will have few conditions okay it is a binary tree but it will have few conditions what are the conditions so if we have a root like this okay and all the right okay all the right side to the root elements must be greater than greater than root data and all the left side all the left side must be less than a root data right so this is the condition and which is also in binary tree so we know what is a binary tree so a binary tree is a tree which we can have at, at most we can have two children okay so valid is zero we can have zero children we can have one children and we can have two children so at max two and uh, what is a binary tree binary search tree so binary search tree is a combination of binary tree with some conditions okay so what are the conditions so if we have a root and all the left side nodes of a root uh, must be less than the root data and all the right side um, nodes of a root must be greater than the root data okay and if it has followed that condition then we can say that it is a binary search tree now let's try to implement one binary search tree so let's say we have given this data one uh, five seven three uh, let's make it 10 here not one and a uh, 12 and 13 and um, 4 and 18 okay we have given this particular array then we need to uh, uh, try to uh, write and binary search tree for this particular array now first element is 10 so first at max we will check if the root is null or not yes a root is null so whatever data we get as a first will be picked in that as a root done then we will move on to the next guy so which is a 5 so now what is a 5 so 5 is um so i will check first the root is null or not so here root is not null we have 10 here now and then i will check the condition so whether this 5 is less than the root uh, node or root data or greater than the root data so i found that 5 is a less than the root data so i will keep that as a my left node done now let's assume i have 17 okay now i have 17 so a root is not null okay now what i will do i will check whether which is greater than or less than so i find that a 17 is a greater than 10 so i will say 17 to the right side okay now i will go to the 3 so a root is not null and i will go to the left side again uh, which is 3 is less than right so i will go to the left side again i can see that uh, left to the 10 is also not null so i will say again i will check left to the 5 right left to the 5 so which is a empty now i will say put it here now i will go to 12 so uh, 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 root is not null then i will uh, total is greater than so i will come to the left right side and then i can find that right side is also not null so i will check whether 12 is less than or greater than the 17 so i find that 12 is less than 17 so i will keep this at the left side now the 13 
what is it 13 so I will check from the root not null okay so 13 is greater than 10 so I will have to come to the right side so I found that right side is also not empty then I will say check whether uh, 13 is uh, less than or greater than 17 so which is an less than so it has to come to the left side so again at the left hand side which is also not empty now again I need to check whether 13 is greater than 12 or less than 12 I found that which is a greater than 12 so I will go to the right hand side which is a empty so I will put it here now I have 4 now I have 4 so uh, 10 it has to come to the left side of the 10 so which is not empty here again I have 5 so uh, 5 is uh, 4 is less than 5 so I have to come to the 3 now again which is not empty so now I will compare with 3 so I can see that 4 is greater than 3 so 4 now I have 18 so I will start here root is not empty root right is not empty root uh, so then uh, I can find that uh, 18 is greater than 17 so I will come to the right which is an empty done so this is how you construct an binary search tree now if you can observe if you can observe all the all the right left subtree or uh, values are less than root and all the right subtree values are greater than a root and if you can pick up any parent any parent you can see this particular formula so for 17 the left side we will have 12 which is a less than 17 and right side we have 18 which is a greater than 17 so this is the thing that we need to follow okay this is called a binary search tree now let's move on to the next question now what is a AVL tree so AVL tree is also in binary, binary tree but which follows an height balanced okay height balanced binary tree what is this height balanced so basically we will be having height right let's say I have a uh, node like this okay I have three like this okay and uh, here it is saying that height balanced so for every node for every node to its left and right subtree height should be okay if you subtract okay if you subtract then uh, like uh, let's say let me write okay current uh, balance equal to height of left subtree minus height of a right subtree must be must be must be equal to the either of minus 1 0 plus 1 okay so if the if this current balance equal to any of these three minus 1 0 or plus 1 then it is an AVL tree if not if not then this is not an AVL tree okay we should convert that as a AVL tree by swapping the nodes okay so this is what an um, AVL tree is okay so AVL trees are height balanced BSTs uh, AVL tree checks the right of uh, height of a left and right subtrees and assumes the the difference is not more than one okay the difference is called balance factor and is calculated as a height of left subtree minus height of right subtree done now uh, we have a, a print uh, left view of binary trees let's see the question number 31st so print left view of any binary trees okay so you will be given in a binary tree okay you need to print the left view what is the left view okay let's say if you are given this particular tree and you are standing here okay, you are standing here now what are all the nodes that you can see here from here so this is the node which you can see this is the node this is and this is the node which you can see so uh, so now what are all the nodes that you can see you can say that 2 sorry 4 2 1 9 right so this is called left view and if they were asked you to find the right view then what could be your answer 4 6 7 and 9 4 6 7 9 for right for left this is the answer so if you observe can I say that let's consider this as one level one level one level one level can I say that in each level in each level 
you need to print the very first element the very first node that you can visit so here for this particular uh, level your answer would be 4 for this particular level your answer should be 2 for this particular level your answer should be 1 then 9 is this what my left view yes so if I print the last node okay if I print the last node in each of my level then it could be my right view yes can I turn this particular question to like that as well so now how to write the logic to print all the left left view nodes of an binary tree okay so please pause the video for a while okay think of it now we'll see one approach okay where can we, we can uh, do something like that so we have uh, studied about map right hash map so uh, in this particular hash map we can store all the nodes okay let's say I will I will call this as a one level okay so uh, for zero for zero this is an zero level this is an first level this is a second level and this is a thrall level right now so for each level for each level if I'm visiting if I'm visiting the level for the first time okay if I'm visiting level for the first time and whatever a node that I am getting can I say I can put that in my map so le let me do uh, some dry run here okay so let's pick up a tree so 4 2 6 and 1 and 3 here it's a 5 and here it's a 7 and it's a 9 now let's say currently my level uh, while passing I will pass this root node and I will pass my level as a 0 and uh, let's put some map here okay map so uh, as of now map is empty okay now first i will come here i mean and i will just check whether my root is null or not if it is root null then i don't have any nodes in that particular tree so i should return the empty okay so in this case the uh, our root is not null so what we can do so and i will just check okay before going on to the other part okay i will just check if my the level okay level can uh, is there in my map or not so my, what is my level now level is zero so which is not there right so i can say that so just put so level and put that particular node data what is the node data here it's a four done done now uh, we have seen the traversal techniques right so we let's move on to the another guy okay to the left side now while moving on to the left side i should do level plus one so currently my level is zero now my current level is one so now i will just check first whether root is null or not so root is not null what does it mean it means that it has some data so we should traverse that so before moving on to the next uh, left and right uh, what what should i do i should just check whether this particular level has been already visited or not okay and what is the level now it's a one okay level is equal to one now so here level is equal to zero now level is one is not occurred earlier so what does it mean i'm visiting it for the first time so i should put that so what is the data it's a two okay done now i will go to the left again now the uh, this time level is going to be two now this level is not occurred earlier not visited earlier so i will do uh, 2 and 1 now uh, both are empty so no need to traverse them then I will go to the top again and then I will go to the left sorry right okay right now what is the level here again it's a level is 2 okay so currently here a level is 1 from this particular node we have called level plus 1 so it is level is equal to 2 now tell me if I search level is already occurred so two is two level is already there so i should not modify the value okay i can just ignore that and will continue with my process so there is no right no left there is no right there is no left so i will go to the top down and i will go here now from level zero here now it's a level zero plus one it is going to be level one here 
right now i can say that is there level one in my map yes already there so i won't do any modification of there so simply go to there so again it's a level two so level two there yes level through there now again i have left here so i will come here so it's a level three now now tell me is there level three in my map no not exist so what i can do level three uh, like a three key and it's a nine done now i don't have any left and right so i can simply go here and from here there is no right and left okay i can again go come here and i can go here so uh, from level one plus one it's a level two now already level two has been occurred so i won't modify that so there is no left no right here okay done so uh, i'm done with all visiting all the trees okay now what are all the values are there in my map four two one nine is this what the left view of a binary tree which we have taken yes so done done this is our answer right how so are you able to do this on your own now just try for just try for uh, so we have a, a wrote this thing for left view now try for right view try for left right view so uh, what what is happening for the right view so you need to you need to store the node data which is been occurred at the last at the last which is visiting at the last so when can we visit at the last so it is what uh, like so whatever the data you are seeing whether it irrespect of it is already visited or not you need to keep on modifying your data right let's say let's try it out as well so we'll take the same thing four two six one three five seven and three okay now so here currently level is equal to zero let me put my map here uh, so now uh, level zero is not visited so i will put that here and my data is four now i will go to the left side okay now what is happening uh, i have been my this is going to be level one and which is not occurred earlier so i will put that as a two now i will go to the level two which is also not visited so far so i will put level two as one okay so there is no right no right so i will go to the top from here i will go come here again it is going to be level two yes level two now i need to i need to uh, level two has already been visited okay uh, for the first time but we are searching for an element which is been visited at the last so until until whatever the data has been put so far we need to modify that okay so we'll modify this level two with the second value sorry it's a three now okay three yeah three now now uh, we are done with this so there is no ref and no right here so we'll go to the top from here we'll go to the here now uh, from we are done with this as well so we'll go to the right side now this is time for the level one okay level one has been already occurred right so what we need to do we need to modify the data as to the six yes done now again we'll come to the left side okay if i come to the left side it is going to be level two so level two has already been occurred but i need to modify that modify to the five now again i have left so it's going to be level three level three is not occurred earlier so i will put level three as nine and there is no left no right so i will go to the top now from here i will go to the right so there is no right so from here i will go to the top and from here i will go to the right now this time it is going to be level two so level two has already been occurred but i need to modify that the data currently which is seven okay which is seven now done there is no left no right okay go to the top and from here i'm done with this go to the top and this is what i have so what what is the data i have four six seven nine is this my right view yes i'm done okay if you want to write this as a code you can simply write uh, this as something like this okay let's say uh 
left view and I am taking a root and a level okay and I will just check if root double equal to null what does it mean you should return simply zero that's it else like if not you need to check whether your map contains the particular level or not so map dot a uh, contains uh, is for Java if you are C++ coder it is going to be uh, this uh, find okay contains a level so it will return either true or false here yeah? so if it is contains then it should return true okay so when and only if you get false then you need to put okay mp dot put uh, what is the level comma or root data okay and in all other cases you need to go to the left sorry uh, left and uh, left while moving on to the left then you say left view or uh, root to the left and a level plus one so here it's a point okay so since it's a java it's in class based okay now it's a if you are moving right uh, left view uh, root dot right and level plus one so at the end just return okay like uh, this map is going to be either uh, you can pass it as a reference or it you can take that as a global variable so at the end you can traverse through all the uh, values which are there in the map then you will get it okay this is one way okay this is one way um, there is another way where you can maintain a global variable okay global variable called uh, max level so you know that uh, you will be visiting each node for the first time so if you are uh, you will be initializing your uh, max level as minus one in the beginning and uh, if you are visiting like uh, so instead of this particular code instead of this particular code you can just check if your max level less than current level okay so you are, you have initialized max as global variable okay then what you can do you can update your max level equal to current level and you can uh, like uh, you can just print c out c out root data or if they ask you to return the all the left view nodes in the form of a vector then you can just create a uh, take a vector like uh, output output dot pushback root data okay so in this case you are not using an extra memory here okay so uh, you are eliminating this uh, map that's it and uh, you guys know sometimes a map will take a uh, login time so in this case yeah it mostly be go off one but yeah and uh, this is using dfs technique okay and if you wanted to use bfs technique even that you can try out as well so uh, in this case you will be using q okay so try it out okay we have discussed how to uh, print all the nodes using bfs technique right so try it for this particular problem now let's move on to the next problem yes what is a graph data structure what is a graph so a graph is a type of non-linear data structure that consists of vertices and nodes connected by edges or links for storing data okay edges connecting the nodes may be directed or undirected so here uh, we'll discuss that okay so here let me draw the same thing again so a then a to b and a to e uh, C. okay now uh, this is a graph you can consider this as uh, one uh, like uh, area in your uh, city and you can consider this as one area this as one area this as one area and this as one area so now let's try to relate this thing okay if you are standing at uh, area some a okay now from this you will be having two choices okay two streets okay if you are standing in a circle you will be having two choices either if you can go in this particular path you can reach to the b if you go in this particular street you will reach to the e okay so again from e again you have a path to the d okay you can either reach to 
D. Okay, or A. So if you come back in the same path which you have ended, okay, which you have came till now. And from B, if you have visited in this particular path, for B as well, you can if you if you follow the same path which you have came in, then you will be reaching to the A. And uh, if you have uh, chosen different path, you will be reaching to the C. Now from D as well, uh, you can you have uh, three choices either B, E, C. So you can again you will be having two choices either you can go to the B or you can go to the C and you can traverse to the same path which you have coming from. Okay. So here you can consider this as a H. This is called as a H. What is this? So this H helps us to connect the two vertices or two nodes. Okay. This C is called as an either what is or a node okay now uh, this is what a um, graph means and yeah we have seen directed and indirected so basically a graph will be of two types okay a directed graph undirected graph what does this mean okay so directed means let's say i have a all the edges which are representing some path so um So now here there is some directions right where edge is representing two. So from A now you can go to only to the B. Okay, you can't go to the E because there is no path here. So the path here is you can traverse from E to A only. Okay. So it, you can see this arrow marks, right? So this arrow mark represents the directions which you can traverse to. So this is called directed graph. And this is called undirected graph. Undirected, it is a directed. Okay, so directed means where you your edges will be pointing to the the node which you can traverse from the current a vertex. And uh, undirected graph uh, won't have any directions. You it means like it's a bidirectional. You can either go and you can come back on the same path. Okay, that's it. And the next question is. What are the applications of data structure, graph data structure? So, which means where can we use data, uh, graph data structure? So, graphs are uh, used in a wide varieties of applications. Some of them are as follows. Uh, social network graphs to determine flow of information in social media websites like Facebook, LinkedIn. So, this is the one of the major application, major application of a graph data structure what it is social media what is social media how how graph is being used in social media so everyone uses social media nowadays even i know like when i was in my very first year i don't even know why i use facebook but i don't know what is being happening over there so whenever i was I started studying a graph i got to know that yes this is the algorithm where they were using so now let's say let's say profile a okay there is a profile a and profile a has around uh, let's say two friends okay two uh, let's say let's put it as a undirectional only so two uh, three friends b c and d and again b will have a few more friends yes so let's say uh, you can call them as a e f and even B and C are also a friends. Okay. Now a C and um, like C has few friends. Okay. H and D and a G. Now, so how does the social media work? So let's say A has posted uh, one post. Okay. So I have posted A has posted some photo. Now it will reach to the B. It will reach to the B c and d okay suppose if suppose b has liked this particular post or commented this particular post now this particular post will be shown to the e f means all the all the people all the connections of a b as well so this is how a social media work suppose if d has commented or posted your post okay a's post then uh, the friends of friends of D can friends of D can see the post okay the friends of friends of friends of this of connection has been made 
okay this is how social media is been working even the one of the uh, major um, application of uh, graph is google maps google maps let's say we have a bangalore and mumbai and some hyderabad and pune and uh, these are all the cities that you have and you need to go to the goa let's assume okay so uh, i don't know what is the minimum path but let's take okay let's assume few things so uh, from bangalore okay from bangalore to uh, i just wanted to go to the ba uh, goa okay now let's assume the path is i need to come to the mumbai and i can go to the goa now let's say mumbai to bangalore it will take two hours of flight journey and from mumbai to goa it will take two hours of flight journey flight journey and uh, there is another option for me if i can come to pune then from pune as well i can go to Mo or goa so let's say from bangalore to pune it will take uh, three hours so and pune to goa it will take two hours again now now from uh, there is another path okay from bangalore to hyderabad it will take a uh, one hour and hyderabad to goa uh, it will take uh, two hours now my question is if i take which path okay which path i can reach the goa in minimal time now this is the question okay the answer is up to you okay this is how a google maps works right so where you you can you will be having different options but a uh, google map is suggesting you the best path okay that you can reach the your end destination in a minimal time right so here in this way you will choose this particular path right from bangalore you go to the hyderabad from hyderabad you go to the goa so uh, here what is the amount of time that you are uh, taking it's at 3 hours which is the minimum among all the path if you have went in this particular path it should have taken 4 hours if you have taken this particular path it could have taken 5 hours so if you you are following this particular path it will take 3 hours so this is how this is how a google maps works and this is where and um, your graph data structure comes into picture so this is called as an uh, shortest uh, shortest distance as well okay uh, uh, you will be having different algorithms for this like digixtra okay and um, yeah so you will be having different options right there and uh, we will be having different algorithms as well based upon that it will be recommending the uh, minimum time okay so and second one is neural graph neural networks graph where a nodes represent neurons and edge represents synapses between the them so our uh, neural networks are the one of the applications of artificial intelligence or category of artificial intelligence in that as well we will be using concept of data structure sorry graph data structure and transport grids where a stations are the nodes and routes are the edges of the graphs so this is the example which we have shown and power or water utility graphs where vertices are connection points and edge the wire or pipes connecting them so if this is a true real world problem <laughs> okay so like a, a water line or a power lines okay and the shortest distance between two endpoint algorithms so this is where so if i wanted to go to goa from bangalore so this is where shortest distance come picture now let's see the ne next question so how how do you represent a graph so yeah we have a uh, two ways to represent a graph one is adjacency matrix and another one is adjacency list so adjacency matrix will contain only zeros and ones okay where a zero represents uh, there exists a edge and a zero exits um, represents no edge okay if you observe here so we have a p q r s t okay now uh, so uh, we will be taking like vertices into a vertices matrix like if we if you taken this example we will be having five vertices and we will be having five uh, so we need to take five into five matrix so p q r s t p q r s t now wherever there exists a path just put it as a one over there so p to q there is there exists a path so p to q you will put one and also since it's in direction okay 
directed uh, undirected graph you need to put the uh, both the cases like p to q q to p okay so q to p as well you will put a one okay now this is how you fill this particular matrix and there is another way okay what is that way so is adjacency list so mostly people uh, prefer this over um, adjacent matrix over matrix okay uh, it's an easy to accessible and little efficient as well so here what is the thing so you will you will take an hash hash map like kind of uh, vector of array okay let's say if you have taken a array like this so where you will be having all your uh, vertices like pq or st okay then you will create a vector here for each node where you will be putting all your uh, path okay from p to q you can go from p you can go to q as well so you will create q okay and it's a directed graph okay there is okay so, yeah is this is a directed graph means you you can go to the only the way which uh, where you will your arrow will be pointing towards okay now from p you can go to r as well okay so you will put a r here that's about the p now let's go to the r okay so from r you can go to the s that's the only choice you have so s now from q you can go to yes you can go to t okay yes and t done done, done. now from s you can go to p you can go to s itself okay so you can go to p you can go to s and you can go to t as well okay and from t you can't go anywhere so it's an end here okay this is how an um, adjacent adjacency list looks like okay now we'll try to code uh, this all of this whatever we have seen so far and also we will there is a concept called graph traversal techniques okay so what is this graph traversal techniques graph traversal techniques so these graph traversal techniques are dfs and bfs what are these so we will be given this graph right like how to traverse through entire graph okay traverse means where we can go to each and every node in case of graph okay so for that we will be having two approaches one is dfs and one is bfs so a dfs follows a recursive approach and bfs follows an iterative approach and a bfs uses data structure called q and a dfs since it's a recursive approach it will use a stack okay now we'll try to understand what is this graph cell techniques and how to uh, write uh, how to code them and how to uh, represent our graph in adjacency matrix and adjacency list in this tutorial we will be learning about graph traversal algorithms and namely bit first search and depth first search so coming to prerequisites uh, it will be good if you know how to represent a graph using either java or c++ but in this particular uh, video i will be coding in c++ okay so yeah without wasting any time let's get started before starting if you are visiting channel for the first time please don't forget to subscribe and if you like the content please hit that like button up and if you have any queries or questions please let us know in the comment section now let's first discuss a bit first search then we'll see our uh, depth first search okay so probably if you have seen my earlier video which was on trees you might end up hearing this word called a bfs over there so yes like what is the difference so in this video we will be talking about graph so the same topic now bfs so there also bfs here also bfs both are same right no okay so these are all different because the data structure has been different so trees and graphs so again so you might if you know what is a graph earlier so you might think that yes we do have nodes here we do have adjacencies here like we do have edges and we will travel from one edge node to another node okay that's it right so yes but the difference is in trees usually there will be no cycles so what is a cycle let's say you have a node like this okay you have a tree something like this 
so now you will start visiting from here okay you will go here then you will go here then you will go here again you will come here again so it is never ending process right just because of the fact that you never see a root which is a null right so it will go in an infinite loop or infinite recursive calls now what is the solution so basically so you won't see this kind of situation in trees okay but in graph we do have that situation okay so where you will be having cyclic graphs okay so graphs are being we have a different graphs okay directed and directed cyclic and acyclic graphs so here we need to handle both okay so for that we are having something special for graphs okay so let's see so first we'll have a we'll see one example where we can find bfs uh, for that particular graph we'll see couple of examples until we get some familiar about how bfs works in a graph then we'll jump on to the logical then we'll see coding part okay let's start so let's see you have a, a graph like this so one and two then four and five okay so from here you will have a so here then here okay now first you will start from here one okay you will visit this guy and let's assume this is your output okay now tell me what are all the adjacents to the one these are all the adjacents so what is meant by adjacent so the nodes are vertices so basically we call these particular things as a vertices in a graph in tree we call them as a nodes okay so here can i say there is some path from one to two and one to three so if there exists a path then i can say that they are adjacencies okay so from from one there is a path from two two okay uh, from one there is a path to two and three so i will first visit one then i will go to two then i will visit three okay then now what is the next element so uh, i will go to two okay and i will travel okay i will go to all the adjacencies of two okay what are all the adjacencies of a two it's a four five and one okay so did we visited one already yes we have seen one already so we'll print four and five done so now we will go to three so what are all the adjacencies of three it's a one and five so we have visited one already here and we have also visited five two done three done one done four done five done okay so we have visited five as well okay now you will go to four okay what are all the adjacencies of a four two uh five a six okay so you have visited two you have visited five right so you will left with six so you will add a visit here like you will visit that particular six now now it's a five so what are all the adjacencies of a five three six four two okay three six four two so you are done with two you are done with three you are done with four you are done with six so you won't add anything okay from you will at last you will come to six what is a six so what are all the adjacencies of a six four five okay so you have visited four already you have visited five already so can i say that now on this node i have visited all the nodes visited all node all vertices done okay so hope you got some idea how bfs works now we'll see another example okay another good example so that you will get some clear picture about how this bfs algorithm works okay so let's uh, take another uh, tree and we'll see so graph sorry one have two and three and for two you have a four and for a two there is a five as well and there is a cycle and you have a another node yeah and surprisingly and surprisingly we have another a uh, graph here let's say 7 and 8 okay 7 and 8 so is this a valid graph you might have a, that question is this a valid graph yes this is a valid graph so basically this entire graph will cause a one component and this one entire graph will cause as another component component graph okay so there will be lot of questions like there is some uh, important questions based upon this uh, component graphs okay so hopefully we will see them in next videos so here now let's say i will start with one okay i will start with one 
so i will put a one here now what are all the adjacents to the one it's a two one three so i will pick up a two now i will go to all the adjacents of a two so who are all the uh yeah three so now i will go to adjacents of three so it's a five four one okay so one is already visited five and four so you will have a five and four done so i have completed one i have completed two now i have have three so one four that's it right so i have already visited one i have already visited four so i'm done with three so now i will go to five so for five who are all the adjacents it's a two four six okay two four six so two already done four already done so there is only left with six we'll add that now we'll go to four okay so for four two five six three okay two done three done five done six done okay there is nothing to add now we'll go to six okay so for six who are all the adjacents five and four okay four done five done okay so on this note i'm done so there is nothing to visit again now here one thing one thing one thing so is this also a graph we need to traverse this as well okay so i will again start from this node okay so then i will add seven okay now who are all the distance with the seven it's a eight now we'll complete it seven and now we'll go to eight so is there anything connected to the eight yes it's a seven so already seven is visited so we are done with here now there is nothing to add to the next so this is how it works okay now let's see how our logic will be for bfs okay so listen carefully so which is very very important concept for any interviews if you are attempting like if you are attempting some good product based companies these are all the questions that are going to target okay you might think that this is just a traversal algorithm don't think like that this is beyond that okay this is beyond that you can solve a lot of problems using this particular bfs and dfs algorithms in a graph okay now let's uh, take a uh, one good graph and we'll try to build our logic by using that graph okay let's say i have it graph something like this one then a two three four okay i will have five six and seven eight nine okay so from here 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 okay so first thing so whenever you have given a graph you need to draw an adjacency list okay you need to form an adjacency list of that particular graph so you might be wondering what is adjacency list so you can consider if you are a c plus plus coder so you might think as a vector of list okay and uh, it generally there were two ways to represent a graph so one is uh, adjacency matrix and another one is adjacency list so in adjacency matrix you will represent the graph in terms of uh, ones and zeros where you will be taking vertices to the vertices okay so how many like if there were uh, nine vertices in a graph you will take nine columns and nine rows it's a nine by nine matrix and you will be if there is a path from one particular vertices to one particular vertices let's say one two three you will represent a one over there if there is no path between one and three you will represent zero okay so it contains only zeros and ones okay so that is how adjacency matrix is going to look like and while well, coming to adjacency list so here you will be having a vector of list okay let's see how so adjacency list so basically let's say you will pick up node one okay what is as one and tell me who are all the adjacent to the particular what is as like one so two four right two one four you are done with one now you will go to next you will go to two who are all the adjacents to the one two two sorry so one three and five you will have completed this now you will go to three who are all the adjacents to the three it's a two seven four two seven four now we will go to next one this four who are all the adjacents to the four it's a one three one three then you will go to five it's a two six now you will go to six it's a Five, seven. I will go to seven. It's a three comma eight comma six 
I will go to a8. So it's a 7, comma 9. Then you will go to a 9. It's a 8. Okay. So from 7 you have 3 hours. Okay, done. So this is the adjacency list looks like. So you can call this as a or you can consider this as a vector index. Okay. So one index. And for one index, you will be having a list. Okay. List means uh, uh you can consider this array. Okay, vector of array. So where you will be having two, four, and all. Okay. So the idea is you will stick to that particular uh, vertex. Okay. Then you will traverse to that particular array so that you will get an all the adjacencies of that particular vertex. So that's it. So now we'll see how we will implement BFS by using this for this particular graph. Okay. So you will have a visited array, visited array or vector. Why this? So earlier, so what is the problem that we have identified in a trees? So you are visiting the same node for the multiple times. Okay. So the same thing happens in graph as well. Yes. Right. Don't you think? Yes. So to reduce that particular problem, we are having a visitor array where you will be keeping all the visited vertices. Okay. So with zeros and ones. Okay. You can consider zero means um, not visited. One means visited. So by default, we will be filling them with a zeros by means that we are not visited. Okay. So how much indexes we need to take? So it will be, so if you have n vertices, you need to take n plus one vector or array just because of the fact that we will be starting from the one index, one vertices. Okay. So let's take an uh, array. Looks like this. So we do have uh, nine vertices. So I will have to take 10. Okay. So starting from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay. So this, okay. Now you will fill all the uh, zeros over there. You can consider, okay, if you even, if you don't like uh, consuming a lot of memory, you can use a bool as well, which takes one byte only. Okay. Uh, for bool, you can consider false as an uh, not visited and one as a visited, sorry, true as a visited. And also you will be having another thing, what is called a queue data structure. What is a queue? A queue is a, a data structure which follows the principles of first in, first out. Like whoever comes into the first, they will go out first. That's it. Okay. Now we'll see how that works. Okay. So this is a queue and this is a visitor array. Okay. So first we'll start with this one. Now tell me, is that one visited? No. So what you will do? So you will call it BFS like assume like that okay so now you are a visitor so bf in bfs now we will mark this guy this particular one as a visited okay one as visited so one now you will enqueue this particular vertex into the queue okay you will say one okay done now what i need to do i need to visit all the adjacents of a one right so i will iterate in a loop okay so i will i will enqueue all the adjacencies of a this one okay if they are not visited okay if they are visited no problems they will be in my output right so if they are not visited i will push nq all of them into my queue so it will be first two then four so on this note i can say that i am done with one so whenever i am done with this particular guy i will push that into the my output like i will print that into my output so let's say this is my output okay so one i got one now is that queue empty no i will pick up this guy and i will visit all the adjacents of a that particular vertices now before that what i will do i will mark this guy as a visited okay so two okay here yeah, one now i will enqueue all the adjacents of a two so what are all they one three five one is already visited right one is already visited is three visited no so i will push that three now is that five visited no so i will push five as well. done now what i will do so on that node i can say that i am done with the two so i will erase that okay now the next one is four okay so first i will mark four as a visited now i will go through all the adjacents of a 
uh, I will go through all the adjacent of a 4. So who are all the adjacent of a 4? It's a 1 and 3. So is 1 already visited? Yes, already visited. Okay, so sorry, I forgot to overwrite this. Yeah. Okay, so now 1 already visited. Yes. So is 3 already visited? Yes. Is 3 also visited, right? So you are done with 4. So you will print output that. Now you will come to 3. Okay. Now what are all the adjacents to the 3? 2, 7, 4. Okay. Is 2 visited? Yes. 2 is already visited. Then 7 is visited? No. So you will mark 7 as a visited and push it to the queue. Now is 4 visited? Yes. 4 is already visited. Okay. So you don't need to worry about that. You have completed this, this and this. Okay. Okay. So you are done with 3 and you will with that the, the output. Now 5. So who are all the adjacents to the 5? 2, 1, 6. Is 2 visited? Yes. It's already visited. So no work with 2. Is 6 visited? Or no. So you will mark it as a visited and you will push it to Q. Now, so you are done with 5 as well. So you will print it to the output board. Okay. Now it says 7. For all the adjacents to the 7, 3. So 3 done. Yes, already visited. So is 8 visited? No. So you will mark it as a visited and push it to the Q. Now 6, 6 already visited. No work. Okay. Done. So I am done with 7 as well. So I will print it to my output board. Now 6. So who are all the adjacents to the 6? It's a 5 and 7. 5 already visited. Yes. 7 already visited. Yes. Okay. No work. So you are done with 6 as well. Okay. You will print 6 here. Done. Now, now it's a 8. Who are all the adjacents of 8? 7 and 9. So 7 already visited. Yes. So no work. So is 9 visited? No. So you will mark it as a visited and you will push that to the queue. And on this note, you can say I'm done with 8. Okay. So you will put that in the output box. Now it's a 9. Okay. So who are all the adjacents to the 9? It's a 8. So is 8 visited? Yes. It's a visited. So no work. So on that note, I can say that I'm done with 9 as well. So did we cover all the vertices? Let's see. Okay. So did I visited 1? Yes. 2? Yes. 3? Yes. 4? Yes. 5? Yes. 7? Yes. 6 s 8 9 done so this is how binary is for best for search algorithm looks like okay so without wasting any time let's go on code for this particular approach so now let's discuss the c++ code of an bfs algo now first we will be taking two inputs from the user one is vertices and the edges so vertices or um, the number of vertices we will be having in particular graph and again, I am saying that it's an one based indexing graph. Okay. So means I will be starting the vertices names from one. Okay. Now edges. So why we need edges? So it will represent the how many edges we are having in entire graph so that we can iterate that many times and we, we can form an adjacency list. Okay. So we'll see that now. So for that to form an adjacency list, I will be creating area of vector. Okay. Where so for one particular array, we will be having indexes, right? So how many indexes uh, we will be having? So what is SR9? Okay. So since we are considering one based indexing, we will be using what is S plus one. Okay. Plus one. And then it's a vector. Okay. So here in loop, we are iterating throughout the number of edges we will be having. And for, uh, for every time, we will be taking two inputs. One is from what is another one is a two what is. Okay. So we will be taking that and we will be forming an graph adjacently. So why why two? So you are forming u to v and v to u. So why? So basically, since it's an undirected graph, okay. So we might have an both sides, right? So let's say I have a path from one to two. It is equivalently to two to one as well, right? So that's why it's okay if you use only one thing, like uh, if you form only one edge. That's totally okay. Okay, not a big problem. Now let's see. So now I'm assuming that you have a adjacency list. Okay, which is having all the edges. Now we will be having a visited vector. So where initially we will be storing all the zeros. Okay, we initially we will be storing all the zeros in it. Now we will be starting from the one. Okay, always my starting point is one. So I represent the BFS starts from one. So here I am passing visited vector and adjacency list. Okay. Now I will go here. 
now here what happened so first whatever i started like so i will make that start as visitor first right one represents visitor zero represents it, not visitor so i will make it as a one then i will create a queue okay in that queue i will firstly push that starting point okay now i will iterate throughout the queue until that queue is empty okay so since my queue is not empty now i will enter into the loop and i will make an friend like uh, what is a friend happens so it will give me that top element okay so first element so what is the first element it's a one now so my current vertices is, is one now i will pop that one so i will remove that okay now i will print that onto my output screen now i will iterate throughout that like i will move to all the adjacents of that current vertex right one so this is how i can use now so i will let's assume okay so for from one first vertex we do have a two and three okay first i will go to two and i will check whether if that is a visited or not if that is a visited it could have been a one if that is not a zero so if it is zero i will enter into this particular if block okay now if it is zero what i will do i will first mark it as a visited then i will push it to my queue right i am doing that i will then i will go to three okay now i will do the same okay now after doing i will come here again loop okay so my queue is not empty so I, again i will repeat the same for current value vertex is two now right so I have popped out that one okay so it will do all these things until this queue is empty when this will become empty it will become empty when all the vertices are visited okay so uh, what visited vector will become one all ones okay so this is how a code uh, looks like for a normal bfs like if it's a one a component a graph but we have discussed something different right what is that something different so here you might have an a graph like this so so here right so i will pass one here and i will done with this particular graph now what about this graph so i have to repeat the same again right i need to repeat the again so since i i don't know i don't know what is the starting point what is the starting point always so what i will do now i will return a loop okay let's say which will starts from zero and goes on till what text plus one okay and i will check if that particular i is visited if it is not visited okay i will go okay so first one okay i will go i will call bfs and visited and adjacents done okay so i will visit all this graph right i'm done with this graph now again come so i will come after this loop and i will say increment to one to two so i will make my one as two now so two is already visited yes it's a visitor so why so i am passing this visit as my reference okay so whenever it will visit it will get updated here as well and i will mark it as one so three visited four visited now five i is five now so is five visited now no no five is not visited so what i will do i will make a call to bfs okay now it will do this thing so again i will come back and i will say six six already visited done so this is how code looks like okay so nothing much okay so it's just an uh, loop so i will remove that here and i will make int i equal to one and i will say iterate to what is i plus plus okay so if visited of i is not equal to zero if not equal to one i need to say bfs of i and visited and adjacency that's it this is how the code looks like okay so if you are in an interview it will be good okay so interview expects you to write this coding like i'll go for to have in multiple components but if you are still have that doubt what to write you can ask your interviewer okay so so can i assume is there only one component in this graph or multiple components exist okay so the complexity of this approach looks like you can guess right so yeah it will be mostly big of n since we are visiting all the vertices and you might think yes we are uh, doing for a couple of times right so we are uh, calling here and we are having in worst case we will be 
so let's say it's a one component then it will be big of n first time now again i am calling all these vertices so you might think it's a big of n plus one n into n uh, but if you carefully observe it will end up at n plus n okay so i can say that max it will be big of n and coming to space complexity so here you will be using this okay okay is it array so for that you will be using big of n like big of vertices number of vertices then also you are using a q here right a cube so again at worst it might take big of n right so you can have a, a big of n plus one it will be you can say that but it's okay so if you can say big of n as well okay be accurate okay so figure it try to figure it on your own okay that will be a good practice okay cool now let's discuss the dfs what is a dfs a depth first search depth okay depth okay let's see let's see okay so we'll consider a small graph okay so one and from one two three and from two it's a four and it's a five and three to five and here here okay so this is a graph you have given and uh, you ask you to find the dfs of this particular graph so how do you start so let's say we'll start from one okay i will say one now so in dfs we have moved simultaneously to all the adjacents of a particular vertex but in dfs we don't do that we'll pick up one of its adjacent and we'll traverse all of its particular adjacents okay so like let's say so now what are all the adjacents of a one it's a either two and three okay we'll pick up two first okay now we'll pick up two two okay so from two what are all the adjacents to the two four and one is one already visited yes it's already visited so we don't need that so we'll say we'll go to four now now from four what are all the possible adjacents two three five six right now is three visited no so you will say i will go to three now i am currently here now what are all the adjacents of a three it's a one five four so four already visited one already visited now i'll go to five now from 5 who are all the adjacents of a 5 3 4 6 3 already visited 4 already visited now i will go to 6 so from 6 is there any unvisited is there uh, like what are all the adjacents it's a 4 5 so 4 is already visited 5 is already visited so nothing to go okay now i will check all other vertices where i left okay so in this way it looked like this is the dfs of an but this particular graph is there any other solution yes so at beginning in beginning instead of going at the two i will go at the three now okay so first i will visit one then i will go to three path now what is up from three what are all the possible ways we have i can go to one i can go to five i can go to four so now i will pick up i say i know that one is already visited now i have to go either four or five so i will go to 5 okay now from 5 what are all the adjacencies 3 4 6 okay now i know that 3 is already visited okay 3 is already visited now i will i can choose 6 now i will choose 6 okay now from 6 i have 5 4 okay 5 is already visited okay i will then i will go to 4 okay i will go to 4 now currently i am at here now order all the adjacencies of 4 2 3 5 6 okay so 3 visited 5 visited 6 visited so i will go to 2 okay so from 2 i will go to uh, either 4 or 1 okay so since both are already visited i can stay stop here that's it so this is also an correct solution okay so on this note i can say that there might be a different uh, solutions for one particular graph okay so it depends upon how you are going and what text you are currently picking up okay so now let's uh, simply jump into our logic okay so i will take up simple a uh, graph let's say i have a uh, one then two then three four five mm, six so this is uh, one component 
have another component let's say 7 and 8 okay so now first step we need to find the adjacency of this particular graph adjacency list so how does it looks like so we have first one index so first vertex who are all the adjacencies of the first 2 comma 3 so and for 2 it's a 1 comma 4 and for 3 it's a 1 comma 5 and for 4 it's a 2 comma 6 comma 5 and for a 5 it's a 3 comma 4 and for 6 it's a 4 for 7 it's a 8 and 8 it's a 7 okay this is the adjacency of an this particular graph now let's uh, see so first thing is first we do have uh, one visited array okay where it will be by default it will be marked as all the zeros so here since we have eight vertices it will be eight plus one it's a totally nine so one two three four five six seven eight and nine okay so let's write the indexes of this zero one two three four five six seven eight okay now so all these were filled with zeros zeros yeah. now how this works now basically this a df is, is an recursive algorithm okay so if if you are in an interview they are not interested in um, recursive manner so you know how to write right <laughs> by using stack okay you can write this uh, in an iterator approach by using stack okay but let's see okay so i will tell you recursive approach but it's your job to write the iterative approach okay so it's very easy i gave a hint right try it on your own so let's say first i will start from one okay so while discussing the code of uh, bfs i have shown you how to if the given graph is an component based graph so if you have different components i have shown you how to traverse to that right so for i is equal to one two vertices plus one okay if that vertices is not visited I can say that do DFS of that particular vertex. That's it. Okay, this is how it looks like. So first we'll start from a DFS of a one. Okay. So from here, what are all the ways? So uh, I have a uh, two and three. Okay, I have two and three. So I will pick up this time. I will go with two side. Okay. So DFS of two. So before moving on to DFS of two, I will mark DFS one as visited one as visitor now since i started two i will mark it as a visitor okay now from two where i can go okay so on my output board i can say that till now i have uh, one and two okay so now again uh, what are the adjacents of two it's a one and four okay so i know that one is already visited and i will go with four now so dfs of four okay cool four done two done one as well done <laughs> okay one is also visited now so from four who are all the adjacents so uh, before moving on i will mark it as a visitor now who are all the adjacents it's a two six five okay uh since i know that two is already visited okay i will next i will go with next element called six okay six so before moving on i will mark it as a one fs of six okay cool now who are all the adjacents of six it's a four okay i know that four is already visited right visited now i will go with so since we are here so six uh, we have been two four okay now for four we have been done with six okay so we come here okay we'll come here so for four we have another option called dfs of five right so there is no going from here so after six we have only four four is already visited so we'll come back to the top like previous call and we'll go to the next adjacency of that particular vertices so it's a five okay i will mark five as a one and i will go to the five now so for five it's a three and four okay so first i will go to check with three so is three visited no so i will mark it as a visited and i will go dfs of three okay now how is it look like so uh since i am at three who are all the adjacents of three it's a one and five okay one and five so one already visited five already visited okay one already visited and five already visited so there is no mid away from three okay it's blocked so i will go to top so for five so three done and four left so is four already visited yes visited 
now again i will go to 4 so out of 4 is also done 5 is also done now from top of the 4 i will go to 2 okay so is there anything left in 2 no and from again i will go here there is uh, nothing in here as well okay so three uh, we left with 3 so 3 is already visited so till now we have on our output to 1 2 4 6 5 3 okay so happens stop okay so this is what happens now what i will do so i will go to my main now so all this happens for first one okay so first iteration <laughs> so i is equal to first now what i will do i will go with i will increment my i to 2 okay so is 2 visited yes 3 visited 4 visited 5 visited 6 visited now currently i am at 7 so 7 is not visited okay what i will do so i will make a call to dfs of a 7 okay so i will mark it as a visited and i will put it on my output now what happens so from 7 who are all the adjacents it's a 8 i will make a dfs of 8 and mark it as a 1 okay so from 8 or who are all the adjacents it's a 7 7 is already visited okay so block okay i will come here is there anything to visit from 7 no so i will return to main so from main i will increment my i so it's 8 now 8 is already visited so that's it okay so did we cover all the vertices 2 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 okay so i highly recommend you to take another graph and try out this approach okay so it's very very important okay so now let's see the coding part of this particular dfs now let's discuss this plus plus code of our dfs algorithm so it's the same like before like uh, till uh, creating an adjacency list same as bfs okay so we have seen that earlier so till here it's the same okay so after we have uh, adjacency list we will be doing something different okay so not much okay so let's see so first we will be having a vertices okay so visited array okay where we would be initializing with a zero by default if it is visited we will be marking it as a one okay then so here i am assuming in case of components okay we have different components to visit okay so if it is not it's very simple right so you will say a dfs of you will start with one and you will go visited and you will go adjacent that's it so it's it's as simple as that if since it is a different components it has different components i am making it as a for loop and i am traversing to the all the vertices and i am checking if that particular vertex is visited I won't go anywhere if that particular is not visited i will call dfs okay so since one is not visited i will call dfs for one and i will come here okay i will come here so since my start is one right then i will say so i will take visited uh, vector and adjacency now i will marking a visited of start as a one since i started visiting so and i will print the start as well okay now I will iterate through the all the adjacents of a particular start okay so let's see so first i got uh, let's say i have an adjacency from a uh, one to two so i will pick up two and i will start dfs okay so here so again i will go to make a recursive call for two and i will again start right so if there is a two has three and i will again start for three so it's gone like that so it, since that is why it's called as a depth wise okay so it it will reach till the depth so till the last vertex and then if it does particular vertex doesn't have any next vertex to go then it will make a call to come back okay it will go to previous call then it will it will go to previous and it will from that previous call if there is any adjacency to visit then it will do that okay so i will keep on doing that and if that happens okay so i will come back here and now i am done with one now i will check with 2 since 2 is visited again 3 visited 4 visited 5 visited 6 visited 7 yes so we have hope you have remembered our example right 7 is not visited so i will make a call to 7 so i will mark 7 as visited here okay i will print 7 in my output board and i will go through all the adjacency of a 7 okay now what is the adjacency of a 7 it's a 8 right so i will I know that it's a not visited so i will make a call to dfs of eight okay i will visit that again and i will mark it as a visit and i will print it on my output board and from eight there is uh, only seven which is already visited 
okay now take the go okay so i will come back to this loop that's how it works okay so that's as simple as that okay so again i'm saying that these are two algorithms are very very important in perspective of interviews okay if you are aiming for the high so please don't try to not to skip these algos okay so please uh, try to practice as much of problems you can okay so the next question is what is the difference between tree and graph data structure okay so tree versus graph so tree and graph are differentiated by fact that tree, tree structure must be connected and can never have a loops whereas in graph there are no restrictions so the major difference between tree and graph is tree won't contain loops okay but graph can contain loops okay where like we will be calling them as a cyclic graphs okay a kind of thing but uh, trees won't contain a uh, graph or like trees won't contain loops forever tree provides insights on relationship between your nodes in a hierarchical manner and graph follows a network model so here in tree we will be following the hierarchical manner right like structure we have seen one example of file structure but in graph we we are not following the hierarchical structure we will be following the network model where one node is being connected to many other nodes and on that particular a node is being connected to many other nodes okay like this so this is the difference between graph and tree okay now next question what is the difference between breadth first search and depth first search okay so uh, both are traversal techniques only okay and but we'll see what is the difference okay major differences between both so uh, here bfs versus dfs graph traversal techniques graph traversal but even it can be for tree and tree as well okay the main difference between dfs and bfs is the bfs travels by level by level and whereas dfs travels by the uh, starts from the uh, starting point starting node and reaches till the end node okay the leaf node and then again it will go back to the starting node then again come to the leaf node okay let's say i will take it one example okay so let's say if you have a tree like this bfs follows the this thing okay first it will complete all the level zero then level one then level two but a dfs would works like this okay it will start first this particular node and it will complete this path okay this path then again it will go back to the top and it will complete this path now again go back to the loop like starting point and again it will complete this path and again go back to the uh, root and then it will complete this path okay so depth wise it will starts from the root node and then it will come to till the leaf node and again it will go back to the another path okay this is um, another difference so further a bfs yeah so the data structure the type of data structure it uses to compute the like traverse the graph so uh, bfs takes q which follows the first in first out um, logic and our uh, dfs takes a uh, fifo which is uh, like q star stack lifo 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 stack okay last in first out so dfs yields deeper solutions that are not optimal but it works well when solution is dense whereas the solutions for dfs are optimal okay so dfs sol solutions are not that much optimal because it will go on deep like it will take out all the possible path Okay, it will consider all possible ways to solve a problem to reach till the end to reach till the our solution but whereas uh, a bfs won't do that okay it will go in a linear manner and checks whether this is a what we are searching for or not okay and that's it now the next question how do you know when to use dfs over bfs yeah very good question so I have seen um, many areas where uh, we can solve a problem using uh, both a DFS and BFS solution but often that uh, selecting the which solution uh, to write the code is also an um, like kind of uh, much needed one in an interview 
okay because it matters a lot in searching okay finding the optimal solution so probably this question would answer the questions so the usage of dfs heavily depends upon the structure of the search or search tree or graph and the number of and locations of solutions needed so following are the best cases where we can use dfs okay so if it is known that solution is not far from the root of the tree a depth a breadth for search might be the better so they are telling that okay like if there is a tree like this and solution is uh, what you are searching for is exist here now now tell me so dfs if i follow dfs it will come down till here then okay then it will come down here so till now we have visited four right four or we have visited like paths okay if you have concept path we have visited uh, five nodes and then we are going to the solution which we are searching for but if i consider a bfs i first complete this level then i will complete this level so to come to our solution i have visited only two nodes right so now it's up to you okay you guys know clearly seen what is an like uh, advantage of using a bfs in some time in these cases where our solution is very near to the root now so second point the tree is very deep and solutions are rare okay like so um, the height of the tree is very big okay but solution is very rare then going for a uh, dfs going for depth to first search will extremely take longer time to compute the solution which involves a uh, finding lot hell lot of uh, op, like ways to solve the problem okay that is going to yield an um, big amount of time okay which is not efficient now if the tree is very wide okay like the width of the tree is very high a bfs might need it too much of memory yes right so if it has uh, for each level okay if this is an uh, n array if it is an n array a binary tree oh uh, sorry if it is an n array tree uh an array tree uh, like uh, it should looks like this something like this okay where each node will be having more than one node okay like it's an infinite okay a node uh, a para node can contain infinite number of shell nodes then it is called as an n array tree okay so in this case the width of the tree might be very high right so in this case by going till a uh, depth breadth first wise will take a lot of um, space okay so in this case uh, going for dfs is a good option so if solutions are frequent but located uh, deep in the tree we opt for dfs okay they are saying that um, if your solutions are a uh, very rare and it might enter very uh if your solution might exist in very deep means a very lower order okay then going for dfs is the right approach okay it's an uh it's just an opposite to the what we have discussed in the first point okay now uh next question is what is topological uh, topological sorting in graph so what is topological sorting which is a very very important algorithm okay if you are preparing for a companies like amazon so amazon uh, this is a one of the most frequently asked graph question in an amazon so it will be having different algorithm like you can solve this problem using different algorithms like corn algorithm okay topological sorting itself is have one algorithm which follows uh, both a bfs and dfs technique okay so yeah, if you are aiming for such big companies please have a look at this uh, topological sorting algorithm okay and um, this is one such problem we won't get uh, <laughs> afraid of because uh, most of the people feel that graph is little complicated topic but it is not okay all you need is uh, with some strong basics then you can able to easily solve the graph problems and one of the advantage of uh, graph problems is in an interview you will get only standard problems okay like it's very rare okay i can say that it's very rare to get a uh, new problems like unseen problems or unsolved problems either in lead code or interview bit platform okay so you will get only the frequently asked problems okay because it's a uh, little uh, tough to uh, create and problems okay so let's come to this topological sorting 
So a topological sorting is a linear order of vertices such that every directed edge i, what is i comes before joining ordering i. So I'm pretty much sure that you haven't understood that definition. So let me put down like this. Okay. So um, let's take it as a uh, becoming a HDE. Okay. Becoming a HDE. So let's say everyone end goal is to become HDE. Now to, to become HDE, we have different path. So one path is like um, to learn system designing for sure. So to learn system designing, you should be very good at algos. If you want to learn algo, then you should be very good at DS. It's like something like this. Okay. And if you want to be uh, good at data structures, then you should learn OOPS. If you wanted to learn OOPS, you should pick up any OOPS language, either C++ or Java or Python. Done. Now you can in this, this is one path where you can become software engineer. And there is another path. Okay. To, if you wanted to get into in startups, okay. You can uh, learn uh, web development. Okay. So, and you should learn some, uh, like uh, basic DSA as well, basic DSA as well. To learn basic DSA, you should learn programming language, either C++ or Java or JavaScript, if you wanted to web dev. And you can become Android dev as well, Android or iOS. Then again, this is going to be same path. Okay. So this is an overview of like where you will be having different options and uh, uh, you can become an SD. Now, now I wanted to be sort this thing as a topological sorting. So the topological sorting means, let's say for everything, for if I wanted to become a software engineer, if I would like to uh, take out this particular path, what is the first thing that I need to do? First thing that I need to do, I should learn programming language, C++, Java or Python. Then I should learn oops, then DS, then algo, then SD, then SD become. This is one way, right? And another way is learn C or Java or JavaScript and learn some solve some basic DSA problems, then learn full stack development, then become SD. This is another path that you can become SD. What is another path? Learn either Android or iOS and learn some basic DSA then sorry okay okay so yeah here it is an uh, C++ Java kind of okay so C++ or Java or JavaScript or some Kotlin which are uh, Android languages or Flutter and solve some basic DSA then become HD so to become an HD these are all the path that you need to consider Okay. And this is called a topological sorting means. Okay. So here I can say that I can say that to become an SDE, you are dependent upon system designing. To learn system designing, you have to learn the algorithm. Okay. To solve algorithms, you should be very good at data structure. To learn data structures, you should be very good at OOPS. Okay. Then to learn OOPS, you should learn any of these particular languages. So uh, now, so this is the order of becoming an HD. Now, what is the order of learning path? Okay. So you need to start from where there will be no dependencies. What are, what are these here? So you should pick up one, at least one OOPS language. It is C++, Java, Python. Then you should, after learning that language, you should go to the OOPS, then DS, then Algo, then HD, then H, uh, like system design, then HD. Right. So this is what topological sorting means. Okay. So before moving on to the any dependencies, okay, you should learn, you should uh, visit all the no dependencies, then only you can visit the dependencies. Okay. So I hope you got some good idea. Like I tried the base because it will be it is going to be a good example. So and these are all the few of the applications where topological sorting has been uh, using uh, applications or uh, job scheduling algo algorithms from the given dependencies and among the jobs. Okay. Ordering of ordering of formula cell evaluation in spreadsheets, ordering of compilation tasks to be performed in make cells or make files, 
and data serialization resolving symbol dependencies in linkers okay so it's very simple okay it's very simple like uh, if you want if you haven't understood the above example i can tell you the one as well let's say i have a given an uh, statement like a result equal to x plus y plus z okay so to solve this particular problem first of all you require x then z then y okay i can say that x equal to x equal to x into y okay so for this again you need you required y sorry x right so i can say that x is equal to 2 now again still you required y so for y i can say that 2 okay now your x you have solved the x okay you have the y now what about z you still required z then i can say that z equal to y into r2 okay so you have y okay you have y and you have 2 so it is going to be you have answered so after getting all these things you will be computing your result right so here before moving on to uh, solving the problem you need to get all your dependencies done then only you can solve the particular problem so in whatever like uh, wherever such cases or constraints are exist then you can use the topological sorting okay I hope you have understood now uh, i'm not explaining this code as of now probably might be in another separate tutorial because it will take a lot of time and it needs a very good amount of uh, attention as well so i will create a separate tutorial for this where we will be solving two problems of topological sorting and again there is a problem okay so go through this problem so this problem is called as an um, islands number of islands problem um, which is very good okay we'll try to call this in another separate tutorial now let's solve this particular problem heap data structure heap data structure so heap is a special tree based non-linear data structure in which the tree is completely binary tree complete binary tree uh, so uh, i will tell you what is complete binary tree so a binary tree is said to be complete if all the levels are completely filled except possibly the last level and the last level has all the elements towards as left as as possible heaps of two types so basically complete tree is something like this okay so let's say suppose you have a root okay and you will be starting from the left first okay and then you will be going to the right and then after this completing this right again you need to start from the right so you it means like you need to follow the sequence okay first you need to complete this then this then this then this you should not go something like this okay okay so here uh, your right is empty right so this is not a complete tree this is a complete tree so which means that your left subtree should not be the empty and the uh, the the above levels are also not be empty okay before moving on to the next levels so then we can say that it's a complete tree okay now we have uh, heaps are two types as we as i said a uh, max heap and min heap okay i will i will give you an overview of what is uh, max heap and how max heap uh, will be representing and uh, min heap okay so a uh, max in a max heap the data present element the data data element present at the root node must be greatest among all the data present in the tree okay so they are saying that let's say if i have a root of 100 then all my children's Okay, all my children's should be less than 100 okay so here like the root has to be good like the root or parent node should have the greatest the element greatest element among all the children's okay here let's say here I have 100 now I should have 90 here and I should have a 99 here okay and I can have a 5 and I can have a 4 then 3 then two i can have one here okay so here if you can see the parent nodes okay this is a parent this is a parent this is a parent so parents are a greater than the children nodes right then this is called as a maxi okay then you can guess what is a min heap right so a min heap will be having it's an opposite okay the root node okay like a root okay sorry let's say 10 
okay the root node will be the uh, lesser among the all the children it has okay so here 10 so i can say 20 and i can say 30 and it will have a 40 and 60 and it is having a 35 and 40 like sorry uh, it is it can have 50 so it should be like this okay parent node should be less than its children node then we can say this as a mini okay now i guess we are done okay so this property should recursively true for all the subtrees yeah they are saying that the smallest um, the root okay the parent node should be smallest among its all children okay now i guess we are done with all the data structures interview preparation questions okay so for more such interview questions you can check out the interview blogs okay you can find a hell lot of uh, questions or uh, which are specific to the language or framework or library please do check out the interview with blogs okay so that's it